upload the sessions on Java programming. So in today's session, let us see the basic introduction to Java. So that means the basic terminologies used in Java programming and how the program is executed. So let us see the basic terminologies. So here, the software used to execute these Java applications is JDK. So JDK is nothing but Java Development Kit. And this JDK consists of two things. One is the normal compiler, Java compiler. And another one is JRE, that is Java Runtime Environment. Right? So, after writing the program, this Java compiler will compile the Java program and it will produce dot class file or we can say it as byte code right after compilation of java program we will get this byte code and this byte code will be given to this jre so jre again consists of jvm that is java virtual machine right so whereas coming to the c language the program after compilation of this program the object code will be generated and that object code directly will be given to the operating system for execution here the once the bytecode has been generated this bytecode will be given to this jvm not to the operating system so this jvm is the operating system dependent that means each operating system will be having their own J Java virtual machines, right? So this can be different from Windows operating system, Linux operating system, or a Mac operating system. But the output produced from all the all the different operating systems will be same. So that's why we call this Java programming as platform dependent, right? So this JVM is a operating system dependent. So it depends upon the operating system. Whether it may be a Windows or Linux or Mac, Mac OS, right? So this bytecode will be given as input to this one, JVM. So this produces the output. The JVM will give this bytecode, execute this bytecode in the operating system, and then it will produce the output. Right? So this is the actual process done while executing the Java program. Right? First, this JDK is a Java development kit. It consists of two parts, the compiler one compiler and Java runtime environment. So all the executions will be done in the JRE. That means JVM, by means of JVM, Java virtual machine. And compiler will compile the Java file and it produces the dot class file. So here the file extension for Java is dot Java. So after compilation, after compilation we will get dot class that is a bytecode. This will be given to JVM. It will produce the out. Oh. Right? So for compiling this Java program, we will use Java C space file name dot java so after executing this statement java c file name dot java if there are no syntactical errors automatically the class file will be generated that means bytecode will be generated so how to execute this bytecode internally this bytecode will be given to java jvm but here by our execution we have to implement just java space file name so here we need not give the dot extension because 
it is a byte code it's a byte code right so we need not give dot java extension in the while executing the file java file so this is for compilation this is for execution next so before writing the program and before uh, executing these applications first of all we have to set the path so from from anywhere from the system we can execute the java programs only if we set the path so how to set the class path so i will tell you this how to set the path set class path so how to set this path go to the command prompt go to the command prompt after going to the command prompt write the instruction set path is equal to double quotes so write down the location where the java has been installed in your system let it be c c drive program files slash java slash jdk some version 1.8 slash bin so if you write this path i mean this is the location where the java has been installed in our system right so by typing this line the path will be set and we can execute the java programs from anywhere in the system so the alternate way to set the path is this is a one way the second way is go to the system properties go to the system properties here click on environment variables environment variables in the environment variables click on user variables here click on new button there you can see variable name and the text box similarly variable value and the text box so in the name you just type path and variable value type the location where the java has been installed see this one this one should be sorry no double quotes this one should be paste here copied here right so this is the alternate way to set the class path one is by using the command from another one using graphical user that means going to the system properties and all these things so hope you understood the basic terminologies right so jdk development kit next jre runtime environment jvm java virtual machine bytecode right so jdk so compiler plus this is the jdk hope you understood now in the jdk compiler plus jre in the jre there will be jvm so this is the basic introduction to java So what are these Java buzzwords? This is a, a frequently asked questions in the interview. So these Java buzzwords are nothing but the features of Java. The features of Java we call them as Java buzzwords. So let us do one by one. First one. platform independent 
So as we have seen in the previous session, so JDK consists of a compiler and the JRE. So if whenever a Java program is compiled, dot cast file will be generated that is called a bytecode and that bytecode will be allocated to the JVM so that JVM will execute this bytecode and here the JVM that is Java virtual machine is a operating system dependent so every operating system will be having their own JVM so but the output coming from all the operating systems will be same so for example if we write a Java code and if we compile it we will get the class file dot class file and if that dot class file has been executed in a Windows operating system we will get some output and if the same dot class file is executed in Linux operating system the same output will be produced even the if the say if the dot class file is executed in the Mac operating system the same output will be produced so whatever the operating system we are using the output will be same so that's that why that's why we call it as a platform independent so it can run on any environment so it can run on any environment second Java follows the object oriented concepts this is also very important object oriented concepts so whereas in the previously we have seen the C programming where the C programming is the procedure oriented programming where the program is completely divided into parts called as functions so here in Java programming the program is divided into several parts that we call it as a classes and objects so our Java programming follows this object oriented concepts so what are these object oriented concepts we will see in the next session briefly I will tell the object oriented concepts main object oriented concepts are abstraction encapsulation inheritance and a polymorphism so major operate object oriented concepts are these four abstraction encapsulation inheritance and polymorphism so java programming will follow all these concepts so we will see one by one in the next sessions right third one java programming is very simple to implement why it is simple means comparatively in the C program we will have some complex structures like pointers, dynamic memory allocation and operator overloading. So all those concepts will be discarded or removed in this Java programming. So here no concept of pointers. explicit memory allocation as well as structures or operator overloading etc so we we will not touch all these concepts in java programming that means a pointers concept or explicit memory allocation or operator overloading etc all these concepts will be not there not available in java programming so java programming is very simple to implement next it is very secure to implement the applications the internet applications right? so here secure for internet applications so we can achieve this security so just one example for getting this security means it will raise out of boundary exception
in arrays if if the programmer accessing the index value which is out of range so in c language that is a limitation right so if you declare one array with size 10 so the user can able to access the 11th index or 12th index also but here it is not possible it will raise an exception that is out of boundary array out of bounds exception so that's why there will be some ex exceptions and also it is strong typed language it's also a strong typed language so based upon all these points we can say that java program is secure next one robust so here the robust means early identification and checking of errors right so compile at the time of compilation itself we are getting some errors and we are rectifying all those errors right so early checking of errors early checking of errors and this can be achieved with the help of garbage collector exception hand right so by using this garbage character and exception handling we can identify the errors so whenever the error is uh, occurred then automatically if you write this exception handling if you implement this exception handling the exception will be raised next it's a portable that means we can write the java programming in one environment and we can implement the java programming the same program in another environment so java program written on one environment can be executed or implemented in another environment so as it is a platform independent we can write the java programming in one environment and we can execute the same java programming in another environment so that's why we call it as a portable so java programming is also a portable next multi threading so java programming supports this multi threading in concept so what is meant by multi threading so concurrent execution of different parts of a same program at a time so for example if you consider one program so let it be it is divided into different parts and each part is executed at the same time it's called multi threading so concurrent execution execution of several parts of same program at the same time So this will improve CPU utilization. This will improve the CPU utilization. So Java program is having this multi-threading concept. Next, distributed applications. distributed applications so coming to these distributed applications so java programming 
we create this type of applications so what is meant by this distributed applications so these distributed applications are the software which can run on multiple systems which are connected in the internet at the same time so distributed environment so we can create we can create a java program for these distributed applications it is a software that runs on multiple computers connected to a network at the same time right these are the softwares that runs on multiple computers connected to a network at the same time that's we call as distributed applications a java program is able to create these distributed applications so for creation of these distributed applications java requires two concepts that is rmi and ejp rmi means remote method invocation remote method invocation ejp means enterprise java beans so with the help of these two concepts java can implement these distributed applications in the next one architectural neutral it's also very important feature that java supports that is architectural neutral so for example if you consider the c language so there uh, the the size of a data type will depends upon the architecture of a compiler so if you take an integer variable if it is a 16 bit compiler it occupies two bytes of memory and if it is a 32 bit compiler it occupies four bit of memory four bytes two bytes of memory and four bytes of memory so that means the allocation memory allocation will depends upon the architecture whereas in this java whatever the architecture we are using it the memory allocation will not vary right so here irrespective of architecture the memory allocated to the variables will not vary right that is called architectural neutral so whatever the architecture we are using the memory allocated for the variables is same so hope you understood this one these are the important features of java java so which we call them as java buzzwords so let us see all at a glance java features in that first one is platform independent multi threading distributed applications on 
object oriented simple secure architectural neutral robust and portable so all these are the java features or java buzzwords So what are the OOPS concepts? Object Class Abstraction Encapsulation inheritance polymorphism so this we call as oops concepts now let us see one by one first what is meant by object so an object is defined as a real world entity so whatever the thing we are seeing in the real world that can be treated as an object so this object is a real world entity and this object consists of so properties and the task performed by task performed by this object so whatever the real world entity which is having these properties and the tasks, some tasks to be performed, those we call as an object. Let, it, let us take an example. Human. Human being is also an entity. I, I mean, it's an, also an object. So human consists of properties like name so color height and etc so these are the properties so what this human can do the task what are the tasks can be done by this human walk run read right etc so these are the tasks can be performed by this human so we can consider this human as a object right hope you understood so object is a real world entity which is having the properties and some tasks that can that it can be performed right now what about the class so class is a blueprint that object should object follows that object follows so it is a blueprint that an object follows so without the class object is not there so this class consists of n number of objects number of objects it consists of number of objects and object can be defined as instance of a class instance of a class so that means object will follow the prototype defined by this class example let us take a student student in a class student in a classroom so what are the properties so properties or variables 
we can say them as a variables so properties of a student one student name student roll number and student date of join date of join right so this is a class and all the objects which are defined by this class should follow this prototype so that for example a student in a class there are n number of students every student can be considered as an object which follows the same prototype and what are the tasks to be performed by the student read write play right so every student can have three properties read write and play every student will be having the three properties name roll number and some date of join so whatever the objects created through this class will follow the same structure that means objects so student consists of a number of objects so student class consists of some abc the name of a student abc some def some ghi so abc will be having name roll number date of join name roll number date of join similarly ghi so here abc def ghi are the names name of a student let it be like sandeep saradi and uh, some suresh roll number and date of join and for every student we will follow some properties some read write and play so <coughs> excuse me these three properties can be done i mean invoked by this abc and these properties can be applied for def and these properties can be done by ghi so an object is an instance of a class and a class is a blueprint that the object should follow right so a class consists of n number of objects many number of objects hope you understood this object and class because our java programming completely deals with these two things class and object for everything we will create a class and we will create an object so a class cannot run the methods of another class directly so one class of methods cannot be invoked by the another another class so in order to access the methods of another class one class should create its own object so simply we can say a classes cannot communicate with each other but in order to communicate with each other object should be created so for every communication object should be created so if class a and class b wants to communicate so here the communication means invoking the methods of one class by another class so every class is having the methods right so tasks so invoking those methods or tasks from one class to another class is called a communication and this cannot be done between two classes and this can be done only between objects so in order to communicate two classes first their instances should be generated and through those instances those the two classes will be communicated so hope you understood this thing the class and object next abstraction abstraction means showing only essential parts only essential parts and hiding the implementation details this is called abstraction this can be achieved in this java programming just the best example so if you download 
an uh, Android application from the Play Store. So we will get a dot apk file, right? Dot apk file, or you can download a software so that we can get dot exe file. And if you run this exe file, we can get the software and we can use the software. But here we can't see the packages or methods or functions which are used to create this exe file. That means all the implementation part is hidden and only the essential part is visible. Right? So this is the best example. So similarly, if you download an application from Android Play Store, you will get a .apk file but you will not get the methods or packages or any functions which are written to generate this .apk file. So all the implementation details will be hidden. Right? So this type of applications can be done in Java programming that we call it as an abstraction or a data hiding. So I hope you understood this abstraction. Next one. So object class abstraction. Now encapsulation. Encapsulation. So this means binding variables and the methods under single entity binding the variables and methods under single entity so see for understanding you will write here so a class is having three parts one is the name of a class so this is a class here we will write the variables and here we will write the methods similarly object is also having the name variables and methods Sim simply we can say student is a class having the variables name roll number and a date of joining and the methods read write okay and a play right so this is a class so here we are writing the variables and these are called variables and this we call as methods right these are called variables these are called methods so here we are binding these variables and methods in a single entity we call it as class or object so object is also having the same structure that means one class will be having in roll number character name and similarly the read method write method so one class consists of variables and a methods right so this is called encapsulation so hope you understood this one next coming to the next concept inheritance inheritance so what is meant by inheritance acquiring the properties of one class to another class acquiring the properties of one class to another class simply we can say it as parent class and a child class 
so chain class will acquire the properties of parent class right chain class will be having acquiring the properties of parent class so this we call it as base class or we can call it this chain class will be called as derived so a derived class is a class which is derived from the base class derived class or we can call this parent as super class and this chain class as subclass right so acquiring the properties of one class to another class so here acquiring the properties of parent class to the chain class so this this concept we call it as inheritance so here there are uh, different types of inheritance right so we will have a single inheritance multi level inheritance hierarchical inheritance so let us see the basic introduction then we will move on by one by one right so we will see one by one concept in the depth now in this session let us cover the introduction of all these object oriented concepts so we can have these three types of inheritance single inheritance multi level and hierarchical so this is called inheritance concept next coming to the polymorphism so performing the same task same task in different ways in different ways that is called as a polymorphism here task means a method method so invoking the method in different ways for example if we are having uh, a, a program for adding of two numbers we can write add simply we can call add without any parameters we can call add with int a comma int b right so two methods so both will perform the same task but implementation is diff different here we are not passing any arguments and here we are passing only i mean two arguments right then this type of implementation we call it as a polymorphism let it be uh, one more example i will, I will explain so i am having the method called draw polygon draw polygon so this draw polygon can be anyone so we can draw circle oh, sorry sorry it's a polygon so we can draw square we can draw rectangle we can draw a triangle right so both, all the three are the polygons all the three are polygons right so here just i am implementing draw polygon and that draw polygon can be square rectangle or triangle that means implementing this task in different ways this is called polymorphism so this can be achieved in java by achieving by implementing method overloading method overloading right and method overriding so in the further sessions we will see what what is meant by this method overloading and method overriding so with this we can implement compile time pile polymorphism and with this the runtime polymorphism so we can achieve the compile time polymorphism 
by implementing method overloading and we can achieve this runtime polymorphism by implementing method overriding right so we will see one by one in the further sessions right hope you understood the basic concept of this polymorphism right so these are the concepts of object oriented programming so object class abstraction encapsulation inheritance and polymorphism Now what is a keyword? So a keyword is a predefined words given by the compiler which is having some specific task. So there are different keywords we, we are going to use in our Java programming and all those keywords will be having their own specific task or specific meaning. Right? So let us see one by one. import keyword so where this import keyword is used so first of all all the keywords will be in lowercase characters that is small letters so the first one is import so similar to our C language if you want to implement some functions we have to include the header file for example if you want to implement the mathematical functions like power or square root or seal or floor Whatever the mathematical functions we are going to use in our C program, we have to include the math.h header file. Similarly, in order to implement the classes or methods, we have to import the packages in Java. So, in Java programming, there will be the package and inside the package, there will be a classes and interfaces. So, in order to implement those classes, we have to import the packages. So for that purpose, we will use this import keyword class. Next one is class. So as we have discussed in the earlier session, as uh, this Java programming is an object-oriented programming, so everything will be treated as a classes and objects. So class is a collection of objects. So for everything, we have to implement a class. So a class is a blueprint or a template which the object should be followed. So in order to create a class, we have to use the keyword class. This keyword. So this keyword is used to represent the method belongs to the particular current object. So current object is represented by using this. Super keyword. Super keyword is used to access the methods. I mean, if one method of a subclass is accessing the another method of a superclass, then we can use this super keyword. That means simply we can say it as an inheritance. So it can be used in inheritance concept. So if one class is derived from another class, if one method is invoked from the another class, then the, this super keyword will be used. So extends, extends keyword is also used in inheritance concept. So as we have discussed this inheritance concept in the OOPS concept, that is inheritance means acquiring the properties of one class by another class. So there we will call a super class and subclass, right? There are class and base class. So acquiring that means accessing the methods of one class to another class that can be done by using this extends keyword. package as I have said that in Java there will be a package which consists of a number of classes and interfaces so in order to access those classes we have to import the packages and this keyword will be used return so this return keyword is similar to the C language which we are using in C language right so every function will return something to its main function I mean to its parent function right so that may be a value return or an empty return so that is used by using I mean that is acquired by using this return next 
try so try is used in exception handling so if any exception is raised then to raise the exception or to catch the ex ex exception we'll use this try catch so we will write this try and catch block so whatever the i mean code we are writing that will be written in this try block and whenever the exception is raised then this catch block will raise the i mean catch the exception next finally this is also used in exception handling throw throws throw is also used to throw an exception throws it can be used in a class or a method which throws the exception whenever the exception is raised so all these are meant for exception handling next there is an another keyword called final keyword which is similar to our constant so if one value is assigned to the final keyword then that variable will be having that that holds the value throughout the program so for that this final keyword is used next strict fp fp here is floating point so strict fp is used to restrict the floating point calculations so all these keyword we will see while doing the programming right just i will give you an overview so uh while doing the program you will be able to see all these keywords instance keyword so instance keyword is used to find whether the object is an instance of that i mean whether whether the object is instance of that particular class or not right so as we know that an object is an instance of a class right so this keyword is used to check whether the object is an instance of particular class or not enum enum is used to as for us as a special data type so which will give some predefined values to the variable right this is special data type interface so java doesn't support the multiple inheritance concept but that multiple inheritance concept can be achieved by using this interface this interface keyword we can achieve the multiple inheritance concept asset sorry small letters asset asset is used to give the asset statement so here the asset statement is a boolean condition given in the program expected boolean condition given in the program for that we will use this asset keyword native keyword so this keyword is is used as a modifier for a method modifier for a method so volatile this this will be applied for a variables so whatever the variables we are creating by using this volatile keyword every reading and writing operations will be done directly on the main memory that means the memory management right so the variable values will be stored in the main memory so this is instance of implements implements means this is used to create an interface implements is used to create an interface interface is used to used for achieving the multiple inheritance right abstract keyword and this keyword is used in declaring the method right declaration of a method in the declaration of a method we will use this abstract keyword Sorry. 
so do for while if else all these are the and so switch switch default break continue so all these we have seen in our c language do for while all these are the uh, iterative control statements if else these are the conditional statements switch is a multi multi way selection statement default which is used in a switch case so if uh, the uh, the value or the argument of a switch is not matching with any uh, any one of the case labels then this default i mean default case will be executed break and continue break means in respect of the condition whenever the control executes this break statement the control will come out from the loop and continue statement it will skip the current iteration and it will continue with the next iteration so all these are the control structures so boolean keyword is used to create a variable with this data type so boolean is a data type in our java programming so it holds the only two values true or false byte is also a keyword i mean byte is also a data type so but uh, uh, this data type is having the range the range between uh, minus 128 to 127 value it can hold the uh, values between minus 128 to 1 plus 127 short is also a keyword which is used as a data type here int is also a keyword it's a data type character is a data type float is a data type double is a data type long is a data type right so all these are the different data types boolean byte short int character float double and long all these are the data types next public protected private sorry i'll write here see public private protected so all these three are the access specifiers which gives the access to the variables and methods so which class to be used by which variables right so these are the access specifiers public protect and private so in this way we can easily uh, remember these keywords so all these keywords are related to the classes to import the class to uh, i mean for the inheritance concept and this is for exception handling and all these are the different keywords all right which one each is having their own identity and these are the iterative statements and these are the data types and these are the access specifiers so in this way you can easily remember all these keywords so hope you understood all these keywords these are the different keywords used in java programming and one thing we have to remember is all the keywords should be written in lower case characters so while doing the program we will able to see the importance of all these keywords so naming conventions are rules to be followed while giving a name to an identifier so here the identifier is the name to identify the particular object or a class or a method or a variable so anything so user defined variables or classes or methods or anything right so in this java programming we are able to create a class or a methods or objects or variables so for everything we have to give some name so what are the rules to be followed while giving a name to the these classes or methods or variables and objects right so first rules whatever it may be whatever it may be either class or a method or a variable or an object whatever it may be the first and foremost rule should be 
name should not match with keywords so we have seen a different keywords in our in the java programming and while giving the name to the class method variable or object so the name should not match with the keywords the first and foremost thing so irrespective of this identifier we have to follow this rule right next apart from this one we will see one by one first one class so we know that a class is a template or a blueprint which the object should be followed and in every class there will be some variables and methods so how to give a name for a class so a class name should begin with a capital letter should begin with a capital letter if it is a single word if the name is a single word the name should begin with capital letter if it is a multiple words every first letter sorry first letter of every word should begin with capital letter this is applied for multiple keywords multiple word multiple words so example if i want to create a class a student so s must be a capital letter and if I, this is a single word right if i want to create the class name as a branch name branch name if it is a multiple words so here this is a class name branch name is a class name which consists of two words so first letter of every word should be in a capital letter first letter of every word should be in a capital letter next method so every class will be consists of different methods right so how to create a, or how to give a name for these methods so here also first letter should begin with lower case letter that means a small small letter right so lower case and if it is a multiple words then first letter of first word should be small that means a lower case and first letter of every word should be capital so first letter should begin with a lower case letter and the first letter of every word should be begin with capital letters so if it is a single word first letter will be a small letter right so everything will be in a small smaller case and if it is a multiple words 
the first letter of the first word should be small and the remaining all the words the first letter should be a capital example example read is one method so here we are writing r as a small letter next get name reading a name so get name then we are having two words so get name so first word first letter of the first word will be small and the first word of the next i mean first letter of the next word will be capital get name right read name read name right next line right. so this is a the rules to be followed while giving a name to a method hope you understood this class and uh, method what are the naming conventions to be followed while creating a class name or method name next variable so variable also it should begin with alphabet or underscore should not begin with digit should contain alpha numeric but not symbols or spaces except underscore so this variable name can contain the alpha numeric that means it can contain both the alphabets and the character i mean alphabets and the digits but not the any any kind of symbols or the spaces except the underscore so this is the rules to be followed while giving a name to the variable and the same rules will be applied for both the object also right and the same rules can be applied for both uh, classes and methods too right so but only difference is every class name should begin with a capital letter and if it is containing uh, multiple words if the class name contains a multiple words first letter of every word should be in a capital letter and methods coming to the methods if it is a single word everything will be in a small letters and if if it is a multiple words if the, if the method name contains a multiple words then the first letter of a first word should be in small letter and the first letter of the remaining words should be in a capital letter and coming to this variable we have to follow all these rules while giving the name to the variable so these are the some naming conventions so some rules to be followed while giving it names so it gives a better practice in programming So there are mainly two types of data types primitive data types as well as non primitive data types so coming to this primitive data types first one is boolean data type so boolean data type consists of uh, two values that is either true or false so it can be either true or 
is a false. By default, the Boolean variable will be having false. So this is the default. Coming to this Boolean. Next, byte. Next one. Cat. Shot. Int. Long. Float. Double. Coming to this non primitive string and class and etc. All these are comes under non primitive and these are the primitive data types. So as we know that this int, long, short, float, double, care all we have seen in C programming. Right? So character means any symbol or any key presented in the keyboard will be considered as a character. Mm -hmm. It should be enclosed in single quotes. Right? Next, byte is also an integer type but the range will be different. The range of byte, short, int, long, uh, everything will be different. So this is an integer with a small range. This is also an integer with a somewhat higher range. This is also an integer. This is also an integer. This one is a character. So character consists of, we know that, so 0 to 9 or A to Z, uppercase letters and lowercase letters as well as any special symbols available in our keyboard everything will comes under this character next float and double comes under the floating point variables so that means the value consists of both the decimal part and the fractional part right so for example 3.14 it's a pi value right so this is called a floating point value so which is having the decimal and the fractional part now, what's the difference between a float and double? So, float is having a single precision and a double is with a double precision. So, what is the difference between the single precision and the double precision? So, coming to the single precision, the number of digits after the point right so in the fractional part how many digits it will be accepted so in the single precision it will accept up to six or seven digits after the point that means the fractional part in the double precision it will accept so 14 or 15 so after the point it will accept up to 14 or 15 for example Take 10 by 3, the output will be 3.33. So it's a never ending, right? Right. So this is the single precision. This value, if it is a float, right? So after the point, the fractional part will consist of either 6 or 7 digits. So this is a float. And if it consists of So this is double. So after the point, the fractional part consists of 15 digits, 15 or 14 digits. So if it is a double, we will get a result as this one. If it is a float, we will get the result as this one. So that is the difference between the single precision and double precision. So here, so it will accept six or seven decimal values. It will accept 14 or 
15 decimal points and then our Java programming will always accept the double precision always it will accept the double precision by default it will be a double precision so in order to represent any floating variable in a float data type we have to include small f or a capital F at the suffix right so after the value suffix we have to represent f or capital F see for example let us take a value pi value so if you consider some pi pi is equal to 3.14 by default this pi will be taken as a double data type so by default it is a double precision if you want to consider this as a float suffix add as capital F or small f so by using this capital F or small f symbol we can consider this value as a float value so that is limited to this precision so hope you understood this difference between a float and double so by default it will be double so if you want to get the float we have to suffix f or small f at the end of the value so all these are the primitive data types all these are the primitive data types and non primitive data types are strings arrays classes so string is a group of characters array is a collection of elements homogeneous elements and a class class consists of variables and methods so we will see later right now what is the size occupied by each and every variable if you declare a variable with a boolean size boolean data type the size will be one bit right next if we declare any variable with a byte the size is one byte if we declare any variable with a character the size is two bytes the short is also two bytes int is a four bytes long it's eight bytes float is again four bytes double is again eight bytes so this is the size size of the variable size of the variable one byte two bytes two bytes two by four eight four and eight bytes right so in order to uh, i mean the uh, depends upon the usage of the variable or the value that we want to store on the variable we have to choose the data type so in the integer itself we are having four different data types byte short int long so the main difference between all these four is the range of that particular value so depends upon our value range we can select either byte or short or int or long anything we can choose then a float and double so hope you understood this all all these things right so let us uh, have a chat and we will wind up So pictorial representation, I will draw a complete pictorial representation so that we can wind up. So data types, it consists of non-primitive and primitive data. So in this non-primitive data type, we have seen string, it's a group of characters, arrays, collection of elements of similar data type, and a class consists of both variables and methods, etc. Everything comes under this non-primitive. And coming this primitive, again it is considered as two things. So Boolean numeric boolean data types and the numeric data types again in the numeric data types we are having character data type integral data type again in the integral data type we are having 
integer data types and a floating data types. In the integer again we are having byte short int long. In the floating we are having float double. Right? So these are the this is a chat to easily remember, right? So this size is one bit and this size is two bytes and this size is one byte. This size is 2 bytes, this size is 4 bytes, this one is 8 bytes, this one is again 4 bytes, this one is 8 bytes. Eight bytes. Right? So coming to this C language, that depends upon the architecture which we are using the size of that particular variable or a data type will be changing so for example if you take a 16 bit compiler the integer variable will will store the two bytes of memory and if you take the 32 bit compiler the integer variable will store in a uh, four bytes of memory will occupy the four bytes of memory but here in java there is an uh, one of the feature called architectural neutral irrespective of the architecture so anywhere you use this integer variable occupies only four bytes it doesn't change the occupying the memory allocation of that particular variable is will not change in our java programming irrespective of the architecture So as we know that input statement is used to read the input from the keyboard at the runtime and the output statement is used to print the output on the display screen. So in C language we use the input function as a scanf and the output function is printf. Right? So here in Java we have to use a few methods in order to read the input from the uh, keyboard and the write the output on the display screen we have to call some methods so in java everything will be written in a class so everything will be treated as a class and objects so here what is a class a class is a template or a blueprint which the object will follow right so every class consists of the properties as well as actions the properties and actions so these properties we call them as variables and these actions we call them as methods so each and every class consists of the variables as well as methods so in order to access these variables or methods this class cannot access directly these variables and methods so in order to access these variables and methods which are written in class compulsory we have to create an instance for this class an instance for this class that we call as object so an object must be created so our object is an instance it's a reference to the particular class and through this object we have to access these variables and methods so just like our structure members the structure and the members so we know that the structure consists of a template so let it be a struct student right student is a tag name struct student consists of 
some name character some name of 20 and int age close so this is the structure and in order to access these variables we have to use the structure variable and through the structure variable only these members will be accessed let it be if you declare some s1 as a structure variable so this structure variable consists of both the members and if you want to access these members this must be done only by means of the structure variable so we have to access like s1.name and s1.age right this is a possible and if you are trying to print directly the name and age this is not possible because these are the members of a structure and this can be accessed only by means of structure variable by using this dot operator the same thing is repeated in java programming so a class consists of variables and methods so here we are using only variables but here in addition we are having methods also in order to access these methods also we have to create an object and through the object we have to access the variables and methods for example the same thing class student So here directly we can have a string data type so string name right and uh, let it be display some display method is there so if you want to access this name we have to create an object for the student and through the student let it be object is created with the uh, s1 is an object so s1 dot name will print the name and s1 dot display will call the display method so by means of object only we have to call these variables or methods similarly here also the input and output functions the input and output functions also call with the class name see here the io stream there are three main io streams first one is system dot in so remember here yes is a capital s is a capital system dot out system dot error there are three io streams so stream is nothing but a, a bytes of data right so system dot in System.in is used to read the data from keyboard. Read the data from keyboard. System.out, right? System.out. So system.out is used to display the data on screen. System dot err that means it displays the error messages. Display the error messages, right? So here this is a this class. So system dot in, system dot out, and system dot error. So all these I/O streams are available in Java dot lang package. Java dot lang package. So here in C programming, we are including some header files before using the predefined functions, right? Like printf and scanf, these are the standard input and output functions. So in order to implement this printf and scanf, we are including the <coughs> standard input output dot h, that means header file. Similarly, here also every class will be available in the packages. So we have to import those packages before using those classes in our program. So here the standard input and output streams, IO streams, all these IO streams are available in lang package, lang package. So how to import? There is a statement, import, which is a keyword, right? We have seen this keyword, import space, write on the name, java dot lang dot star. So if you mention here star, that implies each and every class which, which belongs to this lang package will be accessed. 
or simply we can write the class name so that only that particular class itself we have to use in the program if you include the star every class can be used in our program right so by default java will import this java.lang.star so explicitly we the user need not include this java.lang.star right now so remember these three system.in system.out and system.error see coming to the output statement so first let us see the output statement so system dot out dot there are different functions available to display the output on the screen the first one is output dot print so it doesn't have a new line character so everything will be printed in a single line in a single line for example if you write system dot out dot print welcome and immediately if you write system dot out dot print java the output will be in a single line welcome and even though you are writing the next line it will print in a single line so this is the output for these two statements so it doesn't include the new line character so everything will be displayed in a single line so if you want to print in a next line we have to add ln in the print so system dot out dot print ln print ln means a line right so the output will be printed in multiple lines right multiple lines so if you include here ln print ln so whenever you are printing the ln the text will be displayed on the next line so here welcome will be printed and if you print system dot out dot print ln the text will be displayed on the next line so here you can write only print so only a single text so that will be printed and next text we are printing using print ln function so the data will be printed in the next line right so these two are the main things and there is one more thing that is print f system dot out dot print f so this is almost similar to the syntax which we are using in c language similar to c language so here we have to use a type space where percentage d for integer percentage f for float percentage d for double right so everything all these type specifiers must be included if you use this system dot out dot print ln so these specifiers are not required if you use this system dot out dot print and system dot out dot Printed. So if you use these two functions, these specifiers are not required. If you use the system dot out dot printf, this access specifier should be included. So hope you understood the output function. So everything is same, right? So next, let us see the input function. Input function. So here. input function input function means 
in order to read the output i mean in order to read the data from the keyboard at the runtime itself okay so for this we will use scanner class or buffer reader class so in the buffer reader with the help of input stream reader and file reader so there are two methods to read the input at the runtime so one is by using the scanner class another one by using the buffer reader class right so this scanner class is used to read the data from keyboard and by using this buffer reader we can read the input from either keyboard or from a file and it should be existing file so already some existing file right so files concept in our c language so we can read the data from existing file or from the keyboard but here scanner class should be used to read the data from keyboard itself so this is available in util package this is available in io package so in order to implement this scanner class this must be i mean the util package should be included import java dot util dot scanner so as we have seen the name naming conventions in the previous session that we have to follow some particular rules so every class will be every class name will be starting with a capital letter so here this scanner and the buffer reader all these are the classes so first letter of these words will be capital so this should be remembered right so java dot util dot scanner so by using this statement this scanner class has been imported to our program or simply without writing the scanner you can write a star so whatever the classes available in this util package everything we can use in the program so anything you can write similarly if you use this buffer reader so here also every first character of the word should be capital letter we have seen in the naming conventions right so buffer reader b capital and r capital so if you want to implement this buffer reader we have to import this io package so for that import java dot io dot star right or simply we can write io dot buffer reader so first in this session let us see this scanner class in the next session we will see this buffer reader right now coming to this scanner class scanner class so as i have said just now so a class consists of variables and methods in order to implement that variables or methods in in, uh, in case of accessing those methods of that particular class that can be done only by means of an object created for that particular class so that means if you want to access some methods in, in from of this scanner class we have to create an object and from that object through that object itself we have to access the methods so what are the methods available in scanner class so next next method is used to read string read string next int is used to read integer similarly next float read float value next double is used to read a double value 
right? So these are the few methods available in scanner gas. So in order to access these methods, first one object should be created for the scanner gas, and through that object, by using the dot operator, we have to use these methods. Let it be SC is the object created for the scanner. SC. So I will tell you how to create an object for a class. So what is the syntax to create an object for a class? So let it be first SC is a object created for the scanner class. SC. So in order to access these methods, what is the statement? The object dot the method. SC dot next will read the string. I will write here. sc dot next similarly sc dot next int sc dot next float sc dot next double right so here what is the sc it is an instance of scanner class instance of a scanner class that means we can simply say the object object for scanner class so before accessing these methods we have to create an object and through that object we have to access the methods now how to create an object creation of an object for a class so for this, the class name followed by object name is equal to new keyword followed by constructor, constructor. So this is the syntax to create an object. So a constructor is just like a method which is having the name equal to our class name. So just I am telling the definition. So in the uh, next sessions, I will tell you in depth about the constructors. So what is a constructor and uh, how many types of constructors are there. So we will discuss in the next sessions, right? So now just note down the syntax. The class name followed by object name and new and the constructor. So what is the importance of constructor means here new is used to create an object and constructor is used to initialize an object. So new keyword is used to create an object. Constructor is used to initialize the object. So constructor will always have the name similar to the class name. So whatever the class name we are using, the constructor will also have the same name. So, just we will uh, create an object for this scanner. So, follow this syntax class name that is scanner. So, we know that class name always consists of a capital letters, first letter that is scanner, S capital, object name. So, we have created SC is an object. So, SC is equal to new, and here the constructor. constructor. So as I have said, the constructor is to initialize the object and the name of a constructor must be equal to the class name. New scanner. Right? New scanner. So this is the syntax to create an object for the class. Right? Now, where from where we have to read the input? So input should be read from keyboard. So, in order to read the input from the keyboard, we have an IO stream called system.in. System.in is used to read the data from the keyboard. So, we have to pass this system.in IO stream to the as a parameter for this constructor. So, scanner system.in. Right? System.in. So here S is also a capital letter as a system is a class name. So S is a capital letter, right? So this is the 
syntax to read an input from the keyboard. So by using this SC object, we have to access the next to read an integer, uh, read a string, next int to read the integer, next float to read the float value, next double to read the double value. Right? So as we know that uh, variables should be declared before they are used in the program. Right? Now let us see the program, a simple program and let us wind up today and next session I will tell you the buffer reader. So let it be int a comma b, I have to read two integers or uh, simply uh, we can use some string name int a float b double c so in order to read these one read, read the input from the keyboard we have to use the scanner class so first create an object scanner object name can be anything i have given some sc as the scanner object so you can write any object name so let it be ivo ivo as a object is equal to new so object name can be anything object name this is an object name new constructor so the name must be equal to the scanner and we have to read the input from the keyboard we have to use system.in io stream as a parameter to the constructor now by using this io we have to read the values so name is equal to io dot next so this will or, or this is this will read the input next a is equal to i go dot next int b is equal to i go dot next float i go dot next double so in the naming conventions we have seen the rules to be followed for the method so if it is a method the first character of a first word should be small letter and every first character from the next words should be a capital letter so that's why next int is a method n is a small letter and i is a capital letter similarly n is a small letter f is a capital letter n is a small letter and the d is a capital letter right so here this is the a simple statements to read the data from the keyboard so here we need not declare the variables one at one place and we can be uh, i mean in in our c program first we have to declare the variables then only we can we have to use the variables in our program but here while using the program while using the variables itself we can declare the variables directly we can remove this Part and directly at the time of initialization here itself we can declare the variable string name is equal to int a is equal to float b is equal to double c is equal to so at the time of usage itself we can declare a variable right that, that is one more thing available in our java programming so I hope you understood this input function scanner class by using the scanner class so in this session we have seen the io streams system.in system.out and system.err and the output function that is system.out there are different methods print println printf and similarly the input function by using the scanner class and the buffer reader class so in this session we have seen the scanner class so every class will be consist of variables and methods in order to access those variables and methods compulsory we have to create an object and through that object itself we have to read the i mean we have to access the variables or methods so in the scanner class we have seen the different methods 
In order to access those methods, first we have to create an object for the scanner class and then through that object we have to access the methods. See, so here this buffer reader we can read input from either a keyboard or by using a file. That means uh, we need a file with a, some, some data and from that the file we can directly access the data by using this buffer reader. See this buffer reader is used to read the characters reads the characters from the input stream from the character input stream right so as we know there are three input streams io streams that is system.in system.out and system.err right so coming to this system.in so here we can read a byte by byte information by using that system. In. So here there is a one more class to read all the bytes and to decode it into the characters. So before applying this buffered reader, the input stream reader class will read the bytes and it will decode it into the some character set. So there is one more class input stream reader. So it will read bytes and decode it to character set. So from this character set we can use this buffer reader, right? So this is done with the help of the input stream system dot in. This is done by means of by, with the help of system dot in, which is the standard IO stream. And there is a one more class to read the data from the file. That is file reader. So just go through the convention naming conventions. We have discussed that every class name should start with a capital letter, and every second word in the class name also should start with a capital letter. So here input stream reader is a capital letter. File reader is a, I mean, input stream reader is a class and a file a file reader is also a class. So in the class, the first word input i capital stream second word s capital reader third word r capital. Here also file f capital r r capital. Similarly, there is a one more class. So, so file reader it is used to read the data from files right so this is used to read the data from files so this is the first step we have to do and all these bytes which are taken from this system in or from files will be buffered that means a collection of information will be buffered and through this buffer we will use this buffer reader to read the data so this is a buffer where the data is saved right so all the data all the information all the input which are, which is taken from the system dot in as well as from files everything will be buffered and by using this buffered reader we can access the data from this buffer so buffered reader class so here also buffered reader is a class so in the buffered reader the first word buffered b capital and reader r capital so hope you understood this is the first step we have to do and this is the second step we have to do so in order to read an input by using this buffered reader first we have to read the bytes from the keyboard or from the files and it should be converted into a character set so by means of these two classes input stream reader and the file reader and once all the data is buffered we can use this buffer reader class to access the data from the buffer so we can access this buffer by using an object right so in the previous session we have said 
any class cannot invoke the methods so a class cannot invoke the methods so in order to invoke the methods or access the methods we have to create an instance of that class that we call it as an object so first we have to create an object then through that object we have to access the methods so let us see one by one what is the syntax so once again i am saying input stream reader class this is used to read the bytes from the system.in standard input and file reader is used to read the bytes of information from existing files so here there is a question of if you if you are accessing if you are accessing the data from the file which doesn't exist right so if you are accessing the data from the file which doesn't exist then it will raise an exception so here always we have to include an io exception while implementing this buffered reader class so by using this buffered reader we can read the input from keyboard and file so if it is a file so if the if we are accessing the data from the file which doesn't exist one exception will be raised so we have to throw an exception while using this buffered reader so that exception is called io exception so here i o e all the three are capital letters i o exception input output exception so this exception will be raised when an error of uh, error in reading the input or printing the output so hope you understood so this buffer reader class is available in i o package i o package so if you are implementing this buffer reader we have to import import java dot io dot star or simply we can write java dot io dot input stream reader or i will i java dot io dot buffer reader so both the packages we have to import so avoiding two statements we can write it in a single statement that import java dot io dot star so whatever the classes available in io all the classes can be accessed in our program so all these classes will be available in io package right see so this is the first step and this is the second step let us take it now let us see what are the methods available in buffer reader right so buffer reader will read only the characters reads characters or strings or this is strings so except the characters and strings it will not read any input so i, I mean integers or floats so before using the integer value we have to read the character and then we have to uh, type convert that into a integer see so what is the methods so method read and read line so there are two methods available in the buffer reader class to read the input one is read read line so read it reads a single character it reads a single character and if we want to read a multiple characters then we have to use this read line it reads multiple characters simply we can say it as a string so read line is used to read a string so how to implement this reader read line so by using the object and before using them we have to typecast the uh, string to integer so for typecasting we had a method called parsint parsint right and in order to implement this parsint we have to use with the class integer integer dot parsing of this particular method similarly float dot parse float so as i said this is a method the first character always will be a small small uh, lower case character and the first letter of this next next word will be the capital so parsing i capital parse float f capital and in order to implement this method we have to access this method by using this class name so float dot parse float parse int integer dot parse int 
and here we have to access this read or read line methods. So we will write a program so that you can understand. Right. So in order to read the data by using this buffer reader, first we let us use the system.in, then we can use with the files. Okay, system.in. So for this, first we have to access or read the data by using the input stream reader. So input stream reader, right? Some IR. IR is an object. IR is equal to the new keyword input stream reader from where? From the keyboard. So system dot in. So this is the syntax to read the bytes and convert into the character set by means of this IR. So input stream reader IR is equal to new input stream reader system dot in. So from the keyboard, the bytes will be converted into characters and it will be accessed through IR object. Now in the second step, we have to read the character set data from the buffer. So that can be done by using buffered reader. So buffered reader class space some br so this is an object name and as i said that the object names can be anything so it's a programmer which so br is equal to new buffer reader so from where we have to read the data from this object ir ir so here ir from the keyboard the data is given to the IR and from the IR we are by using this BR method I mean BR object we are accessing the data let it be integer if you want to read an integer so int a is equal to so by default it will be the character so we have to typecast so for the typecasting we have to use an integer class dot parsint of we have to access the method which method read or read line so that method is available in buffer reader and buffer reader class cannot directly access the methods of read or read line so in order to access the read or read line methods which are available in buffer reader that can be done only by means of this method created for this class so buffer reader class having the method i mean object br so by using this br we have to access the read or read line so here we can write br dot read line so here again it's a method so r is a small letter and l is a capital letter in order to read a float float b is equal to float dot pass float again we can write br dot read line so a single method can read everything because here we can read only the characters or strings and it should be converted into integer or a float when it is required and in order to read a string simply we can write string str is equal to directly we can read br dot read line so here there is no type conversion because by default it will read the uh, string data the input is will be in a string data right so this is the simple thing to read the input from keyboard by using this i was stream right now let us see the second method that is reading the data from file so here also the same thing so everything is same but the only thing is in order instead of using this input stream reader we have to use a file reader see in order to read this this one from files we can write file reader some fr is equal to new file reader it's a class and a constructor 
and here we have to give the location right so let it be my program is in some d drive right d drive some in java right in java and there is a file name as input.txt right and i have to write the complete location of this file complete location of this file so generally we will write d colon slash here the, the single slash will not be accessed so if you want to implement this slash we have to use a double slash d colon double slash java again double slash what's the file name input input dot txt so enclose this location in double quotes and close it this location in double quotes and the semicolon also must be there right so in the first step from the input dot text that a bytes will be read by using this fr object and he, here we have to read the data from fr fr right so here also we can read only the data in a character set so we can directly read some string str is equal to br dot read line read line so this will read the text from this file input.txt file and it will be assigned to the string so directly we can print some system dot out dot print ln or print str so this will directly print the data which is available in this input dot txt to the screen so this is a one more method to read the data from files by using this buffer reader class so hope you understood this buffer reader class so by using this buffer reader class we can read the data from the keyboard as well as from the files so if you are using the data i mean if you want to read the data from the keyboard we have to use the input stream reader class and if you are reading the data from the files we have to reuse the file reader class right so let us write a program so uh, once again if this file is not available if this file input file is not available in that location it will raise an exception so we have to write the exception also so let us write a small program class some buffer so inside the class i have to write the main function so public static void main string args here we have to throw an exception throws i wo exception I will exception now we can write input stream reader some ir is equal to new input stream reader system dot in and now from the ir we have to read the data by using the buffer reader class buffer reader br is equal to new buffer reader from this ir object from the ir object now write down int a is equal to a class name dot parsing of br dot read line similarly string s capital remember that string str is equal to some br dot read line simply we can print system dot out dot print ln 
ये सिमिलरली सिस्टम डॉट आउट डॉट प्रिंट एल एन एस टी एम सो कैन क्लोज द मेन फंक्शन एंड द क्लास सो दिस इज अ सिंपल प्रोग्राम टू रीड द डेटा फ्रॉम द की बोर्ड एंड प्रिंट दट ऑन द स्क्रीन command line arguments so here we need not give the input in the input statement that means we need not write any input and input statements in the program itself so we can pass the inputs as an arguments while compiling the program right so we know that in order to compile a program we will use the java c command right so for example some cmd dot java is a file name so we have to compile by using java c cmd dot java right it will check for the errors and if if it is an error free automatically dot class file so cmd dot class file will be generated in order to execute this class file we will use a command called java space cmd Here we need not mention any extension, either dot Java or dot class file. By default, it will be taken as a dot class file, right? So here itself, in the runtime itself, while running the program itself, we can pass the inputs to the program. So whatever the inputs we are we are supposed to give in the program, that inputs should be written here. So if if a program we have written for addition of two numbers. If you write a program for addition of two numbers, what are the how many inputs we have to give? Two inputs we have to give. So a and b, the first number and second number. Both the numbers we can write here. So for example, ten and twenty. We can give the command as Java cmd and followed by the inputs ten twenty. And these arguments, I mean these inputs, will be called as an arguments. and these arguments will be stored in arguments array arguments array right so we know that an array consists of a group of elements of same data type and always the index starts from zero so that means whatever the input we are giving after the class name that will be stored in array of 0 in the index array of 0 and the second argument will be stored in arg array of 1 so if you are writing args s as an array name array of array of 0 array of 1 and if you write on the third statement it will be stored in array of 2 so like a, likewise so every input will be stored in arg arguments array and this argument array is string right array of strings array of strings right so these arguments array is strings whatever here we are giving a 10 as an input this 10 is stored in args 0 and that is of string data type here 20 is stored in args 1 which is of string data type here 30 is stored in args 2 which is of string data type. so in order to use this 10 in our program we have to type cast type cast this args of 0 so in order to type cast we are having the command called integer dot parse int which we have seen in input statement right integer dot parse int of we can write args of 0 the array name of 0 similarly 1 similarly 2 similarly 3 right so like this we can convert the string to integer right so where we have to pass this argument array where we have to pass this is argument array so 
as we know that the inputs are nothing but an arguments arguments are nothing but inputs given to the some function right so we have to pass this arguments array to a function so here what is the function we are writing in the program that is called main function so all these arguments arrays should be inside the main function written inside the main function so we can write a main string because array is a string data type adds of we need not specify the size because at the runtime itself we are giving the number of arguments so we need not specify the size so dynamically, dynamically it will allocate the space so whatever the, whatever the comment whatever the arguments we are passing at the runtime those arguments will be stored in this string array right hope you understood this one so in order to add two numbers we need not write any input statements in, in the function that means we are not writing any scanner class or a buffer reader class in the program just we are passing the inputs at the command prompt while executing the program see let us write the program so that you can easily understand some class add we have to write the main function so it should be public so that it will be available for all the classes so always the main function should be in a public specifier public modifier and also it should be a static so if it is a public and static it will be available for all the classes in the program and this is the return type so we can write a void int float whatever it may be so it doesn't return any value we can write a void but in java every function should have a return type if you are not writing any return type it will give an error so every so in the c program we need not write write int add in the definition right so we can write implement this as int add and so on it will this is also right thing so by default the return type will be integer here explicitly the user have to specify the return type so there is no default return type right so void main function and here we have to pass an arguments what are the arguments string args we can give any any uh, error name this one now we need not write any input statements just write down int a comma b comma c and now take the inputs a is equal to i mean uh, convert type convert it integer dot pass int of whatever what is the first input which is available in the array name of 0 that means in the 0th index next b is equal to integer dot parsint arguments array of 1 now c is equal to a plus b now print out system dot out dot print ln c so it will give an error so why executing so always the program should be saved with the name of a class name in which main function has been written so in our program number of classes can be written and in which class we are writing the main is called the main class so we have to save the file that means dot java file should be having the file name which is equal to the main class name right so we have to save it as add dot java so after writing this one we have to compile it by using java c add dot java after this we have to run the file which is java add so as it is the command line arguments we have to give the inputs in the command line itself 
So here we have to give two inputs. Let it be 10, 20. Automatically the result will be printed as 30. Because the 10 will be stored in argument 0. The 20 will be stored in array 1, index 1. And the both uh, index 1 and index 0 values will be added. And it will be assigned to C and the C will be printed. So 30 will be printed here. So this is the command line arguments. Any program, any logic, we can take the input in command itself. So that's why we have to write this string dot arguments array in every main function. So in the absence of this parameter, that means argument declaration, the program is not about to execute. So an error will be occurred. So this is the syntax of a main function which is available in JVM. So the compilation will be done successfully but while executing the program you will get the error. So the JVM will check for this string arguments. If you are not mentioning here, it is nothing but a zero. If you are mentioning here, this will be assigned to R guess, I mean the array index 0 and array index 1. Hope you understood this command line arguments. If you want to give any, any input function here, you have to write the scanner class and by using the scanner class, object should be created and through that object we have to write the methods that means next line, next int, next float. So these are the methods available in scanner class which we have seen in the earlier session. So by using those functions, we have to read the input by using this scanner class or buffered reader class. So here you can see we are not writing any input functions in the program. We are giving the directly the inputs at the command prompt. So hope you understood this command line arguments. As we know, the variable is an alternate name given for the memory location, right? Aliasing for memory location. So a variables in Java are of three types. One is local variables, instance variables, static variables, local, instance and static. So here local variables is, these are the variables declared within a method within an individual method so that variable can be used only in that particular method right so outside the method we can't access this variable so it is just within the method just like our local variables so in within the method we can directly access the variable right Inside the method itself, we can directly access the variable. Next, coming to these instance variables, we know our Java programming is an object-oriented programming in that everything will be considered as objects or classes. So class and we will create an instance for this class which is called as an object. So here the instance variables are declared inside the class but not inside the method so these are the variables declared inside the class inside the class right so these are the variables declared within a method these are the these are the variables which are declared inside the class and here this is also similar to this local variable but in order to access these variables we have to create an object so accessing is done through object here we can use a direct access so no need of creating an instance for the class for these local variables 
and for the instance variables we have to create an object before accessing these variables and the static variables these are the memory allotted only once and these are declared using static keyword static keyword so the value will remain same the memory location will be remain same throughout the program so this also also we can directly access we can directly access and this can be declared inside the class or a method right so these are the three types of variables so one is static instance and the local variables so local variables are declared within the method and they can be directly accessible instance variables are declared inside the class and then accesses can be done only through the object so in order to access these variables we have to create an object and through the object only we can access static variables are declared by using the static keyword and that they can also be directly accessible and the memory allotted for these static variables are only once throughout the program now let us see an example simple example See, let it be a class variable, the class name is variable and as we know that a class consists of variables and methods. So here we can write int a is equal to 10, right? Next I am writing the main function public static void main and the parameters so these parameters we have discussed in the command line arguments right ox some int b is equal to 20 right system dot out dot print ln a system dot out dot print ln b see if we write this simple program here we are declaring two variables a is equal to 10 and b is equal to 20 and just we are printing the variables a and b so here a is equal to 10 is declared outside the method and inside the class so these are called as instance variables instance variables so those are the variables declared inside the class but outside the method and this b is equal to 20 is declared inside the method so this is called local variables local variables and if you declare one more variable static int c is equal to 30 so by using the static keyword so these are called static variables by using static keyword now in order to access them so as b is a local variable we can access directly right so directly this will print 20 and here static in c let us print c here so as it is a static keyword static variable this can also be directly accessible so 30 will be printed and if you are writing the same thing see system dot out dot print ln a so this will give an error error because here variable a is instance variable so instance variables are can only accessible through the object right so by using the object itself we have to access the variable so before using this we have to create an object 
So let us create an object for this one. So in order to create an object, we know that the syntax, the class name, object is equal to new keyword followed by the constructor. So we will discuss about this constructor in the next sessions. So variable, so this is an object creation. object creation so this is an object creation for the class variable so class name object name is equal to new keyword and the constructor now by using this object name we have to access the instance variables so directly we need, we should not write it as a we have to access by using this object so obj dot a this will print the value 10 so that's, that is the importance of the instance variables. So instance variables are not accessible directly, but here by means of object we have to access the variables. So hope you understood this one. Three types of variables: static variables, instance, and the local variables. Right. So let us see an example by executing a simple program. This program, so that your doubts will be clarified. Hi friends. So let us see the example implementing this uh, different types of variables which we have seen just now so just i am creating a class variable so inside that class i am creating an instance instance variable so just i am declaring a variable a is equal to 10 which we call it as an instance variable and now i am writing this uh, main function right so here just i am accessing the instance variable system dot out dot println right so just i am printing i am trying to print the variable value on the screen so i, I have just written system dot out dot println and a so just i have to save these variables so variable variable dot java right now let us implement this one so java c to compile this one variable dot java So if you observe it returns an error the non-static variable a cannot be referenced from a static context so if it is declared as a static i mean by using the static keyword so that can be directly accessed by the any method in that particular class so here see just i have declared that variable the same variable with the static keyword now i can get the program executed successfully so a value is printed here right see in the absence of this static keyword so we are getting the error that means because here a is an instance variable so a is an instance variable so any instance variable can be accessed only through the object so inside the main method we have to create an object for this class so variable class name obj object name is equal to new keyword and the constructor variable so here the object has been created for this variable so object name can be anything so let us let, let us take v v as a object variable v now we have to access the instance variable by using the object name so we need not uh, or, or sorry we should not access a directly but we have to use an object name so v dot a because v is a instance of that particular variable class so by using this v only we have to access the variable now we can get the output see you can see this now the value 10 is printed right 
so because here the instance variable a is an instance variable and here we are we are creating an object and through the object we are accessing a see inside the main method i am creating or i am declaring one more variable some b is equal to 20 so this is called local variable so inside any method the variable is declared as local variable so this can be accessed directly system dot out dot println b so directly we can access the b value so if you execute this one compile this one successfully compile and execute it so instance variable is equal to this one local variable is equal to this one see now you can observe this one so we can have both the instance variable 10 local variable 20 and if you create a one more variable with a static keyword static int b is equal to sorry sorry c is equal to 30 now we can directly access this just like our local variable system dot out dot println static variable is equal to plus c so just like our local variables we can access the static variables so 10 20 and static variable 30 or we can directly access by using the class name right so we can directly use that variable or we can use this by using the class name right so here variable is a class directly we can access this class dot that particular variable or simply we can use a variable name and 20 and 30 so this is the static variable this is the static variable instance static and local so hope you understood this one so very important thing is instance variables so any instance variables which are declared inside the class but outside the method should be accessed only through the object so first we have to create an object for that particular cla class and through that object by using the dot operator we can access the variables in this session let us see about the constructor right so before going to the constructor in the previous sessions we have seen that is a class <coughs> is a blueprint or a template which the object should be followed and a class consists of variables and methods so in order to access the variables or methods of a class <coughs> we are supposed to create an instance for that class and through the instance only we have to access the variables so here we have seen the creation object creation so that is done by using the syntax class name <coughs> followed by object name is equal to new keyword it's a new keyword new followed by constructor right so our topic today is constructor right so this is the object creation So, this new keyword is used to create an instance that is nothing but object, right? And constructor is used to initialize the object. Initialize the object. Right? So new is used for creating an object that means just a declaration path 
and constructor here we can we are using is to initialize the object now rules to be followed for creating a constructor rules for a constructor so first rule is the constructor name <coughs> constructor name must be equal to class name constructor name must be equal to the class name second rule constructor doesn't have return type so it doesn't return any value right so constructor name should be equal to the class name constructor doesn't have any return type right so these are the main rules to be followed while creating a constructor and it is entirely different from from a method but the working is similar to the method see let us see an example let us create a student class so class student with two variables string name int roll number r number right i am writing the main function here public static void main write on the arguments write on the arguments so inside the main function in order to access this one, we have to create an object. So, I am creating an object for this student class. So, class name, we should follow the order. Class name student, object name, let it be S1 is equal to new constructor. Constructor, the rules are, first one, we have to, the name of the constructor must be equal to the class name. So, student and we have to open and close the parentheses. So, this is the constructor, right? It doesn't return any value. So, it, it, it doesn't have any return type, but the working of this constructor is similar to our method. See. System dot out dot print ln. If you print the name and similarly system dot out dot print ln. If you print the R number, so what is the result? So initially these are declared but not initialized. Here we are giving a constructor, right? So that means object is created and here printing the name. So, sorry, we have to access the name by using the object name, right? So S1 dot name, similarly R number should be accessed by using the object name. So here the value, the variable is declared but not initialized. Similarly, R number is declared but not initialized. So here, by using the constructor, there are initialized to null or a zero, right? By default, it will be zero. So here, what will be happen here? So whenever the control executes this constructor, the control will search for this constructor in the class. So here, there is no explicit return of this constructor. So we have not written any type of method in this class, right? Now, let us change this one. Let us change this one. So I am writing the constructor. Student. I am initializing here, right? 
Inside the constructor, I am initializing. Some name is equal to double quotes as it is a string. Some A, B, C and R number is equal to some 1, 2, 3. Right? So this is the constructor I have written. How should we know that whether this is a constructor or not? So that will give our second rule. So second rule is our constructor doesn't have any return type. Doesn't have any return type. So, so this method doesn't have any return type. So here return type means if we are writing any return, I mean any function or any method. So we are writing add. So it should have one return type just like int or void. So without this return type, it, it should not be considered as a method in our Java programming. So in our C program, we can directly write add because the default return type will be the integer. But in Java, we have to specify the return type. If it doesn't return anything, we have to include void also. So if any return type, if we are not mentioning any return type, that will be considered as a constructor. So here we have written a constructor, it's not a method, right? Then I'm writing the met, I mean main function public static void main parameters. So here I am creating an object for this one. So student s1 is equal to new constructor student. Now I am accessing this one system dot println sorry system dot out dot println system dot out dot print ln so I am printing a name here similarly system dot out dot print ln I am printing the sorry I have to access them with the help of object name r number so here also s1 dot name right so I am closing the main function and this one so our program always starts execution from the main function after creating the dot class file. So this function will be executed first s1 object is created. So whenever this ob object creation is done, whenever the control executes this step, automatically the control will check for this constructor. The control will check for this constructor in our class. So is there any constructor student without any parameters? Yes. So this is the constructor block. Immediately, whenever the control reaches this constructor, executing this constructor, immediately the constructor will execute this method. So it is not a method, but it's a constructor, right? So in this constructor, we are initializing the variable name and R number as ABC and 1, 2, 3. So ABC is initialized to name, 1, 2, 3 is initialized to R number. So after executing this one, the control will execute these two statements system.out.println, s1.name, s1.r number. So, whenever here we are printing s1.name, abc will be printed, and whenever we are printing this r number, 123 will be printed. Right? So, this, this happened because we have written a constructor by initializing the variables. Right? So whenever the program or the control executes this statement, the control will search for this constructor in our program. If there is no, if, if it doesn't exist in our class file, automatically those variables will be declared with a zero. Right? So object reference will be zero or null. So whenever it founds the, if, if, if the constructor founds the here in the class, automatically the code, the block will be executed. Right? So that is the importance of constructor, initializing the object. So I hope you understood this one. Now our constructor is of two types. One is default constructor. 
सेकेंड वन इज पैरामीटराइज कंस्ट्रक्टर पैरामीटराइज कंस्ट्रक्टर राइट सो डिफॉल्ट कंस्ट्रक्टर सो कंस्ट्रक्टर मीन्स हियर विदउट एनी आर्ग्यूमेंट्स वी कॉल इट एज ए डिफॉल्ट कंस्ट्रक्टर एंड पैरामीटर कंस्ट्रक्टर मीन्स वी आर पासिंग सम इनपुट्स इन द ऑब्जेक्ट क्रिएशन इट सेल्फ दैट इज कॉल्ड पैरामीटर इज कंस्ट्रक्टर दैट मीन्स वी आर पासिंग सम पैरामीटर एज इनपुट्स इन वाइल क्रिएटिंग एन ऑब्जेक्ट राइट सो दिस इज कॉल्ड डिफॉल्ट कंस्ट्रक्टर सो देर देर इज नो आर्ग्यूमेंट एट ऑल वी आर जस्ट कॉलिंग द कंस्ट्रक्टर it will search for this constructor in the class it will execute the constructor block right so now we will see this parameterized constructor so see let us write the constructor here student string str int n open name is equal to str r number is equal to n close here i will write the main function here so this is a continuation right public static void main arguments right now i will create an object so system oh, sorry 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 so our class name is student so student s1 is equal to new student right next student s2 is equal to i am creating one more object right so i am creating one more object student s2 is equal to new student here i am passing the arguments right some d e f 4 5 d e f and 4 5 so now i am printing this to system dot out dot print ln s1 dot name similarly system dot out dot print ln s1 dot r number so this we have seen in the previous session right i mean just now we have seen the program now i will write uh, i will display the second object values system dot out dot print ln s2 dot name system dot out dot print ln s2 dot r number so i am closing the main function and i am closing the class right see this continuation so here in our program i have written two constructors with the same name right so actually in our c programming that means in our uh, procedure oriented programming this is a disadvantage so we can't uh, give the same name for different functions right so it will return an error but here it will accept it right that's called a method overloading so that we will discuss in the next sessions so here two constructors have written so one without arguments another constructor with arguments so in the main function we have created two objects one object is created by using default constructor another object is created by using constructor with argument that means parameterized constructor so here we are passing parameters so whenever the control comes here it will search for this constructor so this block will be executed so this block it's a default constructor right 
so this this block is a default constructor so this will be executed and name abc and 1 to 3 are initialized for s1 object so for s1 object abc and 1 to 3 are the values now coming to the second line student s2 that means second object is created but here the constructor is with two arguments so the compiler or will check for this i mean the control will check for this constructor with parameters two uh, two parameters so it will search for the constructor with two parameters in our class so there is a block so this is the constructor with two parameters so whenever whenever this statement executes automatically the control will comes here and it will be executed here so what is in here so in this parameters first one is string second one is an integer so first one first parameter will be assigned to str and the second parameter is assigned to here so here passing here it is acquiring initializing so def is stored in str 456 is stored in m now we are initializing the variables name and r number name is equal to str now name consists of def and r number consists of 456 so after finishing this block so this is the parameterized constructor parameterized constructor right so because we are passing parameters to the constructor so whenever we are printing this s1.name and s1.r number some abc will be printed here 1 2 3 will be printed here right whenever we are printing this s2.name here s2.name so s2.name means def and 5 4 5 6 df is stored in name and 456 is stored in yeah so here whenever we are printing name def will be printed number 456 will be printed so that means here two objects are created s1 so abc 1 2 3 whenever we are creating the second object s2 with the names def and 456 so here printing s1 dot name s1 dot name s1 dot number s2 dot name s2 dot number so this like this a constructor will be work so hope you understood these constructors right so there are <coughs> two types of constructors default constructor and the parameterized constructor in the default constructor we, we need not specify any parameters that means we, we need not pass any parameters so without arguments constructor without arguments and we need not write this block so it will search for this block the constructor with the same constructor name in the class if it doesn't exist it will be initialized to zero or null if it is initialized this, if, if it is written in our class so this block will be executed and if we pass some parameters it will search for these parameters so that means so here constructor with two arguments here also it will search for the constructor with two arguments if you are writing here three arguments it will again return an error so the count of arguments should be same the constructor name and this uh, constructor block should be having the same name with same number of parameters right so hope you understood this constructor so once again i am saying the constructor having the two rules mainly one is a constructor name should be equal to the class name and uh, it, it doesn't have any return type so if you write any return type here before this constructor let it be int student or simply you if you write here void student this will be considered as a method it is not a i mean it is not a constructor it is a method because it is having the return type so we should not write any return type to the constructor so those are the two rules to be followed right hi hi friends so now let us see the implementation of constructor so we have seen a two types of constructors the default constructor and the uh, parameterized constructor so let us create a class student just take the same example class student so we have taken two variables so name of a student and a roll number so let us uh, just create an object and let us see so public write down the main function static void main 
string arguments string so let us print this one system dot out dot print ln let us print this one sorry before printing this one we have to create an object so student as these are the class variables instance variables so we have to access them only through the object student s1 is equal to new keyword for creating a object and the constructor so student s1 dot name system dot out dot print ln s1 dot r number so here just we have created uh, the variables i mean we have declared a variables and we have created an instance for the student class and we are just printing the s1 dot name and s or s1 dot r number so by using this new an object is created and by using this constructor the object i mean uh, the variables i mean the object is initialized so let us save this file with the student with the class name student dot java right now let us implement that one by using java c student dot java yes so successfully dot class file has been created now let us create student i mean let us execute the student see if you observe here whenever the control executes this statements if you use this new method the object is created and student so constructor will find search for this constructor in our class name so here we have not written any constructor with this name right so we didn't write explicitly the constructor method so just they are initialized to null and zero now let us write the constructor with the same name and let us check student sorry right student let us create i mean initialize some values some abc and initialize the run number also 1 2 3 so close now whenever the control executes this statements s1 object is created and immediately it will search for this constructor in our class so it finds this block because this constructor i mean this student method doesn't have any return type so it will be considered as a constructor so here in that constructor i mean whenever it finds the constructor this block will be executed so what it is executing so name is equal to abc that means some string is assigned to the variable and some integer value is assigned to the variable r number now after executing the statements i mean after completion of the statement these two statements will be executed so printing of s1 dot name and s1 dot r number it prints abc and 1 2 3 let us check that one yes successfully executed that means i mean successfully compiled so dot class file has been generated java student so it will give abc and 1 2 3 it will it is displaying abc and 1 2 3 now if we create the second object with a parameterized constructor so student s2 is equal to new student some string give the string d e f and 4 5 6 so i am here passing two variables right so next here i am just displaying them by using the second object so s2 dot name and s2 dot roll number so let us check this see here we will get an error because we didn't write any constructor so here whenever the statement executes it will search for this constructor it finds here so whenever this statement executes it will search for the constructor with the two parameters so which doesn't exist here so this is not a default argument this is not a default argument so this is a parameterized argument
parameterized constructor so this is the default constructor right so for the parameterized constructor it will search for this constructor with the parameters which doesn't find in the class name so it will return an error constructor student in class student cannot be applied to given types right so required no arguments so here only we have written the default constructor here now let us write the one more constructor with the arguments and let us check again so student the first argument is a string so string str comma second one is integer int n so here name is equal to str r number is equal to n now let us execute so this block is a default constructor and this block is a parameterized constructor right so both are written explicitly now let us execute this one so if you compile this one so successfully compile that means no errors and dot class file has been generated if you execute this one so abc 123 def 456 so here we have written four we are printing four values so first two with the default constructor second two with the parameterized constructor right so hope you understood this one so in the absence of this one let us check so here i am giving the comments to this default constructor so now it will again return an error see again it will return an error so that means if we write this parameterized constructor we have to write the default constructor also in the absence of the parameterized constructor we need not write the default constructor so if we write any parameterized constructor in our class definitely we have to write the default constructor explicitly in the class so that is the point i want to tell you now let us see the importance of main function that means we have we are writing the main function as public static void main string arguments so let us see one by one what is the importance of all those things Right. So we know that in Java programming or any programming language, the execution will start from the main function, and everything we have to write it in the main function. So whatever the classes we are creating and whatever the objects we are creating, everything for everything the reference should be in this main function. We have to write the reference in this main function. So unless you write the reference in this main function, the particular class or object will not be executed. So if you observe in the previous sessions we are writing one class and we are creating that objects in this main function so that we can access the variables and methods of that particular class by using that object which is created in main function so for that the main function we are writing public static void main right so everything will be for everything there will be an importance so this is not a syntax we should not call it as a syntax right so the, that's the only syntax i will i will tell you so public we know this is the access modifier access modifier so there are different access modifiers available in java that means access permissions given so that is public private protect and default so if any method or a class is a public that method can be accessed in any class in the package right so all the public methods or the all the public classes can be accessed through the program so the scope is the, to the entire program so here i am using the public for the main function because 
any class reference must be written in main function so from the main function we can we can uh, invoke any object or any method or any variables of different classes so that's why we are using here a public and coming to the static so in just before uh, previous sessions uh, we i have explained uh, regarding the static variable static methods and the static block so once go through that the, so that uh, the you know the importance of a static so uh, normally a class consists of variables and a methods in order to uh, access the methods or a variables compulsory we have to create an object for that particular class and through the object only we have to access the variables and methods so those are called instance variables and instance methods coming to the static variables so a variable can be declared as a static by using the static keyword so such type of variables we can access directly similarly the static methods also can be executed directly without creation of object without creation of any object we can access the methods static methods directly or by using the class name so here main is also one type of method main is also one type of method so in order to access this method and where we are writing this main function we are writing this main function in one class in one class we are writing the main function right so in order to access this method so main is a method so in order to access this method compulsory we have to create an object and through that object we have to access the main function right so if you declared this main method as a static we need not create an object for accessing this main function we can directly access this main function so for that purpose we are creating this static keyword by using uh, we are using this static keyword so direct access without object right next void so for every method there must be a return type so that's the rule we have discussed in the previous sessions right so if you are unable to write this return type it will be treated as a constructor so here main function is also a method so it should also have a return type so that need not be a void it can be int so depends upon the logic depends upon your program you can change this void into int right so this is the return type and this is the main name of the main function name of function and what is the importance of this string args so java programming supports the command line arguments so in the command line arguments also we can give the inputs so that already we have seen in the previous session right so in order to take the inputs from the command prompt we are using this syntax string args so this is for command line arguments right so our compiler will search the syntax for this one main string args so this is the only syntax given by the compiler and this we have to write it okay so if you are failed to write this string args it will return i mean uh, it, it doesn't return any error while compilation but it doesn't execute okay so this is the syntax which is to be compared and this we have to write the public static wide main so this is the actual importance of this statement so for accessing the main function for all the classes we have to include this public and without any object we have to access the main method so we are writing static and every function should have a return type that's why we are using 
this return type right so hope you understood this simple thing static block method and a variable so in the previous sessions we have seen the different types of variables in that <coughs> we have seen the local variables the instance variables and the static variables so as we know the definition of an object an object is an real world entity and a class is a collection of objects that is a, a logical entity it's not a physical entity it's a logical entity so every class will be having the variables and methods so every class consists of the variables and methods so in order to access these variables or methods we have to create an instance so directly we cannot access these two we have to create an instance that we call it as object so through this object we have to access these variables and this methods so that we have seen so coming to this uh, instance variables that means the variables which are declared inside the class and outside the method it's called an instance variables so those can be accessed by through the object and if the variable is declared as static if variable is declared as static so these static variables can be accessed in two ways one is we can directly access and next the second one is we can access with the help of class name with the help of class name right so we can access directly and we can access with the help of class name so this happens if we write all the methods and variables and main class in a single class if our program consists of a single class we can directly access if our program consists of multiple classes so that if you want to access the static variables which are declared in another class so in which class i mean the main function should be declared in one class and if we are going to access the static variables which are declared in another class then we have to access them by using the class name right so two ways we can access these static variables similarly the static methods also so static method also can be directly accessed if everything is in single class and we can access with the help of class name if the static methods are available in another class next coming to this so variables and methods both the same Coming to the static block, static block. So just static block can be written with a static keyword and curly braces. So this is the static block. So whatever the content we are writing inside the static block can be executed by default. So without any call. without any explicit call so we did not give an explicit call to the static block if there any reference towards this class where the static block is written automatically the static block will be executed so first the static block will be executed and then it will forward with the next steps so hope you understood so this static block is executed by default without any explicit call and if there is any reference to the particular class right so let us write an example so that you will be clear 
your doubts will be clear see so i am writing some class static demo here i am declaring some static int a is equal to 10 it's a static variable next static void display system dot out dot println you can write it as static method and if you write here static only static block system dot out dot println static block and within the same class we are writing the main function so public static void main arguments open the class name so in order to access these methods or variables or a static we have we have to access directly or with the help of class name so here we are writing the main function with the same class so everything is in the same class so we can directly access them so system dot out dot print ln directly we can access the variable a it will print 10 next directly we can access the display method so display execute close close the class so here we are just printing the a even though this is a variable which is declared as a static so it can be directly accessible so in the absence of static now a is a instance variable we need so this gives an error because the instance variables cannot be accessed directly so for, for accessing the instance variable we have to create an object so if you want to print a now we have to create an object here so with the class name so static demo sorry some object is equal to new static demo constructor so by means of this object we have to access the instance variable so obj dot a and here also in the absence of static this is a normal method normal method so in order to access this normal method this should be accessed by using the object so obj dot display so this will give the cut output so 10 it will be printed and here static method will be printed so if i have written here static variable declaration in a static variable and here also the method is a static void display automatically no need of creating an object so no need of creating an object and no need of using the object for accessing the variables or methods directly we can access because everything is written in same class if this public static void main is written in another class then we have to access by using the class name right so here what about this static block so here we are accessing the variable static variable which is available in the static demo class so there is a reference automatically the static block will be executed so no explicit call will be there for executing the static block by default the static block will be executed the only thing is needed is there must be a, a single reference to that particular class so either if you are creating an object automatically the static block will be executed so creation of an object is also a reference to that particular class right so the static block will be executed there also so here we are printing the a a is a static variable which is belongs to this class so automatically there is a reference to this class 
the static block will be executed. So the output for this one is static block, A will be printed, 10 and display static method. And if you are writing everything in one more class, so class, some main class, see. So here, if you write this thing in another class, so this is one class and I am writing See, this is one class. Here I am writing this main function in another class, main class. So in this case, the static variable is in one class. Main function has been written in one class. So the static variables should be declared, accessed by using the class name. So if you want to print A, we have to use this name. Static demo dot A. So class name dot A. Here also the display should be written as static demo dot display. So hope you understood. So if everything is written in the same class, directly we can access the variables and methods. If we are writing the main function in one class and the static variables and static methods in another class, then the, those variables and methods should be accessed only through the class name. So we need not create an object directly by using the class name, we can access the variables and methods of static and a static block no explicit call is required so only with the reference the static block will be executed so hope you understood everything so if you are having any doubts regarding this one just we will execute a simple program so that all your doubts will be clarified now let us see the implementation part hi friends now let us see the implementation part of static variables, static block and static method. See, I am writing. So these static variables, static methods and static block can be implemented in two ways. So writing all these things, including the main function in the same class and uh, writing the static variables, static methods and static blocks in one class and writing the main function in the another class. So first, let us see if the first one, static demo, class static demo, just create an, a variable int a is equal to 10 and create a method static void display, just I will print a normal text. And let us write the main function also. Here let us uh, access the va variable and method. So here we are writing the static variable, static method and the main function, all these three in the same class, we can directly access the variable and we can directly access the method. So in order to print the value directly, we can implement this output function accessing the method also directly we can access because everything we are writing in the same function same class static demo dot java now implement this one static demo dot java so run this one so here two values have been printed the value of static variable and the text which we, we have written in the static method. Right. So if this was written in a one more class, let us write a static demo here and uh, let us see demo, right? Oh, sorry. So here we are writing the static variable and static method in demo class 
and we are writing the main function in static demo class that means two classes we are using in such case we we should not access the variables directly but we have to access the variable by using the class name where the static variables have been declared so here static variable is declared in demo class we have to access that variable by using the demo class name so demo dot a similarly method should also be declared i mean accessed by using the class name demo dot display now we can get the output right so if you are trying to access directly we will get an error Let's see we are getting an error because we are writing in two different classes the pub, the main function has been written in one class and the static variables and methods are have been uh, defined in another class so we have to access them by using the class name see now this is all about our static method and static variable now let us see the static block static block there will be no name only static keyword followed by the block of statement here also let us try to print only the text let us print static block right so here we are writing all the three static variable static method and a static block in the demo class and main function in another class so if there is any reference from the main function to the to the class where these three has been declared automatically first the static block will be get executed that means the compiler or the control search for the static block in our class if any static block has been written here first that static block will be executed and then followed by the statements so this happens only when there is a reference from the main function to that particular class where the static block has been generated see here in the main function i am not accessing the variable or a display just i am writing i am try to, trying to print so one more text main class main method okay so here by executing this one we are not a, we are not printing these variables or we are not accessing the methods we are just printing the text that means there is no access of this particular class with the main class main main method right so we are not accessing this demo class in the main method so the static block will not be executed see so main method it is printing only main method and if you are trying to access the variable right if you are trying to access the variable that means there is a connection between the class where we are writing the static block with the main function so automatically the static block will be displayed first and followed by the remaining statements see so while executing this one first main method is printed because in the main function the first line is printing of main method and in the second line we are printing the variable static variable value but here it displays the static block which is printed in static block right so that means if there is a connection or if there is a reference from main function to that particular class without any explicit call this static block will be get executed right so unless you 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 have the reference with the class the static block will not be executed so here we are accessing the variable which is written in that class where the static block has been declared that block will be directly executed first see hope you understood this one demo dot display and if you write everything in the same class if you are writing the same class 
obviously implementing the main function is also in the same class so static block will be first executed because there is a connection there is a reference see static block is printed first so main function even the main function is having the first line to print main method here we are getting the static block because there is a reference with the class where static block has been executed so without any explicit call first static block is executed so static block and then main method and then demo dot a so 10 is printed right again static block right sorry here we can directly access this one we need not use the class name we can directly access this one right so static block the first static block and then main method next a a a value is 10 and a display so in the display we are writing static method so static method is displayed right so hope you understood this one so static block will be executing first if there is any reference from the main function to the particular class where the static block has been declared right so this is the static variable which can be accessed only by means of class name or direct access this is static method this is also same similar to the variable it should be accessed directly or by using the class name next static block without any explicit call if there is any reference from the main function the static block will be executed so here in java string is a class it's not a data type okay it's a class and as usual it will be having different methods and in order to access these methods first we have to create an instance and through the instance we have to access the methods so how to create an object so it is a special class in java so that the syntax for the object creation and initialization is string so as, as we know that naming conventions according to the naming conventions class name should begin with the capital letter so yes must be the capital letter string the object so we can give any name for the object is equal to new string and directly we can give the text to the particular string so we can assign the value here so str consists of this string so if you print this system dot out dot print ln str this will print directly the text so this is the one way to initialize the string and the second one is directly string str is equal to hello so this is the second way to initialize the string so we can initialize in both the ways okay now this string class is available in java dot lang package right so java long dot star it will access i mean it will import all the classes of lang package language okay so this is the as we discussed in the previous sessions this package is the uh, default package we need not explicitly write in the program okay so this is the default package which is imported implicitly so that we can directly use this string class without writing this statement now
see here there are some disadvantages of strings the first one is here the string class objects are immutable immutable here the immutable means cannot modify cannot modify right so we once the string is initialized we cannot modify that string unless creating a new string okay so that means after creating one one object for this string str is equal to new string hello so that means here one reference will be allocated for this object if you are trying to modify this one that modification cannot be done on the same location cannot modify on same location that's very important same location and if you if you are able to modify the same string the one more reference will be created in the heap memory so once the object is created that memory i mean the, that object reference will be in heap memory so how many times the user is able to modify the string that number of times the references will be added to the heap memory that means memory is wasted or it requires more memory so we can say this one we, it requires more memory because every time the user modifies the string it will create one reference in the heap memory so in order to uh, avoid this one we will move on to the next another class that is called string buffer class string buffer class so this is also a class which is available in java.lang package and here also there will be some methods right so we can access those methods by using the object the initialization is same but the methods will be somewhat different for both the string and string buffer class hope you understood the uh, the string buffer objects are mutable so we can change according to our requirement right so the modifications can be done on the same location here the string class objects are not modified on the same location that's the only major disadvantage of string class see let us uh, see in the today's session about this string methods and in the next session we will go with the string buffer methods okay now let us see the string methods methods in string class methods in the string class so let us see the methods different methods the first one length of the string so it will return an integer which is which which returns the length of the current string okay so let us create one string so that i will write the syntax string let it be str is equal to new string of hello right so the syntax for this one is str dot length function it will return the length of the string second one index of index of so the name itself indicates it will return the index of the particular string 
which we are giving to this function. So str dot index of str dot index of the string. It will return the index index value of given string. First character in Given string. Okay, so this is the first one thing. So we can directly write it index of str. So sorry. Next char at char at so str dot character at. So just recall the naming conventions if it is a method the first letter of every word should be a capital and the first word letter should be small letter so char char at that means c is small a is capital index of i small o capital so here we have to pass index value as a parameters and it will return the character returns the character at given index at given index next replace so str dot replace old string comma new string so it takes two parameters as input and one is the old string, another one is the new string. That means which string to be replaced and by which string it should be replaced. Okay. So it replaces the old string with new string. It replaces the old string with new string. To lowercase str dot to lower case okay so here also t small letter l capital letter c capital letter so there are no arguments we are passing so everything will be converted to lowercase characters similarly the opposite one to uppercase so str dot to here also u capital c capital so here everything will be converted to uppercase characters okay the next one compare to the syntax is the object dot compare capital T O and the string this is simply used for comparisons okay it compares two strings two strings and returns zero if it is equal and returns a positive returns a positive if first mismatch of first string is greater than first mismatch of second string okay that means here everything will be in unicode 
everything will be all the characters will be converted to unicode and it returns it will compare each and every character and it returns zero if it is equal and if it, it returns a positive if the unicode of first mismatch of first string is greater than the first mismatch of the second string that means unicode of first mismatch unicode of first mismatch of second string right similarly it returns a negative if the first mismatch of first string is less than so this is greater than this is less than okay so it's not a less than or equal it's just less than the first mismatch of second string okay first mismatch means nothing but a unicode of first mismatch right so for example hello is compared with hello here the it, first the letters will be converted into unicodes and then the conversion will be accepted i mean so the first mismatch the unicode of h is here obviously we know that it, both are not equal because here we are having capital H here we are having small h minus so that means it returns the difference of mismatch characters okay so which we have studied in C language okay. hope you understood see in the C language also we had a function string handling function called a compare function so it will also return either zero or a positive or a negative integer there also every character will be compared and the ascii values of first mismatch difference will be returned that means either positive value or a negative value minus unicode of h so if this is greater than this one we will get the positive value if it is less than we will get the negative value okay so the unicode for 0 to 9 are 48 to 57 48 to 57 capital A to capital Z are from 65 to 90 small a to small Z are from 97 to 122 right so hope you understood this one right these are the unicode values for the numericals as well as the characters so it will return the difference of first mismatch and the next one is trim so str dot trim so this will simply trims that means it will remove all the white spaces which appear before and after the string that is called a trimming right for example this string consists of space H E L L O space this one. So after applying this trimming, we will get str is equal to hello. So all the white spaces will be removed just before the string and after the string. Right? Hope you understood. The starting and ending of the string it will be removed. Next, a concat. So it it will concatenate the string. Okay. So here the special case str dot concat of the string it will concatenate the string it will not be saved in the same location if you assign this to another string then the concatenation will be applied that means str2 is equal to str of dot concat of some welcome right str consists of hello str dot concat welcome so 
in the str2 we will get hello welcome so unless you use this assignment operator that means modification is done on another object on the same object on the same reference it will not be modified see simply if you use str dot concat of welcome in one line and if you are able to print this in another line str you won't get the modification just it will print hello because on the same location the modification will not be done if you assign this to one more string either the same string or any other string then the modifications will be done right so hope you understood all these methods so there are different uh, methods in string so i have covered only few strings so hope you understood this one so main drawback of this string class is the objects created for this string class are immutable so no more no more changes will be done on the same location so that's very important on the same location so if you assign the modification to the another object then it will be accepted right so let us stop here and uh, let us move on to the implementation part of all these um, methods of a string class right hello friends so just now we have seen uh, various methods in a string class now let us see the implementation part so let us create one class name string demo write down the main function now let us uh, create one string class str is equal to string str is equal to some new string of let us take hello let us print this one str okay so just we are uh, reading the string and we are printing that's it so i am saving it as string demo dot java so i am executing here java c string demo dot java right so java string demo we are executing this one so the hello will be printed here right it is working now see let us see something so str dot concat of welcome so that means just a concatenation of concatenation method okay so system dot out dot print ln str so let us execute this one compile this one let's execute this one again we got the same thing hello still we are using this concatenation we are applying the concatenation but the the modification cannot be done on the same location see if just i will modify the statement str is equal to that means again the result is assigning to the object str here i am concatenating and the result is again assigning to the str now i am printing here str now we can see the modification can, will be applied see hello welcome the modification has been done that means a new reference is created okay the same location we cannot modify in the same location but a new reference is created for str now there are two locations for this str so how many times the user wants to modify the data that many times that many number of locations will be created in the heap memory so the memory wastage i mean the requirement of memory will be more in order to when the user wants to keep on modifying the string okay so that is the main drawback of this string see length let us see the length system dot out dot print ln as i have said that length returns an integer that means the length of the given string okay so str is the object which consists of hello 
and we are finding the length see 5 the length is 5 okay hope you understood this one so hello 1 2 3 4 5 so it returns the integer 5 here also the index starts from 0 now let us see this one system dot out dot print ln index of sorry str dot index of I have to give the string here okay whatever the string or uh, let us take h it will return the index of h sorry index of right so just we have to follow the naming conventions right see hello 5 here the 5 is nothing but a length and the index is of h is 0 index of h is at 0 so hope you understood here right next let us see one more method print ln character at str dot char at we have to pass the index value here right let us pass the 4 as index value here so it will return the character at the index 4 just let us clear the screen okay so compiling executing see character at is o is equal to okay right character at method so here we are passing the index value 4 it returns o because here there are five characters the index starts from 0 so 0 1 2 3 and finally 4 so the character at index 4 is o so hope you understood okay next system dot print ln to upper case of str so all the small letters will be converted into cap capital letters sorry we have to use this index as object name dot str dot to uppercase yes see string demo so hello hello is printed here okay so here we are converting to uppercase see let us print now the str so what is the str right now what is the content available in the str see if you observe here even though we are applying the uppercase we are not assigning to any other string so it just it is a static that means it will not be changed in the main location so after conversion again if you are trying to print the same the content of str we are getting the same thing which we have initialized at the beginning hope you understood this one right so that is a disadvantage okay lower case now everything will be converted into lower case so here initially h is in capital letter so here the h will be in the small letter 
नेक्स्ट कंपेयर टू ओके एस टी आर डॉट कंपेयर टू तो हियर ऑल्सो वी हैव टू गिव द स्ट्रिंग इट विल बी कंपेयर सो आई एम गिविंग द सेम स्ट्रिंग सो इट मस्ट रिटर्न जीरो बिकॉज एवरी कैरेक्टर इज इक्वल सो स्ट्रिंग कंपेरिजन इज जीरो सो होप यू अंडरस्टूड दिस वन ओके so hello and hello both are equal now let us change this one h e l l o okay so we got a minus 32 minus 32 because the string 1 consists of capital h and the string 2 consists of small h so the unicode of capital h minus the unicode of small h it gives a negative value because the unicode of capital h is less than the unicode of small h as we know that capital a to z consists of a unicode value 65 to 90 and the cap small a to z consists of a unicode values from 97 to 122 so the unicode values for the smaller small i mean lower case characters is great is more when compared to the unicode of upper case characters so that's why we got a negative value okay so let us take this one space and now we will apply the trim system dot out dot print ln str dot trim so we got a hello here see here it was deleted the spaces are deleted so see in the first line we are printing the str here there are two spaces followed by the hello so the length second one the length the length consists of hello five characters and both the two are seven total seven characters and next index of capital h index of capital h is so first space is zero second space is one and capital h is two so two next char at four index four the character at the index four the first space zero second space one third space h and the fourth sorry zero one two capital h three e Four L, so character at four is L, and next upper case, so small I mean uh, spaces followed by capital hello, and lower case spaces followed by small hello, and a comparison. So uh, the Unicode of see first string consists of a space, right? So the first character is a space. The Unicode value of a space minus the Unicode value of small h, so it gives the negative value. and here we are trimming so the trim function is used to trim the given string that means it will, it will remove the white spaces just before the string and after the string and it will it will print without any white spaces so it removes all the two white spaces before the string and it will displays directly the string hello right so these are the only few methods there are a number of methods available in string class these are the somewhat a few uh, methods in string class so the main disadvantage of this string class is we can't modify the uh, string in the same location if you want to modify the string we have to assign it to the another location so one more disadvantage is for this more memory is required again going back to the naming conventions so every class name the first letter of every word in the class name must be capital letters so here the string buffer is also a class so s is capital and b is capital now how to initialize or create an object similar to the string string buffer create an object name 
so we can create str is equal to new followed by the constructor string buffer and here we can give the text here we are giving the text so if you are able to print print this object str it will print this string right so there is uh, here the direct initialization that is by using the assignment operator is not acceptable right so by this we can create a message right we can uh, initialize some string to the string buffer object now this string buffer class also having the different methods so with the help of these objects we will access the methods now let us see the methods of this string buffer one by one methods the first one is append followed by string right so let us use here let us create the object string buffer str is equal to new string buffer let us create a welcome right so str consists of welcome now for this append str dot the syntax append followed by the string welcome java so if you print this we will get the output as welcome java right so when us coming to the string string class there is a function called concat and the same thing will not be possible in a string class unless you assign that output to the one more object right there's a difference main difference second one so first one is append second insert method so this insert method is used to insert the string at particular index position so two parameters are there here index comma string so what whatever the string we have to insert and at which place we have to insert so str dot this not happen this is insert insert let it be some two comma or right two comma high right so in this we know that so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 from the second position this will be inserted so the output will be w e h i l c o m e so this text is placed from the index position given index position that is used for inserting the text at the given position next delete and this method is used to delete the string in from the specified index so here also there are two parameters first one start index and the next one end index so we have to mention the index range which we have which we want to delete so for this the, the syntax is str dot delete so mention here the starting index that is 2 2 4 so obviously other than 4 that means 2 2 
4 minus 1 will be printed. So that means starting index to end index minus 1. So that content will be deleted. So here h and i will be deleted because h the position of h is 2, i is 3. So 2 to 3. The index value is 2 to 3. The text which is appeared in this in two indexes will be deleted. So again our output will be welcome. Right? So this is all about the delete. Takes two parameters. One is the starting index, another one is the end index. Next reverse reverse function so there are no parameters for this reverse function directly we can implement by using the object str dot reverse so this will give the output in a reverse format right right the welcome this is the reverse format next replace function so which we have also seen in the string class replace their replace is the old string and the new string only two parameters here the replace class consists of three parameters the first two parameters specifies the index range and the next parameter is the string to be replaced so replace start index and index and the string right so here we have to specify the range of the index which we want to replace see str dot replace so the first two parameters are of integer data type. so let us take 0 comma 2 that means 0 and 1 the positions of 0 and 1 will be replaced with Hi. So if, if the text is welcome, the zeroth position and first position will be replaced. That means W E is replaced with H and I. So you can give only one letter so that the two letters will be removed and it will be placed with only H. So whatever it may be, the, the, the difference of these index values must not be equal, may not be equal to the length of the string. So here we can write how. So here that only two letters are there, here the three letters will be replaced on two letters. So the output will be H W O, right? So L C O M B. Okay, hope you understood this one. So first two indexes specifies the range which we want to replace and the string, whatever the string we want to insert on behalf of this index range. This is all about the replace function. Next, as usual, we know that length. So which returns the length of the given string. So here also there is no parameter and the result will be in integer format. So str dot length. So this will return the, an integer that is the length of the given string. Next substring of index here only one parameter is taken as input that is index so substring substring means so whatever the string we are having whatever the index we are specifying from that index the remaining string will be printed so for example here if you use str dot substring see again naming convention while giving the name for the method the first letter of the first word must be small and the first letter of the consecute words should be capital letters so sub s capital string s i mean sub s small and the string s capital the second word first letter will be capital letter and specify the index value let it be three let it be three so if if the text is welcome zero one two three so this will be printed so first from the zeroth index up to this given index the text will be removed and the remaining text will be I mean the remaining string will be displayed that's we call it as a substring right next index of so we know that index of the string which we have seen in the string class the same rules here 
So it will return an integer that means an index of particular given string. So where the given string is starting the starting value. So str dot index of some let us write this come. So the index of this string starts from 3. So this will return 3 as an output. Right? Next. Care 8. So an index. So this is also the same method which we have seen in the string class. It, it takes a parameter index, only one parameter, and it will return the character which is available at this particular index. Right? So str dot char at 4. So whatever the character placed at the fourth index, wo, wo will be printed here. Wo will be printed here. Right? Next. Hope you understood all these methods. Right? Next, sub subsequence. Let us see one more thing that is subsequence. So, 10th method, subsequence. So, here also two words are there. So, first S is small and sequence S is capital. So, here we are taking two parameters as inputs that is start index and end index. So, it will return the characters or a substring within the given range of this index. So here we have seen the seventh method that is substring. Here we are giving only one parameter. So from that index, particular given index, whatever the text is there that everything will be printed. But here we are giving the starting index and ending index of the substring, which we want to display. See, str dot subsequence two comma five. So again, it will take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? 2, 2 means L, C, O, right? This will be printed, right? L, C, O, that means index from 2 to 5 minus 1, that means 4, 2 to 4, okay? So including the starting index and excluding the end index, the substring will be displayed, both in this case the subsequence as well as the replace. In both the cases, it includes the starting index and it excludes the end index in the substring. Right? So, I hope you understood all these methods. So, there, these are the only few methods. There are a number of methods available in string buffer class. But these are the few methods which I have, I want to know. And, uh, Hope you understood all these methods and now let us move on to the implementation part. Let us see the execution of all these methods. Hello friends. Let us see the implementation part of all the methods which we have seen in the string buffer. Right. So let us create a class called string buffer string buffer demo and let us create the public function main function now let us create a string buffer object and initialize that one so str is equal to new string buffer and here we will write welcome right so now let us print this one system dot out dot print ln let us print this one str so it have to display the welcome so let us save it string buffer demo dot job See Java C. Let us compile compile it. String buffer demo dot Java. So 
so compiled successfully now let us run it string buffer demo so a welcome text is printed so that means we have created one string object and we are initializing some string to that particular string object now let us see one by one so str dot append to java So we are appending some text to the string. So let us print here system dot out dot print ln and everything let us print in the same sentence. Now let us execute this one. Let us see. First we have printing str. In the first statement we are printing the str. In the second statement we are printing we are appending some text to the given existing text and we are printing the resultant. So welcome is the existing text. We are appending to Java to the particular given text. So welcome to Java. Right. Now if you print this one, it will be saved in the location which we are not implementing in string class. If you are printing str now, the updated str will be there welcome to java that means in the same location that will be updated next coming to the next method insert print ln so insert is used to insert some text at the given index so str dot insert which takes the two parameters as index first one is in index so let us take the index uh, some 4 and followed by the text how now let us print So welcome to welcome welcome to Java and now at the position four that means let us count this is, W is in zero W is in zero one two three four right from the fourth index how will be inserted so zero one two three and from fourth index how is inserted right so in the statement welcome from the fourth index how is printed because we are printing how inserting the string how right now if you print the str the updated str will be printed because everything will be done in the same location itself see so if you print it again the same updated string is printed so this is not possible in string class okay right coming to the next method delete now let us delete the same thing system dot out dot print ln str dot delete the starting index and the ending index so from 4 to 7 so let us delete the values from 4 to 7 see executing this one again that whatever the text we are printing so this this means 0 1 2 3 4 so from 4 and the ending is 7 so 4 5 6 that means i have told that it includes the starting index and excludes the end index so 7 will not be deleted till 6 will be deleted so 4 5 and 6 so how will be deleted and the resultant string is again welcome to java so hope you understood this one next reverse system dot out dot print ln str dot reverse see let us execute this one right see 
the whatever the string we are having in the str that will be in a printed in reverse order so w e l c o m e t o j a v a everything is in reverse order so there is no parameter for this reverse function next as usual length so in order to find out the length directly we can use the length method print ln str dot length so it will return an integer that means the length of the given string right so 15 is the length so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 0 to 14 that is length is 15 characters so it includes the characters also so white spaces also next after the length let us see the index of system dot out dot print ln index of give the string here let us take welcome see let us execute this one sorry here str of object we we, we didn't mention here the str str dot executing so minus one welcome is minus one because w so w is at the last position so it will return minus one or simply we can execute this one see i, I will uh, don't get confused here so once again let us reverse it welcome to java and the index of let us take a single character zero right so index of w is zero so whatever the information we are writing so here if you write a welcome automatically it will again give the result as zero if you write the thing which doesn't matches to the given string it will return minus one so here the string is not presented in the given text right here welcome is in capital letters here welcome in small letters so it doesn't matches with the given string so it returns minus one right so hope you understood this one right next character at str dot char at you have to pass an argument index so char at some seven so whatever the character available in seven it will be printed so i think it's a space it's space because so from the starting zero one two three four five six and seven is space let us print six so that uh, e will be printed here yes e will be printed here okay so hope you understood this one next we will move on to the substring print ln str dot substring and we have to give the index value so let us give the index value 8 so that from the to java it will be printed cannot find symbol the string of type string perform let us take this one substring s capital yes so sorry so here just a correction in the substring both are the a single word both forms a single word so everything in a small letters 
So in the previous, uh, I have said that yes will be the capital letters in the string. So just uh, correct it. So if you execute this one, two Java will be printed here. Two Java will be printed here, right? From the position eight, right? So this is a six, seven is a space, and eight is T. So from eighth position, we are printing the text. Next, subs subsequence with the two parameters. Print ln str dot subsequence. So we have to give the parameters so 8, comma 10 or 11, comma 15. See what is the output printed here? Java will be printed. Java will be printed because in the str 11 and 15 so in the str what is the 11 and 15 so 11 is this position and the 15 excludes the 15 so 14 will be printed till 14 it will be printed so 14th one is a so j a v a will be printed here hope you understood this one substring right so here the subsequence yes is a capital letter right so if you print this at this position the text is welcome to Java right so hope you understood this one so from the string reverse index of character at substring subsequence everything will not be stored in the str it will be the substring and subsequence it divides the string with the substring it will not modify on the actual string so that's why if you print this str we will get the same output look on overloading concept right so in java there are three types of overloadings. The first one is constructor overloading, next method overloading, next operator overloading first let us see what is meant by overloading so going to the C language so we had different functions we can write a different user defined functions outside the main function and if you are trying to write two functions with the same name but different parameters for example so add this is the one function and this is the another function int a comma int b so the logic is same but the parameters are different so the name is also same here the name of the function is add here also the name of function is add here there are no parameters zero parameters here we are having two parameters and the logic is same so if you are trying to write such type of functions with the same name and different parameters in C language it will not accept this is not supported in our C language right so no two functions must share the same name so every function must be having unique name in C language Whereas coming to this Java programming, in Java programming, this type of concept is supported. This type of concept that means implementing the same thing in different ways. Right? So that we call it as overloading. So here the name will be same, but 
parameters will be different. <coughs> Same name, different parameters. This is called a overloading. Right? So this is of three types of overloading. So that means Java supports these three types of overloadings. One is the constructor overloading, method overloading, and operator overloading. So we know that a constructor overloading already we have seen. That means uh, we have seen different types of constructors. So two types of constructors. One is a default constructor without any arguments and the parameterized constructor. So writing the constructor with some arguments. Right? So based upon the object creation, the particular constructor will be invoked. That means that particular constructor will be executed. So that is called our constructor overloading. constructor without arguments and this is parameterized constructor that means there will be parameters we will pass some parameters and method overloading also same so having the same name with the different parameters operator overloading in java we had one operator for the example of overloading, uh, operator overloading that is plus a symbol plus so this is having this can be implemented in two ways one is addition operator another one is concatenation operator so the same symbol is used for two purposes. One is addition, other one is concatenation. So implementing in different ways, the same thing implementing in different ways that we call it as operator overloading. So all these terms, we call it as polymorphism. So executing the same thing in different ways. So this polymorphism in our Java is achieved by implementing this overloading concept. So that can be the constructor overloading or a method overloading or any operator overloading. Right. So this polymorphism is achieved by implementing this overloading concept. And this, this is called, so everything will be executed during the compile time itself. So this is called compile time polymorphism. Compile time polymorphism. So there are again two types of polymorphism. So compile time polymorphism and the runtime polymorphism. And this is done during the, the compile time itself. So that's why we call it as a compile time polymorphism. So finally, the compile time polymorphism is achieved by implementing this overloading concept. Now, let us see one by one constructor method and operator overloading. So we give a simple examples for easy understanding. So we know that uh, our program can have in any number of classes just where we will write one class so some class a right in the class we can have the variables and methods and first of all let us write the uh, constructors so this is a constructor we know that a constructor is a similar to the method it is also having the same name as a class name but it doesn't have any return type so if you write this return type, this will be a method. If, if you are not writing the, any return type, this will be treating as a constructor. So A constructor. 
constructor one right so this is one and i am writing one more constructor with the parameters in a So I am writing the constructor class. Now I have to write the main function. Okay. So for that I am writing one more class. So let us write the, the class here. Class C overload. Class C overload. Public static void main arguments I have to create an object right so creation of object means class name the object obj1 is equal to new keyword and the constructor so here as we are giving the no parameters so this will be executed this block will be executed a object 2 is equal to new a of some 10 so here we are passing one parameter as in the constructor so it will search for the constructor with one parameter so this block will be executed after creation of this object 2 right hope you understood so implementing the same constructor in different ways so with parameter and without parameter so that will search for this particular constructor right so hope you understood this one this is called a constructor overloading constructor overloading so we will see by implementing in the system also right now let us see the method overloading Method overloading also similar. Some class A. Let us write the method. Just avoid the constructor, write the method. So for writing the method, first we have to write the return pen. So void some display. System dot out dot print ln. display next I am writing one more method with the same name name same method name display int a system dot out dot print ln a is equal to plus a so this is the method both are the same the, uh, previously we have written the constructor and this is a method right now i have to create an object and i have to access this display so a obj is equal to new a so it will search for this constructor there is no constructor so nothing will be happened right. so object is created now through this object we have to access this one obj dot display so this will search for this method with no argument so it will search for the method with no argument so this block will be created executed next obj dot display some 30 that means we are passing one parameter here so it will search for the method this one 
right so it's the same method with the parameters so it will search for this and this block will be get executed that's it this is about the method so both are same right so previously we are not writing any return type so it is it is treated as a constructor and here we are writing some uh, return type and this is called a method so both are equal right so we can write a one more method with the two parameters so we can write any number of methods but there must be a difference in parameters number of parameters and that should be accessed in our main function hope you understood this method overloading now let us see the constructor overloading uh, sorry operator overloading the third one so we know that we have seen just now addition operator that is a plus is the operator overloading so plus can be used for both purposes that is addition as well as concatenation see a simple thing class a some int a is equal to 5 b is equal to 6 okay these are the instance variables let us write here here itself main function Right here, uh, I have to access this one, so I have to write the constructor a obj is equal to new a. Now I, have, I, have, I will access this one, so system dot o dot print ln right? a plus b is equal to plus obj dot a plus obj dot b right. see so just i want to add two numbers so two numbers i have taken as uh, instance variables so I, I am accessing these variables by using the object created by for this class so don't get confused let it let us write b here that is right here b okay or wait, wait. here now we are taking a and b as a variables right c c object and new c c is a class name right so here i'm trying to add two numbers and printing the result so this will be as it is it will be printed a plus b is equal to and here i am adding two numbers object dot a plus object dot b but here it will treat it as a concatenation so the output will be not the 11 it will print 56 if you write this one in such case it will consider it as a concatenation and it will, it will print 56 so that in order to perform the addition we have to enclose this in parentheses so if you enclose these two in the parentheses automatically the result will be right hope you understood this one plus is used for both uh, addition and the con uh, concatenation so if, if you have failed to write the parentheses here it will treat it as a concatenation so if you enclose this statement within the parentheses it will treat it as an addition so this is called operator overloading now let us see all these things the constructor overloading operator overloading and the method overloading by implementing the programs in the system right hi friends so now let us see the overloading concepts by implementing a simple program so we have seen the three types of overloading so first one is constructor overloading then uh, method overloading and operator overloading first let us see the constructor overloading let us write a class with a constructor so i am writing the constructor here i am not writing any uh, return type so it will be treated as a constructor so just i will display something
right constructor without arguments and i will write one more uh, constructor with one argument constructor with arguments right so i will close i will write one more uh, this one c overloading constructor overload c overload i am writing the public main function So I'm creating a constructor, uh, an object by using the constructor. So this will uh, execute the constructor without any arguments. And the next one, I will create a one more object, obj1, with one parameter, some 10. So it will execute the constructor with one argument. So whenever uh, this object is created, the control will search for this constructor name in the class. So if it is there, that particular block will be executed. If it is not there, nothing will be executed. And if you create uh, this line executes and here we are passing one parameter to the constructor so that the compiler, uh, the control will search for this constructor with one parameter in the above class. So it if, if it finds automatically, it will uh, execute that particular block. So let us save this and execute this. C overload dot Java. Now let us execute this one. C overload dot Java. Right. Java C overload. See, constructor without arguments, constructor with argument. So first object we are writing, uh, we are calling the constructor without argument. So it was displayed first in the first line. And uh, in the second line, we are creating an object passing with the parameter to the constructor. So this one will be executed. And everything will be done at the compile time itself. So that, that's why we call it as a compile time polymorphism. So this is a constructor overloading concept constructor overloading so let us see <coughs> the method overloading concept so just a simple let us rename this one method overload dot java yes so here we have to write a return type void add and here also void add here we will take a two three uh, i mean two parameters int a comma b and here so we'll take a two parameters here also local variables two local variables a is equal to some 10 we will directly take these values b is equal to 20 and let us uh, sum these two a plus b and let us print the sum so this is the code written in this function sum is equal to right so the same thing we will write in different way taking two parameters as inputs in c is equal to a plus b so don't get confused these are the two variables local variables in this method and those are the local variables in that method so otherwise if you are confusing let's let us change the variable names x y and z right so let us print the same thing system dot out dot print ln 
sum is equal to plus z now let us create one object so we can remove this one so by using that object call the method add so that the first method will be called object dot add we have to pass some parameter some uh, 40 comma 50 so these two will be stored in x and y and it will be performed so let us see this one let us execute this one java c m overload dot java oh sorry yes so c was not declared just we can declare a c right so just clear screen java m overload so i'm executing the class file could not find the main m overload oh, sorry yeah see sum is equal to 30 and sum is equal to 90 so for by uh, by calling the first function this block will be executed because this is the method with no zero arguments right the controller will search for the method with zero arguments and in the second line the controller will uh, the, i mean the control will uh, search for the add method with two arguments in the class so it if it finds it will execute that particular block so this is not allowed in our c programming that means uh, no two methods or user defined functions should not have the same name so here it can have a same name but different parameters with the different parameters it will be accepted it is supported right so this is all about the method of overloading now let us see the operator uh, operator overloading that's a very simple thing so let us see just uh, let us write uh, a function so let us take variables a is equal to some 10 b is equal to some 30 some int c is equal to or directly we can write it system dot out dot print ln let us take oh sorry a plus b is equal to plus a plus b so a plus b means generally we have to get the output so let us write the main function in this in the same thing static void main string arguments let us create so let us uh, take op operator overloading op obj is equal to new op right so let us call this function add let us save this op.java now let us execute this one so this is also just a, uh, a program for addition of two numbers so we are calling the function in the function we are taking two local variables and we are uh, trying to add those two local variables and printing the sum right so let us see the output op dot java right what is the result a plus b is equal to 10 30 because here 10 and 30 here this plus is treated as a concatenation operator so it is treating it as a concatenation operator plus is treated as concatenation so if you enclose this a plus b in the parentheses then it will treat it as a addition operator so our output will be a plus b is equal to 40 so hope you understood the difference so in the absence of parentheses it will be treated as a concatenation operator so 10 and 30 10 and 30 are concatenated so 10 30 it will be printed so if you enclose them in the parentheses 
automatically those two will be get added and the result will be displayed right so this, this is the operator overloading so the same operator but implementations are different so in one logic we are using the plus as a concatenation in another logic we are using plus as an addition operator right so let us stop here hope you understood this operator overloading concept so method overloading constructor overloading and operator overloading so this is called uh, i mean by implementing this we can achieve the polymorphism that is compile time polymorphism so where we will use this keyword this keyword is used to represent the instance variables of current object so we know that so every class will have the variables and the methods and the variables are of two types the local and instance and the static three three types of variables we have seen in the previous sessions so coming to this uh, instance variables these are the variables declared inside the class but outside the method so these are the instance variables in order to access these instance variables that can be done only through the object so that we are uh, going on uh, discussion in every session right so in order to access that instance variables of a class that must be <coughs> done by using this keyword right so by default the compiler will so if you are printing this let us take an example so that your doubt will be clarified so just a class a I am taking some int a is equal to 10 and I am writing one method so why display just I want to display this 10 inside the method so directly I can access it right so no, no need of uh, creating any object for this one system dot out dot println a so in that another class uh, we can write the main method okay so this will display 10 right so just we are writing the variable name but compiler will treat this as this dot a this represents the variable is of current class or current object the variable depends on I mean variable is represented of the current object or a current class so by default it will be treated as this dot a but explicitly the user need not write this one this dot a in every case right but there are some cases where we have to write particularly the, this keyword where we have to use this keyword so let us see the problematic case so the, let us take this example only if the method is also having the same variable int a is equal to 20 int a is equal to 20 right so here this a is different from this a because this one instance variable this is local variable this is the local variable right and this method can access the instance variables also isn't it so this method can access the instance variables also so in the previously we are just printing a we are not having any local variable directly 10 will be printed and now we are having two variables one is local variable and another one is the instance variables right both are having the scope so which one it will be displayed so it will display just 20 that means the first preference will be for the local variables 
so the same concept for uh, as we have seen in c programming that global variables and local variables so if the global variables and the local variables are sh sharing the same name the first preference will be given to the local variables and if you want to print both the local variables and global variables that is not possible in c language but here we can display the local variables and instance variables by using this keyword now let us write one more statement system dot out dot print ln instead of writing a this dot a so this represents this keyword represents instance variable it's a instance variable so normal a represents local variable so in the absence of this statement directly we can get a 10 because there is no variable with the name a so directly we will get 10 so in the presence of this statement now the compiler will get ambiguity that there are two variables with the same name one is the instance variable one is the local variable so which would which one we have to print so this is a local variable and if you want to print the instant variable we have to use this keyword by using this keyword we can you we can print the instance variable hope you understood this uh, importance of this keyword so it is a representation of the current object so not every time we will write this uh, keyword but sometimes in such cases or some problematic cases we have to use the keyword this to represent the current object variables right so let us see the implementation part in the system so that your doubts will be clarified hello friends uh... Let us see the implementation of this keyword. Just we will write one class. Class this demo. And we will take one instance variable. Some a is equal to 10. And we will write one method void display. So we will just print that, that variable in this system.out.println. Yeah. right so let us write the main function also in this class public static void main the command arguments we have to create a constructor i mean object in order to access the display method this term this demo obj is equal to new this demo here this is a default constructor call this object dot display function right so we have to save this this demo dot java now let us execute this one java c this demo dot compile successfully compiled now let us execute by using java java this demo so 10 is printed here so if you observe here the 10 is printed here now actually implicitly the compiler will treat it as this dot a see again once again we will compile and execute so again 10 is printed so we are not writing this this keyword but the compiler will treat it as a this dot a because that is representing the current object so here let us see the problematic case if it, our local variable is also having the same name with the value some 200 and we are printing the same it will take a, only the local variable so 200 will be printed so the instance variable is not printing we are not printing the instance variable so the value of local variable is printing here hope you understood this one so now the compiler will get a dilemma that uh, both the variables are having the same name and the display function can access both the variables both the instance variables and the local variables so here by default it will take it's a local variable and if you want to print the instance variable we have to use the this keyword see 
print this dot a so if i exe execute here i can get both values instance variables and the local variables see local variable is equal to a instance variable is equal to this dot a now if you execute so we can get all those things i mean the both the variable values So local variable is equal to 200 the instance variable is equal to 10 so we know that local variable is 200 and instance variable 10 so this is the importance of this keyword it always represents the variable of uh, belongs to the current object the variable belongs to the current object So first of all, what is meant by this inheritance? So inheritance means one class acquiring the properties of another class. So this it can be also called as parent child. So that means child will acquire the properties of a parent. Right? Similarly, so here we will have one class and here we will have another class so this class is a parent for this class so this class can obtain the properties and properties of this parent class so here acquiring properties this means acquiring the properties means accessing variables as well as methods so this class can access the variables and methods of this class so this is called a parent class this is called a child class so this can be called as base class okay. so base class means from which we are acquiring the properties and this is called a derived class that means which class it is acquiring the properties of base class so this is again called as super class and this we call it as subclass so all these are the different names for these classes right so in the inheritance there will be two different classes one is a base class another one is the derived class and derived class will access the variables and methods of base class and apart from these variables and methods of base class this class will be having its own variables and methods so the reverse process will not be done right the parent cannot access the child's class i mean child class uh, variables and methods only the child class can access the parent class variables and methods so for this for implementing this inheritance concept, we will use a keyword called extends. So in the first sessions, we have seen a different keywords available in Java. In that, you can observe this extends keyword, which is used to implement this inheritance concept. So here, see. So this is the derived class, derived class, from this derived class, I'm oh sorry, base class, and from this base class, there will be derived class. So that means this derived class will acquire the properties of base class. So this is called a single inheritance. 
सिंगल इनहेरिटेंस ओनली द सिंगल इनहेरिटेंस नाउ इफ सॉरी बेस क्लास एंड देर विल बी डेराव क्लास एंड अगेन फ्रॉम दिस अगेन अनदर क्लास हैज बीन डेराइव डेराइव क्लास सो दट मीन्स फॉर दिस डेराव क्लास दिस दिस क्लास विल बी द पेरेंट एंड फॉर दिस डेराव क्लास दिस क्लास विल बी द पेरेंट so this is the parent this is a child and this is the child and this is the parent hope you understood right so this type of inheritance we call it as multi level inheritance single inheritance multi level inheritance that means base class there will be one parent class from that parent class a child class will acquire the properties and from this child class again it uh, the sub sub class will be derived that is uh, one more child which acquires the properties of this derived class this is called a multi level inheritance and there is a one more inheritance that is so base class from this base class there will be a derived class again derived class so from the single base class there will be two derived classes so two different classes acquiring the properties of same base class so this is called hierarchical inheritance hierarchical inheritance so this one is a multi level inheritance this is a single inheritance so these are the three inheritance supported by java so hope you understood so whatever the inheritance it may be there will be a parent class and a child class so child class will acquire the properties from the parent class right so apart from these three there are two more inheritance concept that is multiple inheritance and hybrid inheritance so these two categories we cannot achieve in java directly right so can't achieve directly in java but these two can be implemented by using interfaces interfaces by using these interfaces we can implement these two inheritance also right so we are having only three that is single inheritance multi level inheritance hierarchical inheritance so three, three these three concepts will be supported by java right so let us see one by one so in this session we will see what about the what is meant by this single inheritance that means there will be one base class and one derived class so the derived class will acquire the properties of the base class so single inheritance now let us write two classes so uh, as i have said that inheritance concept means there will be two different classes one is the base class and another one is the derived class so i will write one class here let us write a parent right 
parent class so i am uh, declaring one variable here int a and also one more function that is method and writing method y display so just we will write system dot out dot print ln parent right this is a parent class now this is a parent parent class now there will be a child class which acquires the properties of this one now class child class child and here also i will declare a one more variable some time let us initialize this one 20 next here also i will write some function void show system dot out dot print ln child close so now child is a derived class parent is a base class so child is derived from the parent class so how to implement this one so for this implementation we will use extend keywords extends so extends is used to achieve the inheritance concept so where we have to write these extends so at the derived class we have to write the extent so here which is the derived class this is the derived class so we have to write extends in this class so child extends so from which it is extends that means parent class so here we have to write the parent right so what are the class name the base class name we have to mention here so child class i mean class child extends parent so here parent is a derived class i mean base class child is the derived class now write out the main function so class inherit public static void main the string some arguments right so for this class and this class in order to access these things we have to create an object and then through the object we have to access so i will just create an object for this child so child some c is equal to new child so this is the syntax for creating an uh, object we have seen so now through this c we can access these things right so system dot out dot print ln c dot b it will print 10 as well as c dot show automatically this method will be executed now as this child class is a derived class from the parent so this child object can also access directly these variables and methods of the parent class so here we can directly write sop that means system dot out dot print ln right so sop c dot a so directly this access can be done so that is the advantage of inheritance so in the absence of inheritance if you want to access this variable and this method we have to create an object for this class and through that object we have to access this one if you are using this inheritance concept without creating an object for the parent from the child object we can access both the variables and methods of a parent also so here directly we can access display method also c dot display right so through the child object we are accessing the methods and variables of a parent so that is the advantage of inheritance so in the inheritance one parent class will be there one child class will be there a child class is derived from the parent class and in order to access the variables and methods of both the parent and child the child object is required it, it, uh, it is sufficient to access both the variables and methods of both the child class and parent class right so hope you understood the single inheritance this is called a single inheritance 
that means only one parent and one child so one base class and one derived class so derived class extends base class right so let us see the implementation part and we will stop here in the next session we will see the two more inheritances that is multi-level and hierarchical inheritances now let us see the implementation part of this single inheritance hello friends so now let us see the implementation part of single inheritance so as we have seen now we have to create a class two classes so let us create the one class so p is the one class let us call it as a parent now in that parent i am declaring one variable which is a and uh, i am also writing one function display function so display and in the display just i am printing one thing just as a parent class right so this is a parent class now let us create a one more class class c which is a child class so here also we are declaring one variable and here we are using one function that is the show function so in that let us see again we have to uh, i am writing system dot out dot print ln child class i am writing the simply child class right so now this child class is inherited so in order to implement this inheritance we have to use extends keyword c extends p so here c is a base class derived class p is a base class now let us write the main function so class inherit public static void main pass on the arguments string args so here let us create an object for child c object is equal to new c now we can access the variables of a child by using object name object dot so b and now similarly object dot show so this will this these lines will directly print inherit dot java inherit dot java so i am just saving it i am executing this one so java c inherit dot java so i am compiling so successful compilation is there so java inherit so automatically 20 and child class has been printed so in order to access the parent class variables and method we have to create a parent class object but here we are using the inheritance concept so we can directly you access the parent class variables and of uh, methods by using the same object of child class so obj dot a and obj dot display so this will directly access the variables and methods of a parent class also see 20 child 10 parent class so child class variable is equal to obj and here also we can write so parent class variable is equal to obj dot a so here we are creating only one object for the child and by using that particular child object we are 
accessing the variables and methods of both the parent and child classes right so in the absence of inheritance we have to create two objects one is for child and another one is for parent in order to access the child variables and methods of child class we have to access through the object of a child and in order to access the variables and methods of a parent class we have to create an object for parent but here implementing the inheritance we are just creating an object for child and through for, uh, through the object we are accessing both the variables and methods of both the parent and child class subclass see let us see the multi level inheritance first multi level inheritance so multi level inheritance so here there will be one parent class so that means a base class so one base class from this there will be a derived class from this again there will be a derived class right so that means this is the child and this is the parent and this is the child and this is the parent so here this derived class is a child for base class as well as parent for another derived class so this is called a multi level inheritance right so similarly so this child class that means derived class let us create a names right so let it be a this is a b and this is a c right a b and c so here b is a child of a b extends a so that means object of b can access variables and methods of both b and a right so that, that we have seen in single inheritance so if b is a derived class from the base class a the object of b can access both the variables and the methods of both the b and a similarly the c extends b so c is a child class of parent b right so now object of c can access both the variables and the methods of c and b classes c and b right so the reverse process c extends b so c can access both the variables and methods of uh, the classes c and b and coming to this one b is again it is a child for another class a so by creating this object so this c is a grandchild grandchild so grandchild can access the properties so object of c can access the variables and the methods of the same class the parent of this class as well as the grandparent of this class hope you understood this one right so it's a grandchild this can acquire the properties that means both the variables and methods of the parent and the grandparent so if you want to access the variables and methods of a we need not create the object of b we can create of object of c and through the object of c we can access the variables and methods of both b and a see let us see an example for this so i will write a small thing class a so i will declare some a is equal to 20 some void method method i am writing the method void display right so here I am writing system dot 
just I will write SOP. Okay, SOP. S system dot out dot print ln a. So this will display the class a. Similarly, class b extends a. So this is the chain class of a. So here I am writing int a int uh, some uh, b is equal to thirty. Similarly, I am writing one method void show. Here also s o p system dot out dot print I am printing the text b, right? So I am again writing one more class, one more class. So that is class c, which extends b, right? Which extends b. So here I am writing int c is equal to some fifty, some void. This this system dot out dot print ln c. I am printing c. Now write down the main function. Three classes. We have written three classes, right? So class multi level. So as it is a multi level inheritance. So here we have to write the main main function public static. void main arguments we have to create an object for the grand chain so c obj is equal to new c so through this object we can access the variables and methods of c b and a because b is a parent of c And a is a parent of b, so that means a is a grandparent of c. So c can access the variables and methods of both the classes. So here directly we can access obj dot this. This is the method written in child function. I mean child class. Similarly, obj dot show, which is written in parent class. Similarly, obj dot display, which is written in the grandparent. So no need of creating the object for each and every class, right? So based upon the inheritance, we can create, we can limit the object creation. So this is the multi-level inheritance. A simple example. Now let us see the one more one more inheritance concept that is hierarchical inheritance. hierarchical inheritance hierarchical inheritance means there will be one base class and from this base class we can have a more number of derived classes derived class and again derived class right so one parent and multiple chains so this meaning is one parent and multiple chain that is called a hierarchical right so let us give a names a b and c now a is a parent and b and c both are chains chain all right so b can access the object of b can access the variables and methods of b and a similarly object of c can access the variables and the methods of c and b but the object of c can not access the variables and methods of b so this cannot be done right because b and c are the siblings that means two children so in order to access the methods of a b have to create an object as well as c also have to create an object so two objects must be created here right so let us see an example
Similarly, write down the three classes. We have to write a three classes. Class A, let us take it's a parent class. So int sum a is equal to 20. Sum write down the function y display system dot out dot print a yeah. similarly class b which extends a because b is a child for class a so if b is equal to some 30 void show again we are writing some method system dot out dot print b right again i am writing one more class class c it also extends a right the same base class two different derived classes so here also let us create a c is equal to some 40 write on the method void some this system dot out dot print ln c close now write on the main function here so class hierarchy right now write on the objects uh, main function here so public static void main some arguments now we can create we have to create two objects in order to access the variables and methods of all these three classes so first let us create an object for c c obj1 is equal to new c F from this object one obj dot this can be accessed similarly obj1 dot display can be accessed right because c is a child of a so object of c can access the variables and methods of class c and class a now again we have to create an object for b b object 2 is equal to new capital b so through the object 2 we can access the variable i mean the method of b class b as well as the method of a object to display right so here but this through this object we can't access the variables and methods of b because here c and b are the siblings that means two different chains but acquiring the properties of the same base class right so hope you understood this hierarchical inheritance so in this session we have seen the two different types of inheritances that is multi-level inheritance and hierarchical inheritance so now let us uh, see the implementation part of these two things hierarchical and multi-level so there are two more inheritances that is hybrid and uh, multiple so those those are not directly supported by java but by using the interfaces concept we can implement the hybrid inheritance as well as the multiple inheritance right so now let us see the implementation for part of these two that is hierarchical inheritance and multi-level inheritance hi friends so now we will see the implementation part of a uh, two more inheritance concept that is uh, multi-level inheritance and hierarchical inheritance so in the first we will see the multi-level inheritance so as i have said that the multi-level inheritance means there will be a one derived class and one uh, i mean one parent class and one parent and child class and one more child class so let us see that so this is a parent class class p so i am just declaring one variable a is equal to 10 and again a method void display so system dot out dot print ln let us take it as a let us display a right so let us create a one more child class class c which extends p right so c is a child class and it is derived from the parent class p 
so here also i will declare some one more variable b is equal 20 and void display system dot out dot print ln let us use b right now let us create a one more child class so class c chain which extends c so here if you observe p is a parent class and c is a child class which inherits the properties of parent class and here c child is a another child class which inherits the properties of c which is again the child class of p right so this is called a multi level so this is the first level second level and the third level so let us create uh, one more thing so c is equal to some 30 void show system dot out dot print ln let us print c here see here we will use only display this so first method is display second method is this and the third method is show now let us create a main method class multiple inherit multiple inheritance so public static void main string arguments see if you want to access the variables of variables and methods of a, a class p we have to create an object for the class p right and if you want to access the variables and methods of class c we have to create an object for c and if you want to access the objects and methods of c child we have to create an object for c child but here c child is the child class of c so we, the object of c child can access both the variables and the methods of both the derived class and a parent class that is means c and c child and c and again here c is again the derived class of p so it can directly access the methods and variables of parent class so here we can create only one child i mean one object for c child just like our grandchildren parent child and grandchild okay so we are creating the grandchild so obj is equal to new c child so here by using this one we can access print ln obj dot c similarly obj dot show so these steps will access the variables and the methods of grandchild c chain okay so multiple inherit dot java i am saving here now let us compile it java c multiple inherit dot java yes successful compilation java multiple inherit so automatically 30 and c has been displayed here now let us the, through the same object we can also access the variables and methods of parent of c child who is the parent of c child c is the parent of c child so we can access the variables and methods of c also so let us see this one system dot out dot print ln obj dot b similarly obj dot this so let us save here again once again let us comp compile it and execute 
so here we can observe 30 c and 20 b so this is the parent class now here here class c is the parent for c child as well as class c is a child of class p so directly through the object we can access the p variable and methods the variables of i mean the variables and methods of class p right simply we can say that for understanding grandson can acquire the properties of grandfather right see so we need not create a, any other object just by using the grandchild object system dot out dot print ln obj dot a so that is a variable of a variable which we are declaring in parent p that means a class p obj dot display this is the method we have written in class p which is the parent of class c so if you execute this one see so first we are printing the child second we are printing the parent of the child and the third we are printing the parent of again b right so hope you understood this one next this is called a multi level multi level inheritance so okay multi level inheritance this is not a multiple this is multi level inheritance right next we'll go with one more inheritance that is hierarchical inheritance so here acquiring the properties of same class so two different base classes i mean one base class and two different derived classes from the single base class a multiple number of derived classes will acquire the properties so let us see the p which is a parent class int a which is 20 and let us write a method display so let us print here system dot out dot print ln we, we will write here parent right so this is the base class and from the base class we are supposed to acquire the properties to the derived classes so let us write the two derived classes class c extends P. So here int b is equal to 20. Sorry, let us take one more 40 and wide show system dot out dot print print ln child one. So the siblings, just like our siblings. Now I will write a one more class, class D. It also extends P. That means a single parent and two children. So int C is equal to some 50 and void this system dot out dot print ln child 2 right so now let us write the main function hierarchical inheritance public static void main pass on the arguments so in that argument, we need to access, I mean, in order to access the parent uh, variables and methods, we have to create an object for child. Here we are having two childs and in order to access the variables and methods of uh, child one, we have to create an object for C and if you want to access the variables and methods of child two, we have to uh, uh, create an object for class D. So only one object is not required for accessing all the variables and methods because here you are using two children. So capital C 
from OBJ1 is equal to nu capital C. So this is the class C, object for class C, which can access the both the variables and methods of both the classes C and P. So here we can write system dot out dot println obj1 dot b similarly obj1 dot show right so this is the child variable and child method now let us uh, access the parent variable and parent method obj1 dot a obj dot obj1 dot display right so this is accessing so hi that dot java right now let us compile it hi that dot java Java hierarchy. See here 40 and child 1 because this is the object created for child 1, right? So 40, child 1, 20 parent. So in order to access the variables and methods of D, we have to again create a method for object for D child. So D object 2 is equal to new D. So here through this object we can access all the variables and methods of parent and chain. So, who is the parent of D? That is nothing but A. I, I mean P, class P. Right. So, here C and this is this. So, this is the object 2. Object 2. Because object 2 is the object for P. Now, let us execute this one. Right. So, first one, 40, child 1, 20, parent, 50, child 2, 20, parent. So, here, two childs, so two objects has been created and by using two objects, we are accessing both the parent and child class variables and methods. So, this is called a hierarchy. That means one base class and a multiple derived class. So what is the importance of this super keyword? So as we have said, the inheritance means acquiring the properties of one class by the another class. Right. So that we give, uh, the one we call it as the base class and Another we call it as derived class, right? So derived class will acquire the properties acquire the properties. So here the meaning of acquiring these properties means it can access the variables methods, constructors and everything of the base class, right? So whatever the we are class which is inheriting the properties of base class that means derived class can access the variables, methods, constructors and whatever it may be subclasses. So everything which we are writing in the base class can be accessed by the derived class. So that's why we call this as a parent and this call as a child. Right? So this we have covered in the previous session that we call it as an inheritance. Now coming to the super keyword, this super keyword will be used in inheritance concept. How 
we will use this super keyword so super keyword is used to access the variables methods constructors of a base class in derived class right so so this can be done by the super keyword this can be done by the super keyword and this must be used in derived class so hope you understood this one right so inheritance concept means acquiring the properties acquiring the properties means accessing the variables methods and constructors how we can access the variable set constructors and methods is by using the super keyword so this can be done if the variables methods and constructors are having the same name in both the base class and derived class right so base class consists of, can can consist of wait i will write here so base class and then here derived class right it inherits the properties from base class so here if you write the variables methods and here we are writing the same name variables with the same name similarly methods with the same name then the first preference will be for the variables and methods then how to access these variables and methods these variables and methods can be accessed by using super keyword right so super dot variable similarly super dot method so this must be base class variable this must be base class method right so example let us take an example if in the base class we are declaring a variable as some a is equal to 20 here also we are taking an example so here also we are considering a variable a is equal to 40 right here we are writing some display method and also we are writing the display method so see if you observe here the variables which are declared in base class and derivative class both are same a the name is same but the value is different so the variable the value of the base class variable is having 20 and the value for derived class variable we are having 40 but the va variable names are same a and a and in the display here methods coming to the methods here display method we are writing the method name as display here also we are writing the method display so if you access if you want to access these variables and methods so as it is a derived class by using the derived class object we can access the methods so directly by using this object we can access these methods but here the conflict is both the variables of derived class and base class both are equal so if you access a variable name directly the first preference goes to the derived class variables and derived class methods see for example if it is a class some base class and derived class b d okay base class derived class bd class bd now if if we want to access these variables we have to create bd some object is equal to new class name right so in order to access this one we will write just obj.a next obj.display so directly it will access all these things if the variable name is some b and if the variable name is some show so by using this one we can directly call this 
object dot b and obj dot show so we need not create an extra object for the parent class because this is a derived class so it will act, it can access both the variables and methods of base class but here conflict is if the methods and variables are of have, having the same name for both the base and derived class here object dot a it will call this one not this one it will call this one object dot display it will call this one but not this one right so here in such cases we have to use a super keyword so here in order to access a in this class we can write sorry so if you want to access this variables in this methods right in the base in the child class then we have to write super dot a and super dot display right so hope you understood so one thing we have to remember is this must be used in derived class only derived class only not in the main function we should not use this in the main function if we have to write it in the derived class itself now see let, uh, let me write an example so that uh, your doubts will be clarified see first super class it can access use it to access the immediate right so it can access immediate parent class variables similarly it is used to access immediate parent class methods also it can access immediate parent class constructors right so it is used to access the immediate parent class so here i am specifically mentioning that immediate parent class because so we can have the multiple multi level inheritance we have implemented the multi level inheritance right so this is the base class so it acquires the properties so it is a b and again it acquires the properties it is c so for c the parent is b for b the parent is a right so b is acquiring the properties of a c is acquiring the properties of b if you write here super it will it will access the variables and methods of a if you write super keyword here it will access the variables and methods of b right so that's why i am writing the immediate parent class the immediate parent class right now let us write a program small program an example see i am writing here some class parent so here i am declaring variables int a is equal to some 20 so void display i am writing a small method so here i am using system dot out dot print ln i am writing here parent class right parent class now so here i am again writing one more class chain which extends p so extends is used to inherit the properties of parent now here also I am writing the same thing in B is equal to sorry I will give the same name in A is equal to some 40 and I will write the same thing void display and again here if I print system dot out dot print ln child right similarly system dot out dot print ln i will write the full thing system dot out dot print ln if you print a 
which one will be printed directly here the first preference is 40 so 40 will be printed here if you want to access the parent class variables and methods by the derived class we have to use a super rule so if you want to display this a value here we have to write system dot out dot print ln super dot a automatically it will print 20 so for this we will get a 40 for this we will get a 20 and how to access the display method directly we can write here super dot display right so automatically first child will be printed here and then a value here simply we are writing a so 40 will be printed here and here super dot a 20 will be printed here and again super dot display parent will be printed right so the output for this program is this one so we have to write the main function so simply I just avoiding that uh, I will show you while implementing this uh, in the system right so if here the, the variable name is B the variable name is B automatically if you print a the 20 will be printed here right so there is uh, no use of using the super keyword here directly by using the name we can access the variables but if the variable is having the same name then we have to use the super keyword in order to differentiate the variable of child and parent similarly the constructor also so here whatever the constructor we are writing so if if the parent class consists of some constructor parent constructor right if parent class consists of this constructor whenever the object is created for the child automatically first this constructor will be executed that means the first thing is super right so this super function we need not write explicitly implicitly it will be written in the derived class as a first statement so automatically first the constructor of the parent will be executed and then followed by the constructor of a child and followed by the methods written in the child so here the output if if this parent class consists of this constructor the output is first this parent constructor will be printed right and then child will be printed and then 40 will be printed then super dot a so 20 will be printed and super dot display parent will be printed right so this is the output for this program if there is a constructor in parent so in order to call the constructor of a parent in the child class super function we will use so super just a super simply this line will execute the constructor of a parent in the child but we need not the programmer need not write this one explicitly the compiler uh, or a jvm will execute this statement as the first statement in the derived class so if there is any constructor automatically that constructor of a parent will be executed first and then followed by the remaining in the child class right so hope you understood this one so let us see the implementation part of this one so that you will clearly understood so i will show the usage of accessing of variables methods and the constructor in a system right let us see that hello friends so just now we have seen the usage of super keyword now let us see the implementation part of this super keyword so super keyword is used to access the variables and the methods of a base class inside the derived class so we have to use the super keyword in only the derived class now let us write the program for that so i am writing the class parent so in in the parent i am declaring the variable a is equal to 40 
and i am displaying some i am uh, creating one method void display just i am printing some message parent class right and also i am declaring one more of class that is child which extends parent that means it, it will inherit the properties of a parent so here also i am giving some some other variable b is equal to some 40 some b is equal to some 30 right so void uh, show let us write it as method show and i am just writing the display print ln child class Similarly, I'm just want to print B here and also I just want to print print Ellen sorry A here right and I, I will I'll just call the method display function right hope you understood these two classes in the parent we are just declaring the variable a and the method display and in the child class i am creating one variable b and one method show in the show method i am just displaying the text child class and then i am displaying the met, uh, uh, the va variable of child a uh, variable of parent and the we are calling a method which is written in parent now I will write the main function, all right? Parent child. Some arguments. Then I have to create a object for child, right? Child obj is equal to new child. With the help of obj, I will access just value show right just i will save it yes, replace it so let us compile it so just i am compiling it successfully compiled java parent child so first child class 30 40 and parent class see if you observe first we are we are calling show so child class is printed here and then we are printing b values which is 30 so here 30 is printed and the next a value is printing that is 40 which we have declared in parent class so 40 is printed and we are calling the display method in which we are writing parent class so this is a normal thing now the question is if the variables are both same that means parent is having the variable a child is also having a variable a now just i will put the comment if you are printing a here which one will be printed so here a that means whether it will be printing the value of child variable the value of parent variable so in such case it will give the prof first preference to the child class variable so 30 will be printed so system dot out dot print ln a that means first preference 30 will be printed and automatically display means directly this one will be printed right so next in this case if you want to display the variable of parent here we have to use a super keyword so super dot a so in the first step a will be printed that means the child variable value will be printed and instead of writing simply a we have to write a super dot a that means the variable of a immediate parent so now let us see the execution so if you execute first child class it will be printed next a that means a 30 will be printed next a super dot a super dot a means 
the parent variable value is printed 40 40 is printed next display right display means parent class now here one more question if both are having the same thing now if you execute this one it will go for the recursion so continuous calling of this function because display here the same thing here the function calling itself that is a recursion right so here also the same thing first it will first preference it will go with the child method method we are writing in the child class so in order to access the parent method here also we have to use super super dot display now we can get cannot find object show okay see here it's not to show it is display see executed see child class 30 40 and a parent class first child class 30 and super dot a 40 and super dot display that means the display function which written in the parent function right immediate parent so that's why we are writing here super that is parent class so in the absence of the super let us see so i am i am telling that it's a recursion let us see what will be happened executed see this is a call a recursion continuous execution right. right continuously executing the same method because the parent is having the method display and inside the display we are writing again the display but our intention is to call the method which is written in parent but here it is the first preference is taken to the child child method so it is an infinite loop right so Hope you understood this one. So, in, a, in order to access the parent method, we have to use a display. That means, if both the parent and child is having the same variable names and the same methods, then the child class can use the super keyword to access the variables and methods of a parent class. Java C. Right. Okay. Hope you understood this one. Now, constructor. What about the constructor? So, if I am writing the constructor here, parent is the constructor, right? So, here I am writing the constructor system dot out dot println parent constructor. And if you want to write here the child constructor, System dot out dot println child constructor. Right? So if you execute this one, so we know that a constructor, whenever the object is created, immediately it will go for this constructor, it will search for this constructor. So here the first it must be printed, right? And we are not calling the parent constructor anywhere anywhere we are not calling the parent constructor we are just only creating an object for child constructor but the jvm will default by default it will execute the parent constructor first and then it will go for the child constructor let us check so if you compile the program see first the parent constructor is executed then child constructor is executed and followed by the remaining thing so that means here it will have super method so this is implicitly called by the jvm right so this super is super just a super method is calling the parent constructor that means if there is any constructor written in the parent whenever you are creating an object for the child immediately that parent constructor will be executed first and then it will follow the execution continuous execution of main function so immediately we are writing the object dot display so first the parent constructor is executed and immediately after creating an object child constructor will be executed and then we are uh, calling the display of child 
So child display will be executed in the child class is printed first a value first. Say here we are using both the in both the class parent class and the child class we are using the same variable name. So first preference will be the for the child class variable. So 30 will be printed and in order to access the parent class variable in the child class. So here we are we have to use this super keyword and then in order to access the method of a parent class here we have to use a super keyword for accessing the method of a parent in chain. Right. The name itself indicates method overriding. Overriding means writing the same method in different way. Right. So for this, this will be in implemented in inheritance with the help of inheritance. Right. We know that inheritance means there will be one super class, and from this super class. subclass will extend the properties right so this subclass can acquire the properties that means can access the methods of a superclass right so here overriding means whatever the method we are writing in superclass right for example we are writing the method display in this superclass and the same method will be written here also here also we will write the same method Right. So, in the absence of this one, directly by creating an object for this subclass that can access the method of a superclass. Right. So, for example, if you create an object for this subclass, object dot display will automatically it will access this display method. Now the question is overriding. That means subclass. That means a child class is overriding the method which is written in superclass. So here we are writing the display function, right? The same display method is overrided by the subclass. So again, the same method has been written here. Now, if you execute this one, object dot display, automatically the object belongs to the subclass. So the display function, which is written in subclass will be executed. Hope you understood, right? So in the absence of display function in subclass, the superclass display function will be executed. If you write the same display function in both the superclass and the subclass, the first preference will be goes to the subclass method. Right? Now the question is why this overriding? So in the inheritance concept, we know that the child can access the method written in superclass. But if the child is not uh, satisfied with the implementation of that particular method which is written in superclass then the child can override the same method in the child class hope you understood right so if the child is not satisfied with the method which is written in superclass then the child can override the method and can rewrite that method in subclass that means a child class so here the main constraint is first thing the inheritance concept is needed second thing both the methods must have the same name third thing both the methods must have the same return type the fourth thing the same the both the methods should have the same scope if we write that method as a public we have, we have to write this child class method also as a public so there must be no difference in anything, right? That's why we call it as a overriding. So one more constraint, if these are the static methods, so those static methods cannot be overrided, right? Any method can be overrided, but if that method is a static method, that method cannot be overrided. Second thing, if the method is declared as a final, we cannot override the method in child class. So final keyword, which we have seen in uh, keyword section, right? So if the method is declared as a final in the super class, that method cannot be overridden 
by the subclass right so hope you understood this one just we will write a simple program so that your your doubt will be clarified right see first i will write the uh, information so this will be implemented with the help of inheritance next method name should be same in both superclass and subclass similarly return type as well as the scope as well as parameters should be same in both the superclass and subclass next methods declared as final cannot be overridden similarly the static methods static methods can not be overridden right we need to get uh, take care about all these things so inheritance and the method name return type and scope and parameter should be same in both superclass and a subclass and finally the methods of declared as a final cannot be overridden and the static methods cannot be overridden right now let us see the implementation part let us write a small program so i am writing a class parent here I am writing uh, the display function. The display system dot out dot print ln parent. Right now, I am again writing the class child, which extends the parents. So extends. To is to implement the inheritance extends the parent so child can, can access the methods of a parent void display again i am writing the same thing system dot out dot print ln child here i am writing the main function Class override public static void main string args arguments. Now I will create an object for a child. So child c is equal to some new child. Right. So if I access c dot display, what is the output here? C dot display. First, it will check for the child, and then it will go for the parent. Right. So here, both the parent and child both are having the same method, display method. Right. So both are having the same name. Both are having the same name, same parameters, same scope, same return type. So this is called a overriding. So child class is overriding method of a parent class. Now, if you access this one, C dot display, child will be printed. The output will be child. And if in the absence of this one, 
if this method is not written here then automatically parent will be the output directly it will access the method of a parent right and if you want to display both the things that means i want to display this one as well as i want to execute this method also then we have to use the super method which we have discussed in the previous section right so super method is used to access the immediate variables i mean the instance variables and the methods of a immediate parent right so here the child parent the child's parent is parent class so in order to access this method in the super subclass we have to use a super keyword so here you can write super dot display so automatically first this will be executed and then the child uh, this this statement will be executed the output will be parent and child if if this display is a final the method is declared as a final that cannot be overrided by the child or it, 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 if it is a static that can all be overrided by the child so why the child is overriding means if the subclass is not satisfied with the implementation of the method which is written in super class the child can able to override the method according to the child's convenience right Hope you understood. So we will stop here. Let us see this program implementing in the Java compiler. Hello friends. So just now we have seen the method overriding concept. Now let us implement. So in order to implement this method overriding there should be an inheritance concept. So that means the method will be overrided in between two different classes. Right. Let us create a one class, class parent and let us write one method void display parent method right let us uh, create one subclass which extends parent A class child extends parent so that here also we will write it, uh, the same thing the method void display println child method right so here we are creating two different classes one is a super class another one is a subclass so here we know that the child which extends the parent can access the methods and the variables of a parent so here overriding means as we have discussed just now the method should be same the method name should be same the return type should be same the scope is, should be same as well as the parameters should be same so then only we call it as a overrided here the parent method is overrided by the uh, sorry yeah parent method is overrided by the child right let us create a, a main function class override see here in order to access the methods of a class we need to create an object so just I will create an object for a child so child obj is equal to new child right so if you <coughs> access the method 
display what will be displayed here see i will just save it right now let us uh, execute that one java c dot java yes successfully compiled again i am executing this one java override so child method so the method display of a child class is executed because here the object is here. but here question is the method of a parent is also having the same name so here the method is uh, method of a parent is also having same name so here why we call it as an overriding because if we write any method in a parent that can be accessed by the child right so if child is not satisfied with the implementation of that method which is written in a parent then the child can override the method according to the child's convenience right so that's why here the return type the parameters as well as the scope must be same for both the child child method and a parent method then only we call it as an overriding so in the absence of this method in the child see here i am just giving a command for the method which is written in a child and now let us execute this one so there is only one method that is available in parent so parent method is executed right so here object dot display obviously it go for the display method which is written in parent if the child is also having the same name then the first preference will be gone to the child method right if you want to access the parent method also one thing is create a one object here create one object and through the object call the function child method or parent method so in order to access the method which is written in parent we have to create an object for the parent and through the parent object we can access the method or else by using the super keyword we can access so here we can write super keyword super dot display so as we have discussed in the previous session the super keyword is used to uh access the methods or variables of a parent class in the child class if both are sharing the same name now let us see i just put the comment on parent object and uh, i am using the super keyword in the child method so it will execute both were parent method and child method right hope you understood this one this is a very simple thing so this is called a overriding technique so why we are overriding means if child doesn't satisfy the implementation of a parent method then the child can override that method according to the child's convenience right so this is called the runtime polymorphism so we have discussed in a wooks concept there is a polymorphism so this is called a runtime polymorphism so in the previous sessions we have seen the overloading concept that is called compile time polymorphism and also that is called as a static binding and this is called as dynamic binding polymorphism so in the polymorphism we said that implementing the same thing in different ways implementing same thing in different ways right this is called a polymorphism in that it is divided into two categories one is compile time polymorphism
second one is runtime polymorphism. Right. So this compile time polymorphism is achieved by implementing method overloading. So this can be achieved by implementing method overloading and this can be achieved by implementing method overriding right so this is called static binding this is called a dynamic binding Because here we are saying that compile time, here run time. So compile time, so it is called a static binding. It's a run time because, so we are saying it as a dynamic bind. So both the method overloading and the method overriding comes under the OOPS concept polymorphism. In order to achieve the polymorphism, we have to implement these two concepts, method overloading and the overriding. Now let us see the differences, actual differences between the overloading and overriding. Method overloading. Method overriding. So first thing, just now we have seen by implementing this one, we will achieve compile time polymorphism. Compile time polymorphism. Here we will achieve runtime polymorphism. Right? That's why we call it as static binding. That's why we call it as dynamic binding. Next, here the method name should be same or this will be implemented in a single class. Single class. This will be implemented in two different classes. So here, in order to achieve this method overloading, there is no concept of inheritance. There is no need of inheritance concept. No need of inheritance. This will be achieved with the help of inheritance next here whatever the method we are overloading that method name should be same method name should be same Here also for method overriding the method name should be same. Next, here the parameters may be different, right? So name same name with the different parameters. difference in 
parameters. Here, both the methods should have the same parameters. So, same parameters. Here, the return type can be different. Here, the return type should be same. Scope may be different. Here, the scope must be same as well as method name, parameters, return type. Right? So, the next one, static methods can be overloaded. Here, the static methods we can't override. So, static methods cannot be overridden static methods cannot be overridden okay so this is called early binding because it's a compile time this is called late binding because it is a run time Right. Next, in the addition to method overloading here, whatever the methods declared using a final keyword, those methods cannot be overloaded. Methods declared with final keyword. cannot be overridden right here there is a no chance of declaring any method with a final keyword because this will be used in inheritance concept right so if the final keyword is used on methods those methods cannot be inherited so child class cannot access the methods which are uh, declared as a final in the super class. Similarly, if the final keyword is used to declare a variable, those variables will be acting as a constants. We cannot change the value of that constants. Right? So, these are the differences between the method overloading and overriding. So, in order to achieve the polymorphism, we need to implement method overloading and method overriding right so hope you understood this one let me write a simple example for method overloading and method overriding so just i will erase these things and i will write the example simple example So here, let me call overload class. Here, let us write add, some void add logic. Similarly, void add int x int y. Similarly, int add int x int y so all these are the
comes under this method of overlay. That means we are writing different methods with the same name but different signature and different uh, return type. Right? So here we are implementing everything in single class. Single class. So here we are not using the inheritance concept. Hope you understood this. Coming to this method of overriding class P, if you write here and in the class C, again we have to write the same method with the same parameters. Right? So here the inheritance concept is here extends P. So two classes, this method of overriding is implemented in two different classes. One class is inherited with the other class. So whatever the method we are writing in the parent class, the same class, the same method, the same method, name, parameters and return type should be written in the child class also, the base class also. So this is, in this we will use two different classes, two classes. That's why we call it as inheritance. Inheritance. Abstract class and methods. First. The abstract method. What is meant by an abstract method? If any class consists of only the declaration of a method is there and hiding the implementation part, that means a definition part, then we call it as an abstract method. That means only declaration but no definition right such methods we call them as abstract methods what is meant by an abstract class we know that any class may contains the instance variables as well as the methods and a constructors right so if any class consists of at least one abstract method then that class will be calling as abstract class class contains at least one as abstract method is called an abstract class. So here an abstract class may consist of both the abstract methods as well as the normal methods. So abstract class can have abstract methods or normal methods right next when we have to write the implementation of these abstract methods that means here we are saying the class will contain only the declaration part it will hide the implementation part. So here the question is where we have to write the implementation part. So that must be written in a derived class, right? So this will be the parent class and the implementation part will be written in the derived class. So that means we have to use the inheritance concept here. So, sorry.
implementation of abstract methods will be written in derived class right and there is a one more terminology we have to know that is concrete class what is meant by con concrete class so the class contains the complete implementation of all the methods that class we call it as a concrete class complete definition for all methods it should contain the complete definition for all the methods which are written in the class that class we call it as a concrete class right so abstract method abstract class and a concrete class one more thing we have to remember if it is an abstract class object cannot be created right so object cannot be created or instantiated for the abstract class if it is a concrete class object can be instantiated that means created so we know how to create an object right so if it is an abstract class the object we cannot create an object that means we cannot instantiate an object right so whatever the method we are writing we have to use abstract keyword abstract keyword and if it is an abstract class here also we can we have to use abstract keyword for this class hope you understood so let us write the program a simple program example so that your doubts will be clarified hope you understood these things abstract method abstract class and the concrete class see let us write here so here i am writing class a in that class a i am just writing the declaration of a method so so void some display this is called a declaration so let me explain about the declaration and definition right now right so if you if anyone is having the doubt the what is the difference between the declaration of a method and the definition of a method just see here so this is called declaration and this is called definition right so complete definition this is called a definition this is called a declaration so here if a class declaration is there but there is no implementation that we call it as a abstract method so see here here we are writing only declaration so this is an abstract method and every abstract method should be declared by using abstract keyword so here we have to write here abstract abstract void display and if any class consists of these abstract methods the class the class itself is a abstract class and it should be declared by using abstract so here also we have to write an abstract before the class a right so this is the abstract class a now i will write here class b extends a right inheritance concept 
Now I will write the implementation part here. Void display system dot out dot print ln you can write class a right so this is called abstract class this one is the abstract class this one is the abstract method and here in this class b we are writing the implementation this is called concrete class because here we are writing only one method that is also completed by writing the definition so we cannot create an object for class a but we can create an object for class b so in order to access the methods of a class a we are writing the inheritance concept now let us write here class abstract public static void main some string r arguments here we cannot create an object for class a because it is an abstract class we have to create an object for class b so b object is equal to new a constructor so by using the object we have to call the display method So hope you understood this one, one abstract class, concrete class, in this class we are implementing the uh, abstract method. So this is the derived class for the class A, right. So here the output will be class A. Now if this class is also having one more abstract method, so again I am writing one more abstract method, abstract void show okay. so as i have said that a class may contains the abstract methods as well as a normal methods so here class b consists of normal method as well as one abstract method so if any class consists of at least one abstract method that will be calling as an abstract class so here class b is also an abstract class so we have to replace this statement abstract class b extends a now where we have to write this implementation again we have to write one more class which extends class b right because the implementation part of this uh, abstract method should be written in a derivative class so here i'm writing class c extends class b here we can write void show system dot out dot print ln class b right so here both are the abstract classes class c will be the concrete class because class c doesn't contain any abstract class any abstract methods so a class which doesn't contain any abstract methods that we call it as an abstract concrete class. So that's why this is a concrete class and we cannot create an object for class A or class B because both are the abstract classes. So this statement is wrong. C right now we are creating an object for C. C is a derived class of class B so C object of C can access both the methods of class C and class B and again class B is again derived class of class A so object can the same object can access the methods of class A here there is there are no methods in class A because only the abstract method is there there is no uh, implementation part of the method right so for this the output is so here we can uh, call the same thing object dot show so the output will be class a and class b right 
so hope you understood this one so once again i am repeating so whatever the method we are writing only the declaration but not the definition that method we call it as an abstract method and every abstract method should be declared by using the keyword abstract and if any class consists of at least one abstract method that is called as abstract class and if any class which consists of uh, which doesn't consist of abstract methods that is called a concrete class and we cannot create an object for abstract classes we can create the object for only the concrete classes and we have to write the implementation part of the abstract method in the derived class that means we have to apply the inheritance concept here right so hope you understood this one if you are having any doubts regarding this uh, uh, abstract methods feel free to post your doubts in the comment section now let us see the implementation part of this abstract class and abstract methods in the compiler hello friends we will see the implementation of these abstract methods and the classes so as we have said that abstract method means there will be only the declaration part but there will be no implementation part so that means hiding the implementation details those we will call it as a abstract methods and whatever the classes having these abstract methods those classes we call it as abstract classes now let us create a class class a here just i will write uh, one declaration just a declaration but not a definition right so this is an o abstract such classes we have to declare with a abstract so here this method is a abstract method so this class will be an abstract so we have to declare this class also with abstract abstract class if it is an abstract class we cannot create an object for that abstract class so object cannot be instantiated right so we will create a one more class b which extends a so in the derived class we can write the implementation part of the abstract i mean uh, we can write the implementation part of the abstract method which is written in the abstract class so in the class a we are writing one abstract method that definition can be written in class b now i will write the definition display abstract method in a right now i'll write a main method abstract main right so here we cannot create an object for class a because it is an abstract class we can create an object for class b so b obj is equal to new b so i have created an object and now i will call the method of an abstract class right display so here the implementation part we are writing in class b so let us see this abstract main dot java let us execute this one so 
it is successfully compiled now let us execute this one abstract main so it is displaying the text abstract method in a see if you are creating an object for class a you will get an error because we cannot create an object for class a see error a is a abstract cannot be instantiated so for any abstract class we cannot create the object okay so here as we have said that abstract class may contain the abstract methods or a normal methods now let us see the math. so in a class a we are declaring it as an abstract and in that we are writing one abstract method now I will write a one actual method right I have written one method definition and one abstract method in class A so even though it is having one method definition if it consists of any one abstract method that class will be considered as an abstract class. So, if it is an abstract class, an object cannot be created for that particular abstract class. Right? So, now, so here we are creating an object for B and we are accessing obj dot display and again we can access obj dot show which is written in class A because we are writing the inheritance concept. So, B is a derived class and A is a base class. So, B can acquire the properties of class A so that the B can access the methods which are written in class A. Let us execute and see. Yes, successful compilation. Abstract method in A and a show method. Right, hope you understood this one. So, an abstract class can may contain the abstract methods and normal methods both and the abstract method implementation should be written in the child class that means a derived class right so that means overridden now if we write this one in class b we can write so we can we can write a normal methods and the implementation of that abstract methods in the class derived class right so here also we can get the same output see we, here also we are getting the same output right so here the class which consists of all the method definitions completely is called a concrete class so that means a concrete class should not contain any abstract methods and an abstract class must consist of at least one abstract method and we cannot create an object for the abstract class we can create an object for object for only the concrete classes see if if as we have said that a class an abstract class can contain the abstract methods and the normal methods see in this example I am writing the implementation part of the abstract method and again I am creating one another abstract method abstract void show this is an abstract method written in derived class right hope you understood abstract class A consists of one abstract method class B extends class A so in the class B we are writing the implementation of the abstract method which is uh, declared in class A and again we are writing one abstract method in class B. So, here the class consists of one abstract method. So, this will be also an abstract class. It is not a normal class, concrete class. It is an abstract class. Again, again, we have to write the implementation from the derived class, right? So, again, write down C extends b so that means just we uh, this type of uh, implementation we have seen in multi level inheritance right 
तो एफ क्लास ए क्लास बी एक्सटेंड सी ए क्लास सी एक्सटेंड बी राइट हियर क्लास सी इज द कॉन्क्रीट क्लास बिकॉज हियर वी आर राइडिंग द इम्प्लीमेंटेशन पार्ट ऑफ द एबस्ट्रैक्ट मेथड विच इज रिटर्न इन क्लास बी print ln so method in c right now if you execute this one again we will get an error because here we are creating an object for the class b which is an abstract class so for abstract class we cannot create an object so here we have to create an object for concrete class that is c now if you execute this one so successful compilation the same thing we will get right so hope you understood this one so here i am writing one abstract class in that abstract class i am writing only one abstract method in the second class that means a derived class again i am writing one another abstract method so the derived class also an abstract class and again from that again i am writing another derived class which can which in which we are implementing the abstract method which is written in derived class b so that particular class we call it as an concrete class right so here we have to remember a few things once again i am repeating so if any class consists of an abstract methods then it should be called as an abstract class and if if uh, if it is an abstract class we cannot create an object for that abstract class and an abstract class may consists of both the method definitions as well as the abstract methods normal methods and as well as the abstract methods right an abstract method is giving only the de declaration but hiding the implementation that is called abstract method so all this we have to remember while implementing this abstract class and abstract method hello friends welcome back to our channel so in previous session we have seen the inheritance concept and method overriding concept so in this session we will see about the interface concept so during the inheritance concept we have seen there are different types of inheritance so in that we have covered the multi level inheritance single inheritance as well as the hierarchical inheritance and there are two more inheritance in our con uh, two more inheritance concepts are there those are uh, multiple inheritance as well as the hybrid inheritance so in java programming it doesn't supports these two inheritances directly that means we cannot achieve the multiple inheritance as well as the hybrid inheritance with uh, uh, directly in java programming so in order to achieve these two we have to implement interfaces concept so by using the interface concept we can achieve the multiple inheritance as well as hybrid inheritance now what is meant by the interface so before that we have already seen about the abstract methods abstract class so in that we know that abstract class is having at least one abstract method right abstract method means just declaring the method but not the definition so we can write the definition in another class which inherits the abstract class so if any class consists of at least one abstract method that is called abstract class so this we have seen in the previous sessions so going to the interface we have to get the knowledge of these abstract methods because here in the interfaces it contains only the abstract methods right so let us start the interface concept interfaces so first main thing to implement these interfaces is to achieve multiple inheritance right what is meant by multiple inheritance we know that so base class we can acquire the properties for the chain class or we can say it as a 
derived class right so from the same base class we can have the properties for two children right so two different classes can acquire the properties of same base class so this is also correct this is also correct but if if any class wants to if any child wants to acquire the properties of two base classes right if any child wants to get the properties from two base classes this cannot be achieved by using the inheritance concept this can be achieved by using interface concept that's why we call it as a multiple inheritance right so this can be achieved by interfaces so for this we will use the keyword interface for declaring the methods so two keywords will be used in implementation the two keywords one is interface for creating an interface second implements implements right then in the interfaces we will have only abstract methods it can have only abstract methods now what is the question the question is what is the abstract method so here the abstract method means writing only the method declaration but not method definition right abstract method is having only the declaration but not definition right those are the methods abstract methods so this multiple inheritance or the, this interface will be having only the abstract methods right now let us see an example hope you understood this one basic concept so instead of writing class instead of writing abstract class here we have to use interface so first we have to create an interface interface let us create some a in interface a we have to write the method declarations but not the definitions now let us write void a display let us write only one method right so here we have to write only the method declaration but not the definition so where we have to write the definition we have to write the definition in the class which implements this interface right class some ab i will write here class ab implements a here we have to write this function i mean the method so this is important the scope must be public so that you can access the abstract methods of an interface right so we have to write the scope as public so public void a display system dot out dot print align a display right now write down the main function so we can write the main function here itself but uh, let us write uh, somewhere else so we write here itself okay so class 
a main here we have to write public static void main string some arguments now we have to create an object for this class so here also we cannot create an object for these interfaces right so whatever the class or interface consists of these abstract methods those classes for those classes we cannot create an object so these objects must be created only for the concrete classes so concrete class means the complete definitions must be there there, there should be no abstract methods in that class so here for this ab some obj is equal to u ab call it abj dot a display so automatically this will be executed right next hope you understood so here in the interface a we have created we have declared only one method that is a display this is only the method, the abstract method, right? So here we are not writing any definition. Where we are writing the definition? We are writing the definition in another class which implements this interface. So if, if, in order to achieve the multiple inheritance, see, I am writing one more interface. Actually, this can be done by using the inheritance concept, right? So in order to, uh, uh, I mean, instead of writing these implements, we can write here extends so that it can access the uh, properties of uh, this method so it can access it right so now the question is if one class wants to inherit the properties of two different classes then what is the question right so here we, i'm creating one more interface here some void b display so this cannot be implemented by using the extends keyword right now a b should implement both the methods of interface a and interface b so here this cannot be done by using the extend keyword right so for that we are going for this implements so a b implements a comma b so this is a syntax for implementing multiple in interfaces at a time so here we have to write a one more method definition that is y B display system dot out dot print ln B display right so in the main function see here we are writing both the definitions we are writing we are writing both the definitions right so these both the definitions the declaration for these both definitions are in multiple in interfaces hope you understood this one right so for this also we have to call by using the object object b display so that we will get the output as a display and b display this is the output for this program right so hope you understood this one main cause for going for these interfaces is to implement from multiple interfaces to achieve the multiple inheritance right and the interface should contain only the abstract methods that's the, these are the two things should be remembered right now let us see the implementation part in the system hello friends so now we have seen uh, what is meant by the interface and how to implement the interface now let us see an example for this implementation of interface concepts so just now we have seen the interface consists of only the abstract methods right so an abstract class is completely different from an interface abstract class may contain the abstract methods as well as the normal methods but here the interface should contain only the abstract methods that means the method declaration should be there but not the definition 
and we have to write the definition in the child class which implements this interface right so let us create one interface so we have to use the keyword interface instead of using the class interface some a we have to write some two methods i mean we have to write only declaration void display void a show a display a show right so here we have given only two method declarations that is these are the abstract so here we need not write explicitly as an abstract because every interface will be having only the abstract methods now let us write one more interface interface b and here also we will declare two methods b display similarly b show right so here the question is where we have to write the function definition so all these abstract methods definition should be written in the class which implements these interfaces now let us write class ab implements a comma b so this is the advantage of creating these interfaces so this cannot be implemented in inheritance concept so we can inherit the properties from only one class so we cannot implement the properties acquire the properties from two base classes that means there should be only one base class and multiple chains right so here that's why we are going for this interface concept so here a class can implement all the methods of multiple interfaces so how to implement this multiple interfaces is just writing comma right so class ab implements a comma b here we have to write the method definitions see display here we will write a display right similarly we have to write a show a show similarly we have to write uh, b display and b show right because here we are implementing the class both the interfaces right a and b so we have to write the function definitions that means a method definitions here itself now we can create a class like uh, interface a b so let us write the pub main function create an object for the class so here class name is ab so ab object is equal to new a b constructor now we can call it from here itself object obj dot a display obj dot a show obj dot b display obj dot b show right now let us create i mean the, let us save the file interface a b dot java right now let us compile it 
Javasi interface AB dot Java. So taking much time. So there are more number of errors. A show in AB cannot implement A show in A. So let us see that. Here, keep the modifier, I mean access modifier public, right? So that it can access from anywhere, right? So successfully it was compiled, right? See Java C interface AB dot Java. Now Java interface AB. So we can have A display, A show, B display and B show. So this is how the interface concept is implemented. So just a simple thing in the interface we can write only the declarations but not the definitions. It should contain only the abstract methods. Right. So one class can implement multiple interfaces. It can implement multiple interfaces. So this cannot be done in inheritance concept. Right. Now let us see one more example so that uh, you can clearly understood. Let us take some interface features, phone features, right. So a normal feature phone features, normally a phone can have a two features that is a dialing and messaging. So let us create void. Dialing similarly void messaging, right? Next, similarly, let us create one more interface add ons. So, what are the add ons? Video calling, right? Next. some as some MMS let us take let us take okay then let us create one class that is featured phone which implements we know that feature phone will have only the dialing and messages this featured phone will not have this uh, voice calling or video calling and MMS right so it implements only the features. So we can we have to write the function definition for only dialing. Dialing. So we have to use the scope public. Right. System dot out dot print ln. Right. Dialing. Featured phone is dialing. Right? So let us create the same thing for messaging. Right? Messaging. Let us write messaging. Right. So only feature phone will have these two features that is dialing and messaging. Next, let us create a one more class, class smartphone. All are aware of this smartphone. So here smartphone will be having all these features that is dialing, messaging, video calling and MMS. So it should implement both the interfaces right features and add-on here again we have to write all the four see here we have to write all the four 
methods let us smartphone smartphone is messaging similarly we have to write we have to implement the video calling and as well as v calling smartphone is yes in video call here mms smartphone is sending ms right so here we have implemented all these things now let us create a main class class mobile so now write the main function public static void main some argument for the command line then here we have to create an objects for feature phone let us see here what is the class name featured phone right featured phone fp is equal to new featured phone next smartphone sp is equal to new smartphone so here we are creating two objects for both the classes now let us call fb dot dialing similarly fb dot messaging similarly sp dot dialing sp dot messaging sp dot v calling sp dot mms right so we have created the definitions and call let us mobile dot java right now let us compile it java c mobile dot uh, java so here cannot find symbol fb sorry fp here the object is fp not fb right java c mobile dot java so successfully executed i mean compiled now let us execute so feature phone is dialing smartphone feature phone is messaging smartphone is dialing smartphone is messaging mm, smartphone is in video call smartphone is sending mms so like this we can implement the interface the main thing for implementing this interface is implementing two different interfaces so class can implement two different interfaces so class cannot inherit two different base classes the child cannot inherit two different base classes so for that purpose we have to go for interface so in the concept of inheritance we have seen so multiple inheritance and hybrid inheritance can be achieved only through implementation of interfaces in java programming so by using the extends keyword we cannot achieve the multiple inheritance as well as the hybrid inheritance so both the multiple inheritance and the hybrid inheritance both we have to achieve by implementing the interface concept only right an interface should consist of only the abstract methods that is a method declaration but not the definition right so whatever the class implementing these interfaces in that class we have to write the definitions of the abstract methods so hope you understood this one
right so here the name itself indicates exception handling so exception that means the interruption for our flow of data right whatever the code we are writing so if there is any interruption or if there is any error automatically we call it as an exception so our main drawback is if there is any exception occurred in our program automatically the rest of the code will not be get executed and the program will be terminated abruptly right so this is for avoiding abnormal termination of program so whenever an exception is raised the program will be terminated abnormally right so in order to avoid that abnormal termination we will use this exception handling right so here we will use a more number of keywords so uh, actually five keywords we will use that is try catch throw throws finally so all these will be used in exception handling right so first let us see these two in this session try and catch try block so it is a block of statements block of statements so what are these block of statements so in this we have to write the code in which we are expecting the exceptions so we have to assume or we have to expect some exceptions to be raised in the code such type of code should be written in try block so try block is a normal execution of the statements right and catch it is also a block of statements it is also a block of statements but the difference between this try and catch is whatever the exceptions raised in this try block those exceptions will be handled in catch block handles exceptions raised in try block right so all the exceptions will be raised in try block and it will be catched in i mean handled in catch block right so without try block we should not write the catch block and without catch block we should not write the try block see i will show you the syntax for these things try and catch so try some statements catch we have to pass the exception exception some e or ex right so whatever the code we want to execute right after handling this exception see this is a syntax for try and catch block so without the catch block we should not write the try block and without the try block we should not write the catch block both are the interrelated blocks both are interrelated blocks see our exceptions are categorized into three types one is checked exceptions unchecked exceptions errors right so 
so here we know that errors so all the logic errors and uh, syntax errors and as well as uh, some io errors everything comes under these errors now we have to know about this checked and unchecked exceptions checked exceptions are also called as compile time exceptions that means they will be checked at the compile time itself so compile time exceptions so these are called runtime exceptions so these are unchecked that means these are these exceptions are not checked at the compile time so these are called the runtime exceptions so example for these runtime exceptions are arithmetic exception number format exception array index out of bounds exception null pointer exception etc all these are the uh, runtime exceptions right so everything is available in throwable class so all these exceptions are available in throwable class right which is available in some lang package okay java.lang which is implicitly called by the java compiler so these are the classes available in this throwable class right these are the exceptions available in throwable class so if you want to handle the exception we have to write these exceptions as perfectly that means every first letter of every word should be in a capital letter see in the arithmetic exception e a and e are capitals right and in the number format exception n f e are the capitals array index out of bound a i o o b e all these are the capital letters in the null point exception n p e are the capital letters right so these are the exceptions so few exceptions Uh, comes under these runtime exceptions right and so let us see what is about these arithmetic exception null point exception and everything see here arithmetic exception so arithmetic exception means the basic thing is divided by zero so whenever we are performing any statement or computation which is having this divided by zero so in some a is equal to some 8 divided by zero so actually the, the output for this is nothing but infinity right so such type of such type of exception we call it arithmetic exception next null pointer exception see example i will show you null pointer exception let us take one string string str is equal to null so i am assigning some null to this str and i am trying to print and trying to print the length of the string right actually it is assigned to null and i am trying to print str dot length so in such case it is called the null pointer exception because str doesn't have any initialization but we are accessing the length of the string right so this is called the null pointer exception so everything i will show you on the system right so that your doubts will be clarified next the number format exception what is the number format exception number format exception means string str is equal to let us take one string 
hello right and if the user is trying to typecast this one right that means converting this string to integer so 5 is also a string typecasting 5 to numeric so str2 int this is possible but hello is a string if you try to typecast it to integer automatically we will get this number format exception see so int number is equal to integer dot parsing of str automatically so here we are converting the string to the number right so which is not possible hello is the string if you want to convert this hello to the number it is not possible so in such case we will get the number format exception next array index out of bounds exception right array index out of bounds exception the name itself indicates array index so here array means it consists of the elements a number of uh, elements multiple elements right so in order to access those elements that access can be done through index values right so if the index values are out of range then this type of exception will be occurred so during the initialization and declaration we have to specify the size for the array and the user is able to access the index of beyond the size then automatically this index out of bound exception will be raised see for example int some a is equal to new int some 5 so this is the just a declaration and declaration of an array so which consists of a size 5 so here we are mentioning the size as 5 so here the index values are from 0 to 4 so next statement if I am able to access or if I, I am trying to initialize some 5 or 10 or 15 to the index which is out of range that is here only the index is range from 0 to 4 here I am assigning the value for a of 6 index 6 which is out of boundary in such case this exception will be raised array index out of bound exception will be raised okay so these are the few exceptions comes under runtime exceptions these are all the runtime exceptions so in the type block we have to write the code which we are accept, uh, expecting the exceptions and in the catch block we have to write the exceptions all these exceptions we are trying to handle right so whatever the exceptions raised in the try block will be handled in the catch block and once again i am repeating this exception handling is mainly used to avoid the abnormal termination of a program if any exception is raised then automatically in the catch block that particular exception will be handled and immediately the rest of the code will be executed so in the absence of exception handling so if there is any exception raised in one statement automatically the program execution will be terminated so rest of the code will not be executed right so in order to avoid that thing we will use this exception handling so we will stop here and let us see the implementation part of all these three or all these four exceptions in the system right. hello friends so just now we have seen about the exception handling in java so as we have said that exception handling is used to handle the exceptions right so if you are having any errors in our program then automatically the code will be terminated so in order to avoid that abnormal termination of the code we will use this exception handling right so that whenever an error occurred in the program automatically that that exception will be raised and the rest of the code will be executed as, as, as usual right so for this for, for handling the exceptions we will use 
the two blocks that is try block and catch block right so that we have seen just now so let us implement that thing so without try block in the try block we have to write the code where we are expecting the exceptions and we have to write the catch block regarding the exceptions to be raised right so without try block we should not write the catch block and without catch block we should not write the try block both are interrelated right now let us implement that thing class ex then let us write some exception so in this we will write a try block because uh, we are expecting some exception here try int a is equal to some 5 divided by 0 we know this is an exception that is divided by 0 exception right right so if this we if we know the exception names so as we have discussed just now there are uh, different exceptions like array index out of bounds exception number format exception next arithmetic exception and null pointer exception and as usual uh, more number of exceptions are there so if you know the exactly what uh, what type of exceptions can be erased then we can write here directly those exceptions so here i can ex uh, expect there might be a chance of getting an arithmetic exception so here i will give arithmetic exception so these are the words we need to write as as perfectly so a and e should be capital in arithmetic exception so what whenever if there is any arithmetic exception raised in a try block then that will be assigned to e that means e will be handling that exception so if you print this one System dot out dot print ln. If you print e, automatically the exception will be printed. See uh, class except. Let us write the main function public static void main. We'll write down the ca command line arguments create an object for this one ex obj is equal to new ex sorry ex call that one obj dot display right now let us save this one except dot java yes right now let us compile this one java c except dot java see here it is compiled successfully now we can get the exception right see arithmetic exception divided by zero it was handed now most of you uh, are thinking about uh, this is just to get the error right whenever the exception is uh, uh, arised then to handle the exception we are using this exception handling actually this is used for avoiding the abnormal termination so I will show you an example if you are not having this code try block and a catch block I have kept in a comments so the same thing int a is equal to 5 divided by 0 and next I am just right system dot out dot print ln here just I, I, I would like to write that exception handled right now actually here i kept the comments for try and catch block 
so only the display method having the two lines of code that is int a is equal to 5 by 0 and exception handed now just we will see executing this one so we got an error that uh, exception arithmetic exception divided by 0 see if the same thing if the same thing that means a is equal to 5 divided by 0 is kept in the try block and after the try and catch if you write this uh, one more statement like exception handle see here only the exception will be raised and automatically the rest of the code will be also be executed so whenever the error occurred in this line automatically it will be raised to e and after the cache block whatever the code you are writing that code will be executed normally so it avoids the normal termination i mean abnormal termination right hope you understood this thing so this is the main use of implementing the exception handling concept right now so this is called the arithmetic exception and then we will see one more exception that is arrays index bound out of bound exception right index out of bound so let us create a int a is equal to new int some 5 so just I have declared an array with size 5 and I am trying to assign some value to a of 6 that means index 6. So here clearly observe the size of a is declared as 5 but I am accessing the 6th index. So here the size is 5 that means the index values will be from 0 to 4 right. Now I am accessing the 6th index which is the out of bound. Now it will be raised here. So the exception name is array index out of bounds exception. So we have to write everything perfectly. Here see A I O O B E. Everything will be capital letters. That means every character of the word is capital letter. Right. Now, the exception, whenever the exception arises, then automatically that exception will be raised and it will be passed out. See, here you can observe array index out of bound exception that is 6, that is out of bound. Right? See, if you write here other than this array out of bound, see, arithmetic exception. Right. So, here in the code we are getting the array index out of bound exception but in the catch block we are writing only arithmetic exception. Now, what is the result? So, the C. Right. If you observe here the next after the catch block the code is not executed exception handled is not executed because here exception is not handled by any other object right so here we are writing arithmetic exception but here the exception raised is array index out of bound so catch block will not handle this exception so automatically the code will be terminated so this is not executed this statement that means after the catch block statement will not be executed so if you write here array index out of bound array index out of bounds see if if you write this exception perfectly then whatever the exception raised in the try block that will be catch handled by the catch block and the rest of the code will be executed normally see here you can observe that the rest of the code is executed Hope you understood the difference, right? Let us see one more exception that is number format exception. So, string str is equal to some hello, so which is a string, and now and just typecasting this one integer dot 
percent of str right so here i have to write here int number is equal to something else right now so here we we know that str is of a string type we, we kept the string some assign some string to str and in the next line we are trying to convert this string to integer and assign to an integer variable which is not performed right here we will get the number format exception see here also every letter first letter we must be kept number format exception now again if you see that see number format exception for input string hello exception handled okay right hope you understood this one and let us see one more exception that is null pointer exception so if string is equal to null and if you are trying to print the length of the string str dot length we will get the null pointer exception so here also the first letter of every word should be capital null pointer exception here also we can see sorry yes so small spelling mistake so null pointer exception so if you execute this one so we will get a null pointer exception so here we are uh, assigning some null value to the string and we are trying to find the print the length of the string so actually the string doesn't contain any uh, value or uh, some string so still we are finding the length of the string so it will raise an exception called null pointer exception so these are the few examples for exceptions runtime exceptions as i have said just now these are all called the runtime exceptions which are handled at the runtime right so there are different types of exceptions we have seen that is checked exceptions unchecked exceptions checked exceptions are compile time exceptions unchecked exceptions are runtime exceptions so one more thing if you don't know about uh, i mean if you if you are not able to predict what type of exception is available here i mean maybe chance of getting directly you can write here exception e so automatically whatever the exception is raised that exception will be displayed null pointer exception right see in a is equal to some 5 by 0 so we know that it is an arithmetic exception right but here we are not writing any arithmetic exception here just we are writing only exception e so here also we will get arithmetic exception arithmetic exception divided by 0 so if you don't know which type of exception may be raised in the code directly we can give the customized exception that is a normal exception use the keyword exception uh, followed by e and print the e so that whatever the exception is raised in the try block that will be handled by the catch block right hope you understood this one so you can uh, up write a more number of catch catch blocks right so a single try block and more number of multiple catch blocks so multiple exceptions can be handled so whatever the exception first raised in the try block the remaining rest of the exceptions will not be raised in the try block that means so if you are having both the exceptions see int b is equal to new int of some 5 b of 6 is equal to some 3 so here two exceptions are there one is 
ఇండెక్స్ ఐ మీన్ ఆరే ఇండెక్స్ అవుట్ ఆఫ్ బౌన్స్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ దాని ద్వారా వన్ ఇస్ అర్థమెటిక్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ నౌ ఫస్ట్ వీ హ్యావ్ రిటర్న్ ద అర్థమెటిక్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ సో ఓన్లీ వన్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ విల్ బి రైజ్డ్ అండ్ ఇట్ విల్ బి డిస్ప్లేడ్ ఆన్ ద స్క్రీన్ రైట్ సో అర్థమెటిక్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ సో ఇఫ్ వన్ ఎక్సెప్షన్ ఇస్ రైజ్ దెన్ ద రెస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద కోడ్ విచ్ విచ్ ఈస్ రిటర్న్ ఇన్ ద ట్రై బ్లాక్ విల్ నాట్ బి ఎగ్జిక్యూటెడ్ so if you write this one after the see so now what is the first exception exception to be raised that is array index out of bound next exception is arithmetic exception so it will not execute the arithmetic exception that statement it will just raise the array index out of bound exception only one exception will be raised right so we have to write this try block carefully and we have to write the exceptions which we are expecting to be raised in the try block in the catch block so whatever the exceptions raised in try block will be handled by the catch block right once again i am repeating the exception handling is used to raise an exception and handle the exception and avoid the abnormal termination of a program right so it will handle the exception and the rest of the code will be executed as usual now what actually the packages will be having so these packages will be having the different classes and interfaces so classes and interfaces will be available in the packages right so so far we have seen different packages just like uh, java dot util package right so in this package there is a class called a scanner class which we are using for reading the input from the console right so scanner class is available in this package similarly java dot io dot star that means io package from this we have seen buffer reader class buffer reader class so in this scanner class we have access to different methods called next int next to float etc right so we are not writing any logic for these methods but we are using these methods in our program here also in the buffer reader we have used different methods called read read line right so these are the different methods available in for in the buffer reader here also we are not writing any logic for this read and read line but we are using this read and read line by implementing by creating an object of this buffer reader which is available in io similarly we can create this type of classes and we can place in the package user defined package hope you understood these type of classes we can create and these classes can be pushed into the package called a user defined package that means we will create our own package and we can uh, move these type of classes into the package so that we can avoid the implementation and but we can directly use the methods of this particular class in another program right so let us see that uh, procedure so that's why we call it as a user defined package that means we are creating a package and uh, we are keeping the classes in the package right so for this user defined package keyword should be used is package small letters everything in small letters so package followed by the syntax for creation of packages package followed by package name call right so this should be written in a class which we want to move into this package right now let us write the program here package oh sorry one more point 
so whatever the package we are creating and what whatever the class we want to uh, move create in this package it should not contain main class that means whatever the class we are creating for this package should not contain the main function multiple programs should be written for placing multiple classes in same package right so in the same package we can have a multiple classes but for creating a multiple classes in the user defined package we have to write a multiple programs with the same package name so you you have to remember these three points first one is keyword is a package and second one is whatever the class we want to keep on this package should not contain the main class and the third one is if you want to keep a multiple values or multiple classes in the package then we have to write multiple programs with the same package name so this you will understand by writing the program let us see the example see package pack our package name is pack let us let us uh, assume that next i am writing a class some a in that i am writing one method oh, sorry it's my class void show system dot out dot print ln a class right so here we are not writing any main function here we are not writing any main function right so this is the pack program i mean package creation of a package now we have to write the main function in which we want to import this package right so this is one program save it as a dot java so this is important because our class name is a a dot java now we have to write a one more program in which we have to write the main function and which in which we have to import this a class so first one import what is the class and what is the package pack is a package name a is a class so import pack dot a just like import java dot util dot star we are writing we are writing java dot util dot star here util is a package and star means whatever the classes available in this util package everything can be imported right similarly import package name dot class here we can write Oh, sorry create a class main demo next public static void main string arguments now we can directly create an object for this class we need not write everything we can create an object for this class obj is equal to new a and from that object we can directly access this method so obj dot show this is our program and here we save this program as main demo dot java right 
so we are writing two different programs right? in the first one we are writing a package another one we are importing that particular package right so first we have to create a package so for this we have to compile this program so uh, don't go confused here here a dot java is not having any main function it is used for creating a package here main demo dot java is an actual program where we are writing the main function now whenever we want to create this package we have to compile this one compile so what is the syntax for compilation java c actually we will write the java c followed by the file name dot java but here we want to create a package first so for creation of a package we have to write hyphen d d is for directory so this hyphen d will create a directory with the given package name where it will be created dot dot means current working directory if you place here dot the in the current working directory the, the folder will be created with the name pack right otherwise somewhere else if you want to create a package folder then here we have to mention the location where we want to create a folder followed by this file name dot java now see the importance of this statement Actually, Java C followed by in the absence of this one, Java C A dot Java means it will create a dot class file. That means A dot class will be created. Here we are creating a package, user defined package. So Java C hyphen D hyphen D means directory. It will create a directory with a name of given package in the current working directory, and it will be having the dot class file of the given file name. That means one folder will be created so pack the folder will be created in this folder so this is a folder right so folder will be created in this folder the dot class file will be there a dot class now in this program we are importing the pack that is a package dot a that means this a dot class here we are inputting in the main function we are creating an object for the a so that an object is created and we are directly calling the method of this class which is written in package so here we are not writing any program for show right we are making use of the show method which is written in class a which is available in user defined package pack so here the compilation is normal so java c main demo dot java followed by execution java main demo so this statement will directly execute this one a class will be printed so hope you understood this is for creation of a package this is for importing the user defined package which is created just earlier and now the statement is if you want to create a multiple classes in the same folder for example i want to create a b dot class file also so we should not write a both the classes in the same program right so here we are writing only one class if you write another class followed by this class only one class will be saved in the folder because after executing this one only the file name dot class file will be generated so file name will be any one of this class and here one more important thing is if you want to access the class in another program another package the specifier must be public so this is most important so also the method this is most important if you fail to specify this access specifier you cannot access this class you cannot access the method so for that we have to use the access specifier public right coming to the our uh, general discussion so if you want to create a multiple classes we have to create 
these type of programs in a multiple way. So let it be, this is a class A program. Create one more program with class B. Let us write here display. Right? So this is what again save this with b dot java. Save this as b dot java. Now hyphen d b dot java. So here the same package. Package name is same. So the same b dot class file will be stored in package. Now you can use here b obj2 is equal to new b. Here we can write obj2 dot display. So automatically it will access the show method of a display method of b because a and b are the classes available in pack. So here we can write pack dot star so that whatever the classes available in the pack can be accessed here. Right? Hope you understood this one. Don't get confused. If you want to keep a more number of class files in the same package, create a multiple programs without writing any main function and save by using this command so that all the class files will be generated in the same package. Right? So hope you understood this one. So whenever we are creating a user defined package, then only we have to execute this hyphen d and dot. If you are writing a main class, we need not write, we need not execute this one. So this is meant for creating a folder with a given package name and to store the dot class files. And this package name should be imported in our program itself. Hope you understood. Right. So let us see the implementation part of this one in the system. Hello friends. Just now we have seen how to create a user defined package and how to import that package into another program. Now let us see the implementation part. So as we have discussed just now, we have to create a package first and then we have to compile that package so that a folder with the package name will be created and whatever the class we are giving in that package, that dot class file will be generated in, the, in that particular uh, package folder. Then we have to write a program and in that program we can import that particular class. Let us see that. Let us write uh, a package. As I have said that uh, in the package, we should not write any main function, just we have to write a class. We have to define a class. First, package is a keyword to create a package. I am creating a package called pack. Package pack. So how our package name is pack. Now I am writing a class called uh, that is so this should be public specifier so it can be accessed in any program public class some show oh sorry public class pack demo write down the function public void show just we can uh, print uh, something dot, out dot. print ln welcome to java right so this is the just a class we have created a pack demo in that pack demo, we have created some method. We have, we have written a method and everything is comes under the package pack. Now let us save this with a class name. P pack demo dot Java. Let's override it. Now here our package name is pack. You can observe in the folder, there is no folder called pack. There is a IPAC. So let uh, I will just delete it. There is there will be no confusion at all. 
see so there there is no folder with a name pack right now first we have to compile this see for compiling the package i have tell that java c hyphen d hyphen d it stands for directory so it will create one directory dot dot represents the current working directory so where the folder should be created so the folder should be created in the current working directory so dot i have mentioned followed by class name dot java so pack demo dot java right successfully compiled now you can observe the pack a folder pack right earlier it was missing now after compilation we, have, we can see this pack inside we can see the pack demo dot class right now the dot class file is ready and we can import this package in another program and we can use the object for this particular class let us see that one let us create a one more program let us write one more program so here we have to import our pack dot what is the class class name pack demo right i have imported the pack which is a uh, user defined package in that package pack demo class is there i am importing that particular class now class pack1 public static void main arguments we can use the pack demo class directly pack demo just to create an object for that new pack demo by using this object directly we can call the method of pack demo show show is a method we have written right now save this file with the file name pack one dot java just yes, override it and we will execute this one java c pack one dot java cannot find the symbol obj dot show right yes in show we have written capital s right the capital s java c pack one dot java yes now let us execute this one so that we can get the text which we have written in pack demo dot class which is imported in pack one dot java hope you understood this one so initially we have created one package with name pack in that pack we have created one class pack demo in that class we have created one method show in that we have just printed some text and we are not writing any main function in this package user defined package creation right so in the main function is written in in, in the class where we are importing that particular package here we are importing the package import pack pack demo pack one so here from here we can access the methods of that particular class hope you understood this one right so let us see one more example a simple example factorial right so let us close everything right let us create one package so if you want to create a more number of classes in one package you have to write a different programs with the same package name because in one package program we should not write more than one class right so we have to write if, if you want to create four classes in a same package write a four classes in different programs with the giving same package name so the dot class files of every class will be saved in that particular folder itself so that we can access the different classes from the package right now let us see i am creating one more class factorial in the package pack i think we have created this packet right 
pack class factorial here let us write the factorial code so public void fact int f is equal to 1 for i sorry int i is equal to 1 i less than or equal to n i plus plus so let us take n has okay n no problem let us pass the n here in the n okay right what we have to do fact f into is equal to i let us print this one system dot out dot print ln factorial of n is Hope you understood this is a simple logic we have written in a factorial class we are not writing any main function here and this dot class file will be saved in the package pack which is a user defined package now save this one by using the class name factorial dot java yes so write it so this should be a public okay the classes and methods which we are accessing from another package that should be a public access specifier now let us create uh, let us compile the package java c hyphen d dot factorial dot java so this step is used for creating a dot class file for that particular class see right now dot class file has been created in the package pack so if you observe here two classes pack demo just before we have created and now factorial dot class now let us create a one more program just we can write uh, one more program importing the same pack dot factorial class import pack dot factorial class here we can write class factorial main public static void main string arguments some arguments command line arguments now here we can directly create a object for a factorial class right factorial obj is equal to new factorial here we can call a function object dot fact I think we have written the function fact okay fact and here we have to pass the value 5 let it be 5 right now let us save this factorial main dot java now we are we have to compile and execute this one this particular one java c factorial main dot java java factorial main right the factorial of 5 is 120 it is displaying the result so here we are not writing any code in the main function just we are using the class which is available in user defined package right and if you also import the pack demo pack dot pack demo you can also access the thing same thing pack demo obj1 is equal to new pack demo obj1 dot show just a compile and execute this one 
so we can access both one right so first one is the dot class file of a factorial class and welcome dot java is a text written in pack demo class hope you understood this one right right so if you want to read the value from the keyboard just you can use a scanner class here and uh, uh, read the n scanner c is equal to new scanner system dot out dot println enter the value of n right now sc dot next int and n is equal to you pass here n value and for scanner class we have to import util dot star and here we have to pass the i was string system dot in right now execute this one oh sorry sorry right Oh, sorry i'm extremely sorry for that right now factorial main so enter the value of n if you give here 6 the factorial of 6 is 720 right so this is the program where we are not writing any logic for the factorial pro factorial class but we are using the factorial class from the user defined package right hope you understood this one right a simple user defined packages so first we have to compile the package if you are writing see if you are writing this package keyword this particular class file should be compiled by using hyphen d so what is this java c hyphen d hyphen d means directory to create a directory dot dot is for current working directory where we have to create a directory is dot that means current working directory then create the i mean give the class name dot java so this should be executed so after executing this the particular package folder will be created in the current working directory and in that current working directory that particular dot class file will be generated right hope you understood this one right First of all, let us see what is meant by thread and what is meant by process. So process is a program with multiple threads. See, program with multiple threads. Whereas thread is it's an individual unit of a program.
right? So a thread is an individual part of a running program, whereas a process is a multiple threads of a program. That means program will be having a multiple threads. Right? Thread 1, thread 2, thread 3, thread 4. This complete we call it as a program. And individual part, this is called a thread. Right? Now, let us see the difference between multi-threading and multi-tasking. Multitasking Multi-threading So first one, just we have seen the definition The execution of running program is called multitasking individual part of a program is a multi-threading so we can simply say this is a program so this is t1 t2 t3 and the same program consists of even this is called an individual thread right second the second thing each program has its own address space all right so every program will be having a different address space but here we said that a thread is an individual part of a program, so multiple threads may share common address space because we know that a program is a collection of multiple threads. That's why this is called. Heavyweight process, and this is called lightweight process. And here we can say context switching is high cost. Context switching means switching from one process to another process, right? If one process comes uh, with a higher priority, the another process will be in a block state or a waiting state. So that, that type of uh, switching, we call it as a context switching. So here, each and every program has its own address space. So this type of switching will be high cost. And here we say that Multiple threads may share the common address space. So, the switching between the threads will be very easy. So, that's why we can say context switching is low and very simple. Next. Similarly, inter-process communication. is high expensive or is expensive okay. is expensive and here inter thread communication here we should not write as inter process inter thread so within the same program multiple threads will be there so inter thread communication is inexpensive right 
So the same thing here each and every program will share the common address space so that's why here the interprocess communication that means if, if one process wants to communicate with another process so both are both are having with say different address space so it is somewhat expensive and coming to this multiple threads may share the common address space so communication between those threads may be inexpensive and multitasking is not under control of java and here there is a concept called threads so there is a class called a thread so that's why it is it can be controlled up controlling java right under control of java it it is not control under control of java here itself so this is a, a difference between multi threading and multi tasking now our java supports this multi threading concept right so in the next session we will start this thread concept so what is the thread life cycle and then we will see uh, the different methods available in thread thread class and then we will see how to implement the thread class i mean i mean how to implement a thread and uh, how to implement the multiple threads as well as how to uh, achieve the thread synchronization right so as we have discussed in the previous session a thread is a lightweight process and it is an individual part of a running program so a group of threads will combinedly call it as a program right so all these threads will be working concurrently then now here a thread is also having a life cycle so how the thread is created how it will be processed and how it will be terminated so everything will be done in a number of states so that's we call it as a life cycle states now let us see the thread life cycle so whenever a thread is created that will be in a new state whenever a thread is created so here in java a thread is a class right so we know that a class consists of a number of methods variables constructors and so on right so here also a thread class consists of a number of methods so in order to access those methods of a thread first we have to create an object for a thread that we call it as a thread so that creation after that creation of that object then the thread will be in this new state new born state next immediately after the newborn state there is another state called runnable runnable state so runnable state means ready to run if the thread is ready to execute its task then it will be in runnable state so we can say it as ready to run or we can say it is waiting for a processor right next if processor is, processor is available then it will be moved to the running state i mean if the processor is i mean the, uh, this thread is allocated to the processor then this thread will be started its execution so that state we call it as a running state that means thread is under execution in this running state if there is any io interruptions or any other type of interruptions uh, occurred during the running state then the thread will move on to the waiting or block
waiting or block could stick right so once the thread is under the control of a processor if there is any interruption in terms of io or any any other interruptions may occur so if in, in such conditions the thread will be moved to the blocked or waiting state so that the processor will uh, take over the i mean it it the processor will start executing another thread right so after the waiting or blocked state after completion of this io event after completion of the uh, uh, interruptions again it will move on to the sorry right it will move to the running state or it may move to the runnable state right if processor is, processor is busy it will move to the runnable state if processor is available it will move to the running state next if there is no interruption occurs and after completion of the process execution it will move to the stop state that means this is the termination right termination so here we are having around the five states so thread life cycle will be having five states so thread uh, from the creation and uh, up to the termination it will move in five different states so whenever the thread is created it will be in new state whenever the thread is ready to execute its task it will it will be moved to the runnable state and whenever the processor is available and the thread is uh, allocated to the processor it will move to the running state and if there is any no interruptions then it will automatically after completion of this process it will move to the stop state and if there is any io interruptions or any other kind of in interruptions occurs then it will be moved to the waiting state or a blocked state so after completion of io interruption it will again move to the runnable state or running state right so here a thread is having a number of methods the thread class will having a number of methods so by accessing those methods this thread will be changing these states so here thread t is equal to new thread so after this statement we know the statement so this statement is creation of object for a class right so here we know that thread is a class so we are creating an object for a thread automatically that will be in new state after that t dot start there is a method called t dot start so here the thread always starts its process from the start method right so whenever we call this start method then the thread which is in new state will be moved to the runnable state and automatically and implicitly run command will be executed that means a run method will be executed t dot run so whenever this t dot start is executed implicitly it will be calling this run method so whenever the run method is called the program which is in runnable state will be going to running state and whenever i use a t dot sleep or t dot wait it will move to the waiting or a blocked state and here after the interval expires so here we will pass some parameter like milliseconds so how many is in milliseconds the thread should be in waiting state so after completion of that interval automatically again it will move to the running state and here after completion of this task it will execute the stop method stop method right so thread t is equal to new thread which is in new state immediately t dot start will be executed that is a start method and all these methods start run sleep wait stop all these methods are of thread class right so apart from these methods there are a number of methods available in thread class so we will see the, all those methods in the next session right so how we understood this one the thread will be available in five different states 
so based upon the method called or uh, it will move the one state to another it will move from one state to another right so this is a simple concept of a thread We will see the implementation of a single thread. So a thread can be implemented in two different ways. One is using inheritance second one is using interfaces. that is a runnable interface right so first one we will see with the using inheritance so that means there is a class called thread class there is a class called thread class so whatever the program we are writing that will extend this thread class so first we will see this one so if you write any class right class uh, class some single thread it should extends the thread class extends thread so there is a class called a thread class thread right so here see this one is a derived class and this one is a base class so here a single thread is a derived class of a thread class now we know that from the inheritance concept if you create an object for this derived class with the help of that derived class object we can access the variables and methods of the base class also we may access or may not access right so we may access now here a thread class consists of different methods so it consists of different methods so there are different methods available in this thread class so we'll see one by one in the next sessions right so in that method every thread class or every thread will be started its processing by calling the function called start start function from the start function itself a thread will be starting its process executing its process and this start function so this means thread starts execution by calling this start function and this start function will implicitly calls the run function see so implicitly calls the run function right so here we, we have to observe that the start run and everything are in thread class so we are accessing these methods or these functions with the derived class object we have to create a derived class object and through the derived class object we will access this start and run so whatever the thread process we have to execute that should be written in this run run function so whatever the process we want to execute under the thread that should be written in run that means we are overriding the run function right so run function is already available in thread and here we are writing our own logic in this run function that means we are overriding this run function of a thread class in the derived class right so in the main function we have to call this start we have to call the start and implicitly that will cause the run function see let us write a simple thing so that you will be understood first we will see with the inheritance concept so class let it be a single 
so we are creating a single thread right single extends thread so thread is a class already available class here we have to write the run function because whatever the process we want to execute under the thread that should be written in write run function so run function is the overriding function so public void so the, the scope and the parameters everything should be same in both the derived and base class so the syntax for this run is this one right here we have to write the logic whatever the logic you can write you, you can write here simply we can write system dot out dot print ln thread okay close the thing now write the main function so we can write the main function we have to create one more thing so single thread class single thread now in this one we have to write the main function public static void main arguments here we have to create an object for the derived class so single some s is equal to new single see here s is an object so we can write anything s t o b j whatever it may be right so now with the help of this object we have to call the start function so yes dot sorry s dot start so whenever the function calls this start function it will implicitly calls the run function so automatically it will calls this run function it will display thread as output not only the system dot out dot print ln we can write our logic in the run function right see here we can use some for loop some i int i is equal to 0 some i less than 5 i plus plus and instead of writing the all the thread we can directly print i so that the output will be 0 1 2 3 4 because less than 5 so it's a 4 1 2 3 4 right so whatever the logic we want to execute under the thread that should be written in run that means overridden function that should be remembered run is a overridden function now so hope you understood this one implementation of a thread using the inheritance now let us see using interface so interface also the logic is same so there also the thread process starts with the start function and the start function implicitly calls the run function and whatever the logic we want to write under the thread should be written in run function there also run will be the overridden function but the implementation is slightly different so here we are inheriting the thread but in the second process we will implement the run runnable interface so we know that interface is consists of abstract methods so in the previous sessions we have seen interface is just it, it, it will be having a function declarations but not the definitions so here we will write the function definition uh, definitions see let us start writing this one the second case instead of extends this thread it will implements runnable there is an interface name called runnable which executes the thread so here first we have to create an object but this doesn't execute the run function so this will this must be passed as a parameter to the interface i mean thread class see thread some t is equal to new thread of yes now we can write yes dot oh sorry, sorry. now we can implement this t dot start hope you understood this one the remaining is same so whatever the logic we have we want to write that will be written in a run function and we have to create an object for this derived class but here we are implementing the runnable interface so we have to pass that runnable interface object 
as a parameter to the thread class. So that reference will be assigned to t. So t dot star, it will all implicitly calls the run function and it will be executed. So the output will be again same 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So these are the two methods to implement a single thread. Right? So first one is inheritance, second one is interface. Interface means only function declarations but not the definitions. Here we will write the run function and then we will pass the uh, object to the as a parameter to the thread class. So hope you understood this simple implementation of a thread. So now let us stop here and we will see this implementation of a thread using the inheritance and the interface in the system and then we will wind up. In the next session we will see the methods of a thread class. So there are several methods available in a thread class. So that we will see and then followed by the multiple threads, how to create a multiple threads. So here just we are creating a single thread. right? So the problem arises when there will be a multiple threads. So which one will be executed first and which one will be executed next. So that question rises in the multi-threading multi concept. So let us wind up here. Now let's, let us see the implementation part of this single thread using the inheritance and interface in the system. Hello friends. So just now we have seen the implementation of a single thread. So a thread can be implemented using in two ways. One is with the help of inheritance. Another one is with the help of interface. So we'll see the two programs for creating a single thread. That means implementing using the inheritance as well as in implementing using the interface. Right. Now let us go with the inheritance. Yes. Right. So let us import the statements next. Let us write a class called a single thread. Which extends thread class. So as we have discussed just uh, just now that uh, every class should be extending the thread class. Now everything should be written in run command and run method. So run method is a one of the uh, life cycle method of a thread which is implicitly called by the start function of a thread. And run is a overriding method. So run is available in thread and so we are overriding the same run function here itself. Now, see I am just printing the i value. And now I will create a main main class, so single thread. I'll write down the main function arguments. Now create an object for that single thread. Single t is equal to new single now as we have discussed just now that every thread will be started its execution from the start function so we, we have seen the life cycle in this previous session so the first first method should be called is start so whenever the object dot start is executed automatically the thread the, the it will implicitly calls the run function in a thread class so here we are we are overriding the run function in the single class so whenever the uh, the pointer executes this t dot start that automatically implicitly it will execute the run command i mean run method which is written in class single see so this is the creation of a single thread using inheritance concept so let us Save this one st dot java 
save these programs in threads concept st dot java now let us execute this one java c st dot java right so there is a lot of mistakes okay we have not uh, declared this variable so simply we can write it int i yes now execute here yes the compilation is successful now execute this one st dot java sorry java st see we can observe here 0 1 2 3 4 5 so coming to the program we are just creating an object for the class which extend the thread class and with the object we are calling the method of a thread class so we know that in the inheritance from the derived class object we can access both the derived class and a um, base class methods so here the start stop uh, sorry start run sleep uh, there were there are different commands available in a thread class so by using the child object that is a single class object t we are just calling the start function so here in the thread concept t dot start it implements uh, i mean the after the, uh, after executing this statement the thread uh, the thread will automatically executes the run function so here we are overriding the run function so thread class is also having a run function but here we are overriding the run function in class derived class which extends the thread right so as we have as we know that any program will start ex its execution from the main function so here it will come here automatically a single t it will search for the constructor single so there is no constructor just leave it object is created t dot start so automatically implicitly run function will be executed so run function is this one so i is equal to 0 i less than or equal to 5 i plus plus system dot out on print ln i so it obviously it displays 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 right here not we are not calling this run function but still we are executing the program that means t dot start will implicitly calls this run function right so hope you understood this one this is the implementation of a single thread using inheritance concept that means here we are using extent now we will see the single thread using interface see right so here we will write single implements because we are uh, uh, implementing the interfaces so interface execution will be done by using the implement keyword so single implements runnable interface so as we have discussed just now there will be a runnable interface for thread implementation so we have to implement this runnable now write the same thing public void run so overriding method so for int i is equal to 0 i less than or equal to 5 i plus plus then again system dot out dot print ln i close this one right now create a main class thing str single thread runnable write down the main function public static void main arguments Right. now here we have to create an object for this class so single t is equal to or s is equal to new single but this is the object which implements the runnable interface now we have to create a thread class thread t is equal to new thread of you have to pass the object of this runnable interface to the thread class now we can start it hope you understood this one right so as it is a runnable interface we have to create a thread class and we have to pass the object of the class 
to the thread class. See, in the first step, we are creating an object for the runnable interface class. And in the second line, we are uh, passing the same object as a parameter to the thread class. Right? So here, t object, t is the thread class object. By using the thread class object, we are just implementing the calling the start function. This implicitly calls the run function of the thread and this code will be executed. Now let us see this one. str. Java. str dot java right java str see here also we can observe the output that is 0 1 2 3 4 5 so this happens because we are creating an object for the runnable interface class and then we are passing this object to the thread class and through this thread object, we are just applying the, I mean, we are just calling the start function, which implicitly calls the run function. So, here also, just a start function, our thread will be starting with the start function. It implicitly calls the run function. The first step is start, second step is run. Right? So, hope you understood this one. So, in the previous one, we are implementing the single thread using inheritance that means extends the thread class directly the, the derived class extends the thread class so there we can create an object for the derived class and from the object we can call the start function whereas here we are the the class which implements the runnable interface we have to create an object for that and we have to pass that object to the thread class So here, thread is a class, so a class can consist of a different methods. So here the thread is also having a different methods. And whatever the program we are writing, so we have to create a class which extends this thread. Right? So whatever the classes we are writing, all the classes are the derived classes of this thread. So if you create an object for that particular class, by using that object, we can access the methods of this thread. So we have completed the inheritance concept, right? So in the inheritance concept, if any class is derived from the base class, the object of the derived class can access the both the methods and the variables of derived class as well as the base class. The same concept here. So thread is a base class. From that base class, we are deriving our own classes. So we can implement the methods in the derived classes. See. So, in this, the first and foremost method is start method. Start method. So, here the thread execution will start from this method itself. So, unless you start, you implement this start method, the thread will not be started. Right? So, immediately the next one is run method. Run. So, run method is implicitly called by the start method so this is implicitly called by start right so we need not write this run method automatically if you start the thread automatically it will call this run method next so there is a method called sleep It will take one parameter as an argument. So that is a milliseconds. So sleep, the name itself indicates. So the thread will be suspended up to the given milliseconds. So we have to give the milliseconds as a parameter. So that much time the thread will be suspended. So suspends the thread. for given milliseconds of time. So here, remember, it is in milliseconds. And one more thing for this sleep, 
is it may throw an exception so we should write this sleep method in try and catch block try and catch block right. two points to be remembered under this sleep method similarly there is a one more method called join join so join is used to wait for the thread until it completes its termination so whatever the thread th th this thread is mainly used for multiple threads so uh, i mean the understanding of this thread will be useful when you are implementing the multiple threads so if you are multi implementing two threads and if you apply this join for one thread the second thread has to wait until the first thread has to be, is to be completed completing its process so this process you will be seeing in the system while executing the program right you can understand clearly so if you take the two, two threads so if one thread is given the join method the next thread has to wait until this first thread completes its execution right so complete uh, implementation i will show you so that your doubts will be clarified so this is for this is also we have writing try and catch blocks so this waits the thread to complete its process right? used in multi-threading so in the single thread we can't do anything so in the multi-threading we can observe the changes and here also this also we have to write in try and catch block so three things we have to remember for join next get id get id so get id is used to return the id of the particular thread it gives the id of a thread so every thread will be having a unique id and it will retrieve that particular id and one more thing this sleep is a static method so this is a static method this is also a static method so we did not create an object for calling this sleep method and join method directly by using the thread class we can access this sleep method and join method right so directly we can call it as thread dot sleep of milliseconds so we did not create an object for a thread for calling this sleep or join both are the static methods right next get name so get name method it will return the name of a thread so the name of a thread always starts from zero just like our array indexes right so here the thread thread number will always start from zero if you create one thread the thread name will be thread zero if you create two threads the thread names will be thread zero thread one if you create a three threads then then the names will be thread zero one two so always start from zero right so it gives thread name and always starts from thread zero and so on if you create two threads thread one thread two and so on right get name so if you use this get name automatically it will return thread zero if it is a single thread now you can change the name of a thread right so we can change the name of a thread by using the method called set name and here we have to pass the string as an argument so here thread name will be replaced with given string given string so here 
we have to pass one argument as a parameter i mean one parameter as an argument that is a string and this name will be assigned to the thread name so immediately after applying this set name if you again use this get name automatically this thread zero will be replaced with the string name so you can observe while implementing this thread methods in the system right so i will show you everything so these are the few methods start run sleep join get id get name set name hope you understood this one next The next one is grid priority. So every thread will be having its own priority. So uh, the priority values ranges from one to ten. One to ten. So the minimum priority. is one normal priority is five and a maximum priority will be 10 right one five and 10 by default the priority of every thread will be this one so by default the priority of every thread will be five so it will return the priority of a thread that means it will return 5 right so we can set the priority right we can change the priority so that can be done by using the method called set priority right so set priority is used to set the priority that means change the priority we can change the priority in between 1 to 10 by default it will be 5 so here it it takes one parameter as an argument that is integer the integer ranges from 0 sorry 1 to 10 right 1 to 10 so if you write here set priority of 10 automatically the priority of the thread will be set to 10 that means highest priority so here one thing should be remembered that we can't predict which prior, which thread is going to be executed first even though there is a priorities so our system will run a thousands of threads so we can't predict directly that which thread will be going to be executed first right so but there will be a priority for every thread so here in this way we can change the priority and there is one more method called is alive is alive is alive method is used to give the status of the thread if it is a running thread it will return true if the thread completes its execution it will return false that means it will return true or false that means a boolean statement it returns a boolean value true if thread is still running it return false if thread completes its execution right so it is a boolean result okay so for for accessing all these methods first we have to create an object for a thread and then we have to call these methods and once again we have to remember that these are the methods and we have to recall the naming conventions so as it is a method the first character of first word should be small and the first character of next words should be capital see set priority set yes is a small p is a capital is alive i is a small a is capital right so we have to recall all the previous concepts so these are all the methods of a thread class so here we have seen start run sleep join get id get name set name get priority set priority and is alive among all these methods the 
sleep and join are the static methods so we need not create an object for calling these static methods directly by using the thread class we can access those methods and then the sleep method and a join method should be written in try and catch blocks so that is most important so th these methods may throw the exceptions so we have to write these two functions that is join and sleep in try and catch block and one more thing we have to remember that every class is a derived class from a thread class so if you want to implement this threads concept we have to create a class which extends the thread and in the main class we have to create an object for that particular der derived thread and by using that derived thread we have to access all these methods right so now let us see the implementation of all these methods in the system hello friends so just now we have seen uh, various methods of a thread class now we will see the implementation part so what's the use of all these threads how these threads will be these methods will be implemented right so for that we will create one thread and then we will see one by one the methods so class th extends thread so in this we have to write the run method public void run so run is a overriding method so here we have to write the logic which we want to run as a thread so for int i is equal to 0 just we will write one loop so less than or equal to 5 i plus plus and we will just print that uh, thing system dot out dot print ln i right right let's close the thread now just create one class for the main function so t methods so public static void main uh, arguments right now let us create one object for the given class th is equal to new th let us start this one right so this we have seen in the previous session just creation of uh, one thread so we know that uh, that means we have already seen two methods of a thread that is start and run so start means every thread every thread will starts its execution from the start method so whenever we call the start method implicitly the thread will call the run method so automatically if you execute this t1.start implicitly this run method will be executed so in the run method we are just writing the a loop and we are printing the i value so just we will save it and we will check it out t methods all right t methods dot java so I, I have saved this one and now let us execute this one t methods dot java so after successful compilation we have to execute this one so t methods is thread methods right java t methods see you can observe here 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 so here we are not uh, calling this run function so by default if you create a thread object for a thread t1 if you call the start method or it implicitly calls the run method right here t1 is a thread object th is a class which extends the thread right so hope you understood this one right now let us see the methods so first one uh, let us see the id get id so we can so system dot out dot print ln so let us print id id is equal to t1 dot get id so it will return the id of the thread t so let us execute this one right 
so id is equal to 8 right so here the thread id is 8 now let us check it out with a name print ln name of thread is plus what is the function object dot get name right so get name function is used to retrieve the name of a thread okay. right name of the thread is thread zero as we have discussed just now the name of the threads will always start from zero so if name of if one thread is created then that name will be thread zero if two threads are created the names for those threads is thread zero and thread one so similarly third thread thread two so here only one thread is there so the name of the that thread is thread zero we can also change the name of a thread by using the name i mean the function set name so object dot set name you can give here the thread let it be sandeep so thread name is sandeep now again we will call the same statement and we will see this see name of the thread after changing its name right after changing its name now let us see this one right name of the thread after changing its name is sandeep right see get id it just prints the id of the thread next get name so get name of the thread is thread zero next statement we are setting the name right we are we can set our own names right? user defined name so any name can be assigned so i have assigned sandeep as a thread name so it doesn't return anything just it will change the thread name in the next step i am just implementing again the get name that means i am again retrieving the name after changing this one so name of a thread after changing its name is sandeep after after changing its name is sandeep and followed by t1 dot start automatically run will be there next one more function we have seen that is sleep function so sleep function is a static function so we can call that method sleep method by using the thread class directly so we, we can use both the object as well as the class name right so here one thing is we have to write this in a try block so it, there might be a chance of getting an exception so we have to write in a try catch block so only two methods are there for this threads which has to be written in try catch block that is sleep and join so wherever you want to write the sleep function that should be written in try and catch block now let us see this one try so we can directly implement by using the thread class thread dot sleep we have to pass a parameter in a milliseconds so that much time it will be suspended so close catch exception e so keep it the empty empty block okay right now let us see every time thousand milliseconds it will be waiting the thread will be waiting for thousand milliseconds see if you execute this one so after every thousand milliseconds the thread will be executed so 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 right hope you understood this one so sleep is a static method so it can be called by using the method name or the class name so here the problem is if you are writing the sleep method in this run method the object here we can't access this object in the th class right so that's why whenever we are creating a start automatically the object reference will be going to the run method so here we can use a current thread so here we can write thread t1 or thread t is equal to current thread so current thread is used to give an object reference right so here 
whatever the thread it implements this run method that thread object will be created to t initialized to t here instead of writing thread you can implement t dot skip right see right so here also id name name of the thread after changing so after every 1000 milliseconds it will be executed right so if you are not using this one and if you are using just a t1 which is the object for th which is the object for th if you execute this one the scope of this object doesn't available in run so it cannot find symbol variable t1 so for this whatever the function we are using here whatever the thread we are using here that reference will be sent to an thread object t and by using that thread object we can call the skip function right ph methods java t methods right so next priority so every thread will be having a priority so let us see the priority of this thread first let us see the priority so priorities are range from 1 to 10 1 is the minimum priority and 10 is the maximum priority and the normal priority is a 5 and every thread will be having by default it's a 5 as a priority now let us see this one so priority of thread is t1 dot get priority so we can get this priority here id is equal to 8 so here we can see priority of thread is 5 so by default every thread will be having a 5 as a priority now let us change the priority we can change the priority by using set priority method so t1 dot set priority so we can change the low priority right and we can write the same thing so we can write the same thing here priority of a thread after changing right now the priority has been set to 1 that means a low priority see you can observe here priority of a thread after changing is 1 so you can also set to maximum priority if you place here 10 sorry if you place here 10 we will get the 10 as a priority change of priority see here the priority of a thread changing is 10 so we can predict so which thread has will be executing first and which thread will be executing next because our system will handle a number of threads thousands of threads so among those thousands of threads we can't predict which thread is going to be executed first and then next right so this is all about this priorities now there is a one more function called join so this join function is used to used in multi threading right so whenever we create uh, multiple threads then we can use this join method so this join method is used to uh, to wait the pro uh, wait the thread to be terminated right so if you join one thread and the other threads will wait until that first thread will be terminated so let us see this one so th let us create one more object t2 is equal to new th so t2 is one more right so here t1 dot start t2 dot start so two threads will be running here so whenever the t1 dot start is executed automatically that particular object will be assigned to t and that will be executed whenever t2 dot start is executed then that object current object current thread will give the object of that current thread so that will be assigned to t right so that's why we are generalizing the statement so otherwise if you are failed to write this statement we have to write the two methods so here we have to write t1 extends thread t2 extends thread so instead of writing two times we can simply write one run method and we can call this run method multiple times and in order to execute the thread so we can assign the current thread to one object and from by using that object we can call all the methods 
see so just i have created two objects for the same class t1 t2 so t1 dot start t2 dot start so let, let, let me give the comments for all these things right see you can observe here see 00112233445 so that means two threads are running so every thread is running with 1 milli, about 1000 milliseconds of time so because we are giving 1000 milliseconds as a parameter to the sleep function right next let us create a join method here i mean let us use the join method here so that we can use this one so as i have said that two methods that is join and sleep must be written in try and catch blocks so try so t1 dot join catch exception e give the blank body so see i am joining the t1 so that the t2 will be waiting until the t1 gets the process completed so let us see this one right sorry just we have modified the code so first we have to compile this one right right compile now see 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 and now the second thread will be started so previously in the absence of this join two threads are running parallelly but after getting this join so we are joining the thread t1 so t2 will be waiting until the t2 t1 gets its completion so hope you understood this one right see right and one more function we have to see that is alive is alive that means uh, whether the thread is in running state or dead state so we will keep here system dot out dot print ln thread status so t dot is alive so just remember here we are using only t but not t1 because the object of t t1 will be assigned to t so here we have to call t dot is alive now it, it is a boolean result so it will give true if it is a running state if it is not in a running state it will return false so thread state is true because it is running so 0 1 2 3 4 and a 5 thread status is true because the, the second thread has been started here see here we can write here let us see the here system dot out dot print ln thread thread 1 status t1 dot is alive let us execute this one first let us compile and then let us see so thread 1 is true now after completion of the thread thread 1 status is false because thread 1 is already executed it, it completes its execution because 0 1 2 3 4 5 after completion of thread 1 so here we are giving thread 1 t1 dot is alive so after finishing this thread automatically it will be false that means it completes its execution so it returns false if you give here t2 dot alive automatically it will return true because t2 is about to start right so hope you understood this one so we have seen a different methods of a class thread so that is get id get name get priority set name set priority 
join sleep start and run and also is alive Threat synchronization. So, if you are working with multiple threads, then we can't predict which thread is going to be executed first, and then which uh, uh, I mean the schedule of this thread execution. So we can't predict. So that's why if you use this thread synchronization concept, then the thread execution will be one at a time, one by one. So simply we can say this uh, what uh, if you apply this synchronization concept on the thread instructions automatically whatever the thread is executing that instructions or executing the method that thread will be in a lock procedure so that no other thread will interrupt this thread. So all the remaining threads will wait until the, this thread is to be completed. Right. So see. Let us see, three threads are there, so thread execution starts by using the start method, so t1.start, t2.start, t3.start. So if you observe, so t1 may initiate it first, t3 next, t2 1 or t2 may initiate it first. Next T1, T3 or T3 initiated first, T2, T1 and so on. So we can't predict the order, right? Which one executes first? So if you apply this synchronization, whenever this T1 executes this synchronization block, automatically T1 will be in the lock procedure, right? Then whatever the threads are there, all will be in waiting state so it will wait until this so this is the synchronization until this completes its execution where all the remaining threads will wait in the waiting state so after completion of this one after completion of this one it will be unlocked so automatically from these two threads one thread will occupy this lock position so if t2 occupies here T3 will be in waiting state so that it will wait until T2 gets completes its execution. Right? So this we have achieved by using join method. Right? So this we have achieved by using join method. Join method is also similar. If you apply join, so whatever the thread is present running, that will be executing and no other thread will interrupt the present running thread. So that we have seen in the previous session. But here the drawback is if we want to synchronize some hundred of lines in the code, then we have to apply this join for hundred threads. So in order to avoid this, we are moving with the synchronization concept. So our system may have thousands of threads. Right? So if I want to synchronize only few of them. Right? Then we will go with the synchronization concept. So this synchronization means locking the thread which is in the current position, I mean current running and all the remaining threads will wait until the current running thread completes its execution. So the same thing. So this can be achieved in three ways. This thread synchronization can be achieved in three ways. First one, by using synchronized keyword. Synchronized keyword. And we have to apply this keyword as a prefix to the statements which we want to be executed as a thread. Right? So generally we are writing these instructions 
of these statements in the run function right so we are writing the statements which to be executed as a thread in run function so we have seen two two methods in the previous session start and run so the thread execution always starts with the start function and the whenever you call the start function implicitly it will call the run function so that we have to write the statements here so these are the thread instructions or these are the statements which are to be executed as a thread so here the concept is we have to apply the synchronized keyword as a prefix to the statements which to be executed as a thread so here we are writing the synchronized so this can be done for a method for a method right here just a correction prefix to method in which statements return to be executed as a thread right small correction right so as per the explanation we have to apply this synchronized keyword here so we are writing this statement so this we calling as a thread instructions right so whatever the statements we are uh, want to execute under the thread so according to this explanation we have to use synchronized keyword as a suffix to this run method but this is wrong because we said that all the classes are the base derived class for a thread class so this we have explained in the previous section right so whatever the class we are writing that will be an derived class for the x thread the thread class so that's why here writing some t extends a thread right so all the classes are the derived class for the thread class now if you want so start and run are here those are the methods available here so in order to execute this one we have to create an object for t so t1 and we have to apply this start method right t1 dot run automatically run will be executed so that means we are overriding this run function from the thread class so method overriding right so these are all the methods available in thread class we are accessing these methods and we are writing our own instructions in the run run method that means run method is a overridden method so what is the rule for overridden method the name the parameters the scope everything should be same in both the derived class and the base class only the instructions to be modified that we have seen in method overriding but if you apply this synchronized keyword as a prefix to this run method so this is not a overriding method so it will not execute the statements because this is not overriding right so that's why we will go with the another approach right so we will write this run so we will write this run in one more class i i mean uh, see some class t extends thread so we will write all the instructions which we are writing on the run in separate method in separate method now we are writing all the instructions here so we can write a class some other class here right and we will call this method here itself hope you understood this one we are not writing the synchronized keyword here but we can apply the synchronized keyword here itself so we will call this method here so whenever t1 dot start automatically run will be applied and immediately after executing this run display method is called so that this function will be executed so how this happens we will see while implementing this thread synchronization concept so that your doubts will be clarified right so now this is one way how 
we can achieve the synchronization now second thing second thing using synchronized block see here here we are applying synchronized keyword for a method in which a statement is written to be executed as a thread but if we want to restrict the synchronization for a few lines of a particular method so a, in, in a method we can have a number of lines so we, we if we want to restrict a few lines of a method as a synchronization then we will go with the synchronized block so this is a simple so how to represent a block so a block can be represented by using a curly braces right so here synchronized block is represented by using synchronized keyword synchronized so we have to pass this as an argument that means a current running thread this and this one so here we can write the statements which we want to execute in a synchronized mode so inside the method we can apply the synchronized block so this should be applied inside the method few lines if we want to restrict this synchronization for few lines in a method then we will go with synchronized block synchronized block right hope you understood the first procedure using the synchronized keyword for a method second one applying the synchronized block for a few lines of a method inside the method right now the third approach third approach is a synchronized static block synchronized static block we know that so this is this is also applied for a method right so this is a if we apply the static keyword before a method then we can say that it is a static method and all the static methods can be called by using the class name and we we need not create an object for calling these static methods so a class may consist of a methods if it is a normal method we have to create an object for that class and through that object only we have to call the method if it is a static method we need not create an object for a class by directly by using the class name we can access the method so similarly this is also applied for method complete method so we have to use a keywords synchronized static followed by return type and method name right so a block this is also a block right so this is a third way how this synchronization can be achieved so hope you understood this one synchronization can be achieved by using three approaches first one is using the synchronized keyword second one is synchronized block the third one is synchronized static block right so here one thing we have to remember that is we are not writing the statements in the run because if you write the statements in the run function so 
applying these synchronized keywords to the run function is not possible because run is a overridden method from the thread class so that's why we are writing the instructions in another method in another class and we are calling that particular method in the run method right so for this we will use the code a different code for implementing the multi-threading and then we will see these three approaches so first we have to learn how to create a multi-threading and then we will go with the thread synchronization right so we will see all these three concepts so first one multi-threading for this synchronization concept next thread synchronization using synchronized keyword next thread synchronization using synchronized block third one thread synchronization using synchronized static block so we will see all these implementations in the system i will show you the execution of the program so how we have to write the program for, for implementing this synchronization concept right so let us see that hello friends so just now we have seen the usage of synchronization thread synchronization so before going to the programming so let me recall that so if you are using this multi threading concept a multiple threads will run at a time so user can't predict so which thread is going to be executed first and then next so that's why we will go for the thread synchronization so in the thread synchronization we have seen three concepts so three three ways how the synchronization can be achieved the first one is using the synchronized keyword second synchronized block third synchronized static block so whatever it may be if you keep the code which we want to run under the synchronization concept automatically there will be a lock towards the thread so that no other thread will execute until the thread which has been synchronized it completes its execution right so whatever the thread is running that will be in a lock procedure so just we can say the synchronization is just like a locking procedure so it will lock and then after completion of that block then the remaining uh, threads will be get executed now let us see the normal multi threading concept and then we will move with the synchronization concept now let us create a multi threading concept right see just we will import the statement next uh, here in this concept we have seen the thread life cycle that is start run right start and run methods so every thread will start its execution with the start function and that start function immediately or implicitly calls the run function so whatever the procedure or whatever the statements we want to execute under the thread should be written in run and all the programs are i mean all the classes we are writing those classes are derived classes of a thread class right so that means we are overriding the run method that we have seen in the previous session so we'll write here see class first i will write the program then i will explain one by one example so here we will write the function which we want to display under the thread i mean run under the thread is equal to 0 i less than or equal to 5 i plus plus right here we will we will use a sleep method right we will use the sleep method so a sleep method should be written in try and catch blocks see i am writing here try as sleep is a static method we need not use the object 
so thread dot sleep and i am passing 1000 milliseconds as the parameters so that much seconds it will be in suspended right. catch exception e so empty block let us create an empty block hope you understood this one right we are writing one function one class in class we are writing one method sorry yeah let us display here thread dot sleep then let us display the i value print ln g dot get name plus empty oh, sorry yeah plus i so i am printing just i so this is the instructions we want to execute under the thread so if you call two threads two threads will execute the same code that means printing the values from 0 to 5 so if one thread is getting executed we will start the thread by using start method immediately that will be coming here right so it will it will explicitly calls the run method so here we are writing the display method so we have to write the run method under the run method we have to call the display method so why this happens i will explain you later see now let us write the thread concept t extends thread class so here we'll give a reference to the class example and we will write the constructor a parameterized constructor in the parameter also we are writing one right so we have written now we will write run function public void run so this is a overridden function right now we can write e dot display right so i will explain you everything you don't worry now we will write the main function sync write the main function static void main string arguments then write object for example class create a thread t t1 is equal to new t of e x so i will i will explain you right so t t2 and creating this second object for the same thread class new t of again e x t t3 is equal to new of t of e x right now let us start everything e1 dot start t2 dot start t3 dot start right here see why we have written like this so why we have written the instructions wh what uh, to be executed under the thread in separate case this is because here whatever the class we are creating that is the derived class of a thread class right so we are overriding the run function overriding the run function so here overriding the run function means the scope the parameter the function name and everything should be same in both the base class and derived class so here as i have explained to implement this synchronization concept we have to use the synchronized keyword as a prefix to this public void run that means uh, whatever the code we want to run under the thread in that method we have to apply this synchronized keyword so here actually 
in the run function we are writing the instructions to be executed so we have to place the synchronizer keyword as a prefix to the run method but if you place this synchronizer i mean synchronizer keyword as a prefix in the run method the overriding is not happened because there is a difference between the function defined in derived class and the function defined in base class so that's why we are writing a separate class and a separate method and we are calling that method in the run method right so what is the use of all these things so then directly we can call this example dot display but why are we creating all these things see let me explain let us test one by one so always starts from our program always starts from main function so first main function will be executed right so in the main function we are creating one object for the class where we are writing the thread concept threading instructions and we are writing i mean we are creating three objects for a thread class right so creation of an object consists of a constructor with the help of constructor there we have seen a two types of constructors one is um, default constructor and the parameterized constructor now here we will use this parameterized constructor because see this is the thread class right so this is the thread class so in the thread class in the thread class we we are creating an object for the above above class right example because he in this class itself we are writing the instructions right so here we are creating an object and see this is an instance variable example e now if you write e dot display here without writing this constructor it doesn't execute because the scope of e doesn't valid inside the method right so for this purpose we are creating an object for the example class and we are passing that argument while creating the object of thread1 so automatically we have seen the constructor example in the previous sessions so the first it, it, the, the it executes the constructor it will search for the constructor in the program then only an object will be created so here it will search for the parameterized constructor so that's why we are writing t example of e so that's why this object reference is assigned to e hope you understood here this object reference that means whatever the instructions we are writing under the execution of a thread that object reference is passed as a parameter to the constructor so that's why we are again calling this constructor parameterized constructor again we are creating an example of e object of e then here we are assigning right here we are assigning this reference see this reference to this example this object right we are defining this reference to this object now directly we can call e dot display so that display function will be executed so that here thread g is equal to thread dot current thread so thread g is g will be having the current thread reference current thread so here which thread calls this display function t1 so that's why t1 reference will be available in current thread so here it will sleep for one second and again get g dot get name so g dot get name in the g we are having the current thread reference current thread is t1 so t1 dot get name will be executed plus i will be printed so 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 and immediately the same procedure will be happens when creating the objects t2 and t3 right so that's why we are writing two different classes in one class we are writing the instructions of a thread and in the another class we are writing the run method and in the run method we are calling the 
thread class i i, I mean uh, the instructions of a thread which we are we are writing in that class we are uh, calling in the run function for this calling an object should be compulsory needed right so in order to call an method of a class we need an object for that class first we have to create an object for that class and through that object only we have to call the method so that's why here we are taking a constructor and we are making a reference so that's why we are using this function now let us see let, let us execute and see this one so t synchronization dot java t sync dot java see, let us create in threads concept right so why we are writing this one because the thread instructions should be written in run function and in order to execute the synchronization thread synchronization we are using a synchronized keyword as a suffix to the method where the thread instructions has been written so we can't write this synchronized keyword as a prefix to the run function because run is a overridden function so that's why we are creating two different classes now let us execute this one so this is multi threading without synchronization right okay so here instead of writing full stop right now let us see tsync dots java right now let us execute see thread 2 thread 1 thread 0 thread 1 thread 0 thread 2 right so now you can observe the disadvantage of multi threading so there is no specific manner how the thread is going to be executed first thread 2 is initiated next thread 1 initiated next thread 0 initiated and in the second iteration thread 1 initiated first next thread 0 next thread 2 in the third iteration thread 1 initiated first then thread 0 then thread 2 so there is no a proper manner how this thread is going to be executed for this we can apply the synchronization concept so that a thread in which we are applying the synchronization that will be in a locked state so until the particular block is going to be executed the no other remaining threads will be executed starts its execution or it will interrupt now let us apply the synchronization so just a simple the first method we have to use synchronized keyword as a prefix of to the method where we are writing the thread instructions so here all the thread instructions has been written in void display so here we have to use synchronized keyword so everything in a small letter synchronized void display see so we we didn't change not even a single line only we are applying the synchronized keyword as a prefix to the method in which we are writing the thread instructions now let us execute and now let us execute and see this one see so thread 1 is initiated first so that the thread 1 i mean thread 0 first thread so first thread is initiated first and that is that will be in a lock state so that no other thread will be starts its execution so once thread 0 completed next immediately thread 2 started its execution so thread 2 will be in a lock state so that thread 1 will not interrupt it so after completion of thread 2 thread 1 executes so here you can observe the procedure so if one thread is being executed no other thread will interrupt it or no other thread will execute right so this is how we will achieve the synchronization the second approach is synchronized block so our system will be having a more number of instructions so we can have 
uh, in the method also we can have a multiple lines of code and if you want to restrict some lines of code to be synchronized then we will go with the second approach right so if i want to execute this one i will write complete this one with a synchronized block synchronized this so we have to use this word right so this is the synchronized block this is a synchronized block so if a method consists of multiple lines of code then if you want to restrict this locking procedure for only a few lines then those few lines can be combined with a synchronized block so we are not applying the synchronized keyword to hold the method but we are applying the synchronized synchronization for some multiple of lines some lines a few lines see now we will execute this one so here also yes thread 0 first thread 0 initiated so thread 0 will be in locking state no other thread will start its execution next thread 2 is initiated so thread 2 will be in a locking procedure so no other thread will be starting execution until the thread 2 finish its execution after the thread 1 see now if you write the same code just above see now let us observe so here we are we are applying this for loop two times okay and we are applying the synchronized method for only one loop now let us execute this one you can observe here right thread 1 executes its execution next thread 0 next thread 2 so all the previous thing is all the three threads has been started right so first t1 dot t start t2 dot start t3 dot start so this is executed for all the three th three threads right because this is not synchronized so that's why our code is having see so starting the three threads are executing parallelly there is no specific order 2 0 1 1 2 0 1 0 2 2 0 1 so there is no specific order so all the three threads are combined and executed so whenever it finishes its execution next immediately the synchronized block is executed right so immediately we are writing the synchronized block so this block will be executed so whenever this block is executing after executing one thread the remaining two threads will be in a lock state and after the next thread the remaining thread will be in a lock state right hope you understood this one so that's why if you want to restrict only a few of lines in the synchronization then we can go with synchronized block i will just remove it right the third method is applying the synchronized static block synchronized static block so this is very simple so we know that for every static method we can directly call the methods by using the class name we need not create an object for the static blocks right so we we need not create a um, object for calling the static block a static blocks can be called by using the class name itself so everything we can remove it here so synchronized static block right see so in the void display i am writing synchronized static block synchronized static void display so this is the static block and in order to call this block 
see in order to call this method this is a static method in order to call this method we need not create an object for this example directly by using the example class we can call this method so all these statements are not needed see all these statements are not needed right here instead of creating an object for example directly call this with class name so creation of this object is not required passing the object of example class to the thread is not required because directly we can call it simple thing right see now also thread 1 initiated first so thread 1 completes its execution then only thread 2 will be started thread 2 or thread 1, 0 so thread 2 starts its execution so thread 0 will wait until it completes its execution now thread 0 started its execution right so here is it's a simple thing we are we should not apply the static i mean synchronized keyword for the run method because it is a overridden method so that's why we are writing the instructions in uh, in a method of another class and we are calling that method in run function as we are keeping here synchronized static block so we need not create an object for calling this method we can call this method by using the class name directly so example dot display so in the previous two modes i mean in the previous two um, concepts categories we have to create a reference and we have to pass that reference to the instance variable so that the display method will be called right so a little bit confusion will be there but uh, it's a very simple thing so first um, remember how to implement the multi-threading to apply this synchronization so without using the synchronization directly we can write the run method and everything here directly you can call it you know, call the methods So why we are moving to this applets? So here these applets are used to embed the code in the web browser and to generate the dynamic content and it will work on the client side. Right? So this is mainly for generating the dynamic content. generating the dynamic content right so this will work at client side it will work at client side so here it will work at client side so the response time will be more So response time is fast so that means fast very fast we will get the response right so here these applets are the subclass of see i will give the applet hierarchy so this is the hierarchy so in which package these applets are available so first the object class will be there from the object class there is a container class from the container class there is a component class from the component class there is a panel class from the panel class there is a applet class and from the applet there will be a j applet class so this is the hierarchy of a classes packages so first base package is object next container container is a subclass of object similarly the component is subclass of a container package and the panel is a sub package of component package and applet is a subclass of panel and j applet is a subclass of applet now we will discuss this applet later we will go with the j applet okay 
So here, in order to implement these applets, we have to import this one. So we have to import Java dot awt dot applet dot star. Right? So in the applet, all the classes will be available. Right. Next. So how to implement this applet programs? So these are somewhat different from the normal program so far we have seen. So so far we have seen that we are, we are writing some uh, class. In that class we are writing some main method and we are creating an object and we are uh, accessing methods of a class and with, after that uh, we are just compiling that program by using the Java C and we are executing by using the Java command. So this is so far we have done. But implementing of these applets is slightly different. There is a slight difference. So, because it is, it is the code embedded in the web browser, web browser related code will be written in these applets. So that's why the implementation of these applets, the implementation of these applets will be done in two ways. One is using HTML file. HTML file hypertext markup language which is used to create the web pages. So one way to implement these applets is by using the HTML file. The second one is by using applet viewer tool. Applet viewer tool. In these two ways we will implement these applets. See here by using this html file we have to write the code in in the class and then we have to compile that code and in this html file we have to embed that one we have to write the code html tags in between the html tags we have to add the applet tag so there is a tag called app, applet so applet So this should be written in HTML. So we have to save this file by using .html and after compiling the program where we are writing the class, after successful compilation, we have to execute this HTML file so that applet will be executed. And in this applet tag, we have to write the code width and height. right? So in the applet code, we have to write the class where we are writing the applet. The class name should be written here. And the width and height we have to mention the uh, I mean the width of the applet and the height of the applet to be displayed. So this program should be saved under .html and after successful compilation by using Java C command, we have to execute this .html. Here the drawback of using this HTML is compulsory the browser should need a plugin. A plugin should be installed before executing the .html that means applet file not .html. Uh, for executing this applet code the browser should be installed this plugin Java plugin. So unless you install this Java plugin if you double click on this uh, .html file you will see nothing it's it will be opened in an empty window right so nothing will be displayed applet will not be displayed so we will move with the applet viewer tool here we need not write this separate program right so here after successful compilation we can directly execute that program by using this applet viewer so we will see one by one so let us see one by one So first let us see the life cycle of an applet, applet life cycle. So there are mainly five methods in this life cycle. Initialization, 
second starting third paint fourth stop fifth destroy so these are the five life cycle states so in this initialization we have to write the code in public void init this is the method for initializing the applet so always the applet will start its execution from this init method right so here we are not writing the main method so main method is not written so the applets every applet program is will start its execution from init method and after that the start method will be invoked public void start right so after that after that one this paint method public void paint paint method is used to display the content on the applet so here displaying the content means we can create an objects or we can create a components to the applet or we can directly write a message on the applet right so here it will take graphics class as a parameter graphics some object graphics class because the methods to display the text or to display the objects this uh, all the methods are available in graphics class so we have to take this graphics class as a parameter to the paint and we have to write everything in a paint next stop method so public void stop right immediately after the stop destroy see init method applet will start its execution from the init method so during the applet execution the init method will be called only once so executed only once only once and a start method is executed when a browser is maximized so we can minimize the browser and maximize the browser right so this start method will execute it whenever the browser is maximized right so due to some reasons we can uh, minimize the browser and uh, how many times you maximize the browser that many times the start method will be invoked immediately after maximizing the start method will be invoked and immediately the paint method will be invoked right so whatever the content we are we want to display on the applet that should be written in paint right next to stop stop is executed when the browser is minimized when the browser is minimized then the stop method will be executed okay next destroy when the browser is closed executed when a browser is right so these are the methods involved in applet life cycle in it start paint stop and destroy so always the applet program starts with the init method then immediately start paint stop and destroy it will follow this stru structure so we need not write the code for everything we can write the code for the required method right so the first two methods that is init start and the remaining last two methods stop destroy so all these four methods are available in java.awt.applet right in this package all these methods are available coming to this paint coming to this paint method paint graphics 
this is available in java dot awt dot component awt dot component so simply we can write java dot awt dot star right simply we can uh, we can write this one right so uh, if you use this star automatically all the classes available in this awt package those will be invoked so this is the life cycle of applet now we will say simple program so we will see the simple program so in order to implement the applet we have to import java dot awt dot applet dot star similarly java dot simply we can write awt dot uh, star okay so after writing this see once remember the program the class should be given the access modifier as public so every applet class is a public so public class give the class name just like uh, applet a demo and remember every applet class which we are writing is a derived class of applet class so we have to write the inheritance extends applet right every class which we are writing under these applets is a derived class of applet class so here our program starts from init method our applet star it starts its execution from init method I will write public void init right here we can set the background color foreground color font color everything we can set in this initialization and it will be executed only once so there are methods for setting the background color and foreground color so that is a set background and there is a color class and in that color class there are different constants so we can use that color class dot black similarly foreground set foreground color dot yellow or white whatever it may be right so we can close it so only once it will be executed then whatever the information we want to display on the applet that should be written in paint method so we can directly write the paint method okay we can skip the start method so void paint and as i have said to in order to display the string or in order to display the objects on the applet uh, uh, the methods available uh, in the graphics class so we have to pass the parameter as a graphics object so graphics some object with the help of this one we can directly use the draw string so there is a method draw string to display the string on the applet so here we can display the string so welcome three parameters are taken for this draw string method first one is the text what we want to display so we can pass the uh, variable also so next one is the coordinates x coordinate and y coordinate where this content should be displayed so let let me uh, give the coordinates as 100 100 so in the applet from the top corner the value pixels will be started the top left that means if this is a applet this place is a 0 0 x 0 y 0 and this place will be some x 0 y 10 right hope understood here right so here the coordinate starts from top left corner see 100 close so this will directly creates an applet and it will display this welcome in this applet at the positions 100 100 so let it be 100 100 is here so at that position welcome will be displayed so in order to implement this one this will be done in two ways one is by using html file another one is by using applet viewer tool if you are using this html file 
we have to write the code applet code in separate html file see for example so we are uh, giving a name dot applet demo dot java for this program so after writing this program we have to write the html right in that html we have to write the applet code is equal to this one applet demo and width width of the applet let it be 400 height of the applet let it be some 500 and close the applet close the applet code close the html code right and save this one with applet dot html right save this as dot applet dot html so here we are writing two programs one is the class applet class we are naming it as applet demo dot java and after that we are embedding this class file in the html code right so here applet demo that means a class file will be embedded into the web browser so here next first we have to compile that applet so compilation for that compilation we know that java c applet demo dot java so we will execute this java c applet demo dot java after successful compilation right after successful compilation we have to double click this a applet dot html so after successful compilation execution we have to execute it right execution means double click applet dot html so that the applet will be displayed and here the drawback is if there is a plugin for that browser then only the applet will be displayed so unless there is no plugin for that particular browser the applet will not be displayed on the web browser okay that's the main drawback so we need to update this plugin regularly for this we are just moving with the applet viewer so this is one one way to implement that is by using the html file second way is we can include this applet code whatever the applet code so this is the applet code right this is the applet code we can include this applet code in our java program so here we can write it anywhere we can write okay see here we can import i mean we can write this right so here we can import this one applet code is equal to we can write here applet demo some width is equal to 400 height is equal to 500 okay sorry yes height is equal to 500 right so again close the applet tag close the applet tag hope you understood so we are just writing this applet code in our class file okay in our java file so we, anywhere we can uh, write this applet code and put this applet code in comments put this applet code in comments that is very important so even though you are creating i mean we are uh, um, placing this applet code in between the comments the applet will be displayed with the given width and given height and here the compilation is same java c applet demo dot java and here during the execution we have to use the applet viewer tool applet viewer followed by applet demo dot java applet demo dot java so this is for compilation java c applet demo dot java for execution applet viewer applet demo dot java so previously we are we are using just a java followed by the class name applet demo so here we are embedding the code applet code in our program so we have to use this applet viewer tool for execution while execution so applet viewer applet demo dot java
right so this is the procedure to implement any applet program by using the html or by using the applet viewer tool right so let us stop here so in today's session we have seen what is an applet what is an importance and what are the different uh, life cycle methods and how to implement these applets so let us stop here and uh, uh, i will show the implementation in the system hello friends so just now we have seen the basics of applets so uh, and also how to create an applet and also we have seen the life cycle of an applet so let us see the implementation part of uh, applet let us write a simple program for an applet so just now we have seen that the applet is used to uh, embed the code in the web browser to generate the dynamic content and it will work on the client side right so this can be implemented in two ways one is by using the html file another one is by using the applet viewer tool so we have seen the drawback of html file implementing the applet using html file that means uh, compulsory the browser should have a plugin a java plugin then only we can implement this applet program using the html file so we can go with the second option that is uh, by using the applet viewer tool for that for this we have to include the applet code in our program now let us see creation of a simple applet see first we have to import the statements i mean the packages java.applet.star and again import java.awt.star so the, the graphics class will be available in awt that means paint method and the remaining life cycle methods are available in the applet class so that's why we are importing the two packages so class applet1 extends applet so here whatever the class we are writing that that is the subclass of applet class so compulsory we have to use the inheritance concept so every class which we are writing in the applets are the derived classes of an applet class right here there will be no main method okay we should not write the main method so every applet will start its execution from init method public void init so here the initializations must be done so for the initialization we can uh, set the foreground color and the background color so there are two methods for setting the foreground and background so for setting the background we can use the method called set background and here we have to use a color class so there is a class called color and in that there are different constants like color dot blue color dot black color dot uh, green right similarly there are different constants we can directly use that constant so color dot black automatically the it will be set the black color as a background next foreground here also we can use the same thing color dot hello right so as we have said just now the init every applet will start from the init method and this init method will be executed only once and then start method so if we can write the start method or we can avoid the start method no problem so whatever the text we want to display on the applet that should be written in paint method so public void paint and paint method will take the graphics class as a reference and by using this graphic class there are different methods we have seen uh, that is a draw string in order to uh, display the text on the applet and oval circle to draw the circle to draw the oval to draw the rectangle so everything there are different methods in a graphic class so in the paint method we have to invoke this graph uh, graphics package i mean graphics class we have to create an object for graphics class and uh, through that object we have to access the methods see g dot 
drawstring. Drawstring is used to display the string on the applet. So here we can directly write the message welcome to applets and next two parameters are there so total three parameters are inputs for drawstring we have seen so that remaining two parameters are x axis and a y axis so in the applet the coordinates will always start from the top left corner top left corner so top left corner the axis x coordinate and y coordinates are 0 0 so from that we have to analyze where we want to display this message and we have to give the parameters x axis parameter and y axis parameter let it be some 40 comma 40 so x axis 40 and y axis 40 there the string will be displayed now i will close it right so we need not write the stop method and the destroy method so by default this will be invoked and the stop method is uh, uh, invoked whenever the browser is maximized and the destroy method whenever the browser is closed this destroy method will be implemented right so in the execution of this applet this init method and destroy method two methods will execute only once so whenever the browser is minimized automatically stop method will be invoked whenever the method is maximized sorry whenever the browser is maximized start method will be invoked right and paint method is used to display all the things on the applet so here if you save this file by using java and uh, we have to write the applet code in a html file and we can execute that one but there must be a plugin for our browser so unless you install the plugin for a browser you can't execute this applet program that is the main drawback so in order to avoid that thing we can use the applet viewer tool so if you want to use this applet viewer tool we have to enclose in a comment the applet code see applet code is equal to we have to give the class name here so applet 1 we have to mention the width and size of the applet that should be displayed width is equal to some 400 and uh, height is equal to some 600 and close the applet tag so here if you had a knowledge of uh, web technologies so every statement is represented in tags so whatever the uh, instruction enclosed in between these two symbols greater than and less than symbols that we call it as a tag so in web technology everything is a tag right everything is implemented as a tag so here we are using the applet tag so whatever the tag we are using we have to after finishing the instruction we have to close the tag by using backslash so this is the opening tag this is the closing tag of applet and all these are the attributes code width and height are the attributes which give some additional addition additional information for this for the tag so for every tag there will be attributes for in this applet code i mean applet tag code width and height all these three are the parameters or attributes so here in the code we have to write the java class where the applet has been written and uh, in the width we have to give the width of the applet which we want to display the in terms of pixels right it is a 400 pixels next we have to mention the third parameter the height it is also in terms of pixels right so very important thing is we have to enclose all this applet code in between the comments even though it is applied in the comments this width and height will be applicable right now let us uh, uh, execute this one so that your doubts will be clarified so let us uh, save this one applet one dot java right so if let us execute this one first java c that's a common thing for uh, compiling this app applets applet one dot java so once it gets successfully compiled next we have to execute but here while executing we have to use the applet viewer tool so if you just execute by using java it doesn't give any output right it doesn't give any output it will give it will send an error that main method not found in class applet one 
so here we are not giving any main method we are not writing any main method so applet will always start from the start uh, init method then start then paint then stop and destroy so if you if you want to execute this applet we have to go with applet viewer tool applet viewer followed by the class name dot java right so for compilation we have to use java c and for execution of the applet we have to use applet viewer tool applet viewer followed by the class name dot java so if you execute this one see here you can observe the applet this is the applet right so here an error got applet not initialized so let us see right yes public class so ev every applet class should be written as a public See. right so hope you understood so here one more thing to uh, to be remembered that uh, every applet class should be declared as a public access specifier right it should be public so if if you fail to write this public automatically we can get the exception that is c illegal access exception right so let us move to the program here we are writing the comment we are writing the applet code in the comment but it it takes this width and height and it will apply it for the applet you can see width is 400 and height is 600 so if next coming to the init automatically set backgrounds color black, color dot black so background color is black similarly background uh, foreground color is yellow so whatever the text we are displaying is in yellow and a paint method will be executed with, with the graphic class so g dot draw string welcome to applets 40 comma 40 right so here in the 40 comma 40 coordinates we are displaying welcome to applets so let us change the coordinates 240 and 240 now let us see how it will be executed see i will change the width and height also i will give just 200 height now let us execute this one applet code see sorry 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 java c applet 1 dot java and then applet viewer applet 1 dot java here you can observe that um, see here the width of the applet is we are given 400 by 200 400 by 200 so the applet is here but the text is not displayed because here in the axis 240 is available but y axis 240 is not available because height is up to 200 So let us change it to 140 to 140. So here you can observe now. Let us close it and uh, let us execute this one. See, yes. So this is the applet with the uh, 400 width and 200 height, and uh, in the coordinates 140 and 140, we will display the text. Right. so this is all about a simple applet the main advantage of applying this applet is for a speed response time because this will work in the client side this code will be working in the client side right so this is main main you application of this applets is to generate the dynamic content in the web page dynamic content in the web page color and font as we know this color and font uh, will give a few uh, i mean uh, the look and feel for the text right so here in the applet so we can insert the some string on the applet so that uh, we can apply the font size the font style and also the color which we want to display on the screen right so for this there is a classes called a color class and a font class so let us first let us deal with the color class so we know that in the color class 
That means any color is represented in three major colors. That is red, green, and blue. Right? So here also every color is represented in red, green, blue. The combination of these three colors will give a one color. Right? So here the red is ranges from 0 to 255 and green ranges from 0 to 255 and blue ranges from 0 to 255 right so here if you want to set the color so there is a method for uh, assigning a color to the font that is called set color of we can give here the object the object or color directly okay color with static member okay let me explain what, about these things so there is a method called so g is g is nothing but an object of a graphic class so we can create anything as an object for graphic class so the object of a graphic class dot set color is used to set the given color to the followed font. See here object means we have to create an object for this color class and we have to pass it to the set color method. So here so we know we know that for any class in order to create an object uh, that can be done by using constructor right so here so color so go with the naming conventions which have, we have discussed in the earlier sessions that uh, if it is a class it should start with a capital letter so c is a capital letter here right so color object c1 is equal to a new color here in the constructor we have to give the range of red green and blue okay so if you give 0, 0, 0, so all are zeros. So this will reflect black color. It will reflect black color. Right? And so the black color will be assigned to C1. Black color will be assigned to C1. If it is 255, a 255, and again 255, the maximum ranges, it will reflect white color. It will reflect white color. So if it is 255, comma 0, comma 0, it will reflect red color. If it is 0, if it is 255, 0, it will reflect green color. If it is 0, 0, 255, it will reflect blue color. Right? So here we have to pass the range of red green and blue right? the corresponding color will be assigned to this object and we have to pass this object as a parameter to the set color method so after creating this one we have to implement g dot set color of c1 automatically if it is 0 0 0 black will be assigned to the next followed font that means followed text so whatever the text we are writing on the applet that for that text this color will be assigned right and this color class is available in awt package awt package okay now see this is one one way to assign a color with the set color method another one is passing the static member of a color class so for this color class for this color class, there are static members, right? Static members. So, if if a member uh, static members means directly we can call that member by using the class name. Okay, we need not create an object for that. So we have discussed in the uh, earlier sessions. So if a class can consist of instance variables or a constants or a variables uh, methods so whatever it may be in order to access those things first we have to create an object and through the object only we have to access them 
but if these members or methods or variables or constants those are the static then we need not create an object for the class to access that one but we can directly access by using the class name itself so here also there are no static members and simply we can call them as a constants constants so these are the constants so these are available in this color class so whatever the static members or constants available in the color class those can be accessed by using the class name see so here the static members are nothing but uh, 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 the names black white red green blue so there are predefined names predefined constants see so blue black green white yellow pink right so all these are the uh, uh, constants right so we need not give the combination of rgb but instead of giving this range directly we can access these methods uh, sorry access these constants but in order to access these constants that should be done by using the class name that means we have to call it as color dot blue color dot black color dot green color dot white color dot yellow color dot pink right so there are some some more else right so these members can be accessed directly now we can pass this as a parameter to the set color method so g dot set color of instead of giving this one we can write color dot black automatically the font text will be set as color of black right so this is the method for setting the color for the text right? so we, i will show the implementation part in the system right i am not writing any program here just we will we will see the implementation part now we will go with the font right then we will uh, move with the implementation this is all about the color next font font means the text right so font is nothing but the text this is also a class so f should be capital that means first character should be capital so it is also available in awt package awt package and there is a method for this one that is g dot set font of it will take a three parameters right it will take a three parameters so directly we can pass an object here right we can pass an object here so let us see how to create an object here so here also for creating an object we have to use a constructor so font f is equal to new font here it will take a three parameters the one is first one is string type another one is integer type third one is integer type right so this one this one gives the font face font face this one gives font style this one gives font size right so all these three will be set to f automatically once the f is created this f can be passed as an argument to the set font method see what is a font face we know that different styles of font right so we know that a uh, times new roman is one type of font times new roman right next similarly comic sans ms similarly bookman old style right similarly arial font so these are all the fonts different fonts and we have to write this font in the as a first argument and here the font style 
is taken the values as 0, 1, 2 and 3. The font style is any one among these four. So, see, font style. If it is 0, the text will be as a plain, as a normal text. If it is 1, it is a bold text. So, we know that. So, what is meant by normal plain text and a bold text? Text with bold. 2. Italic text. Italic text. That means some somewhat slided. Okay. And the 3 is a combination of bold plus italic. Bold plus italic. So, this we have to pass as a second argument. And the third argument is size, size of the font, right? So if you give 9 as a size, it will, uh, the text will be displayed in a small. And if you give 30 as a size, it will be the font size will be very large. The display of the font will be very large, right? So uh, if you see the implementation part of this thing, you, your doubts will be clarified and you will get a better understanding. So, once you pass all these parameters to the font, f will be, those parameters will be assigned to the f, object f. f is an object of font. So, this f should be given as a parameter to set font. So, here g dot set font f. Automatically, whatever the text we are writing after this method, this will be applied. This will, this one will be applied, right? So this is also in AWT package. So in order to implement all these things, both the classes import, we have to include the import Java dot AWT dot star, or simply we can write Java dot AWT dot graphics because all these are the graphics methods. These two are the graphics methods. Okay. So, hope you understood this one. So, let us stop here and uh, let us move with the implementation part of these two color and the font classes. Hello friends, just now we have seen the color class and the font class. So, in that we have seen a color class, uh, uh, we have to mention the color, so which is represented by the three colors, major colors, red, blue, green, RGB. And each of these colors will range us from 0 to 255. And apart from this uh, combination of these three colors, there are a fixed colors which are treated as a static numbers of a color class. So we have seen that just a black, white, green, blue, pink. So all these are the constants or the static members of the color class. So these, these members we can directly use in our program. See, let us implement this one. So first, uh, this color class is available in AWT package, right? So import Java dot AWT dot star, and we have to implement the applet. So Java dot applet dot star. Now let us write the applet code. So we have to write it in comments. So applet code is equal to let us give the color demo dot color demo width is equal to some 500 and height is equal to some 800 so let us close the applet code close the comment now write on the class public so here we have given the name so color demo so we, we have explained that uh, every applet program is a derived class for the applet class. So we have to use the inheritance extends applet. Now let, uh, every applet starts its execution from init. So first we have to write init public void init. So initialization. So this will be executed only once. So I will set the background and a foreground colors here. here. So color dot black next set foreground 
color dot white okay now let us print some uh, text so public void paint paint will take the graphics class as uh, a parameter and here there is a method called g dot draw string we can write here right comma here we have to mention the coordinates so let it be some 30 x axis and some 40 y axis so first let us print this and then we will move on okay so color demo dot java it's already existed okay yes now let us execute compile this and execute this one so java c color dot color demo dot java yes now we have to use applet viewer tool for execution color demo dot java yeah see if you observe here the height of the applet is 800 and the width of the applet is a 500 and here we can see the background of the applet is fixed with the black and the foreground of this applet is fixed with this white now let us change this one let us change the font color so for this we have to use the color class color c is equal to new color of we have to give the ranges of three colors that is red green blue let us take it as some 10 20 and 30 so that means a 10 intensity of red 30 intensity of uh, green and sorry 20 intensity of green and uh, 30 intensity of blue so it, the combination of this one will be saved to c now we will set the color here so g dot set color of c right now uh, let us execute this one java c color demo dot java now let us execute by using applet viewer so if you observe the color has been changed right so welcome to sandeep sharadi channel the color has been changed so let us take one more color so let us uh, decrease the size so let us take the combination of some 200 200 see 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 let us take uh, let us take uh, the green color so it's a 255 the highest range let us take all the remaining colors as a zeros so obviously it will print blue color see. java c color demo dot java applet view color demo dot. so if you observe here a right color has been set to the text and if you give a zero here and if you give 255 here you will get green color right hope you understood so if you put 0 here and if you put 255 here it will give the blue color right hope you understood now right so whatever the color you want that can be assigned to one object and you can set that color with the object or else see directly we can use the static members that uh, color oh, sorry color dot pink so these are the static uh, colors available in this color class so that uh, see pink right next similarly there is a green um, pink green blue black white yellow see let us take yellow right hello right so there are some static members so th those static members we can directly use so if you want to use the combination of colors then apart from these constants or static members then you are supposed to pass the uh, range of each each of the color and that must be assigned to the object and we have to pass that object in set color now this is all about the color now coming to the font 
so there is a one more uh, class called a font so which we, which will take uh, three parameters so see this is also similar font f is equal to new font so three parameters first one gives the font face font face font face means which type of font you need right so we know that arial is one type of font arial comma and second is the parameter integer that that means the style of that font it should be plain or bold or italic or bold and italic so zero will be plain and the third one is the size of the text so let us take the size of the text as 30 right so now all these parameters are assigned to the object of font class now before going to the draw string here set font of f now whatever the text written after this method the everything will be having a font with the see you can observe here welcome to sandeep saradi which is a arial so let us uh, give the width um, uh, width more okay 800 width now see so let us take uh, green here so that uh, it, it should be uh, visible clearly right see. okay now let us change the font here comic sans ms comic sans ms is one of the font size fonts page right see hope you understood so we can change the font phase in this parameter right comic sans okay times new roman times new roman so times new roman is also one of the font so this is the times new roman now let us apply the italic one italic italic i think it's bold oh, sorry not italic it's bold i think so let us check one yes it is bold it's not italic so zero is plain one is bold and now let us try with the two i think now it will be italic yes it's a italic right now let us try with the three that is bold plus italic so both bold and italic will be applied for this text right so this is the bold plus italic right so here the font Uh, there, th these are the two different classes available uh, in the AWT package. So, font will take three parameters. One is the font style, and then uh, the second one is the font. I mean, first one is the font um, face. The second one is the font style, and the third one is the font size. Right? So, we can also change it to. and old style so there is these are all the fonts available so you can observe these fonts in a word or powerpoint right this is the bookman old style right so hope you understood this uh, color class and the font class so these are mainly used to bring the look and feel right so one thing we have to remember these two classes are available in awt package right and then there will uh, in the color class there will be different static members we can use the static members or we can give the range of the major colors and a font the constructor will be have three, three parameters we can set the font and we have to create an object and all these parameters will be set to that object and we have to set font by using this object graphics class so this is available in 
AWT package. So in order to implement this uh, graphics class methods, we have to import Java dot AWT dot star or simply we can write import Java dot AWT dot graphics. Right. So coming to this graphics class, there are different methods. So the name itself indicates these methods are used to create an you know, objects that means insert the objects on the applet. So objects are uh, like uh, drawing the line, the drawing the text, right? Drawing the rectangle, drawing the oval, drawing the circle, drawing the square, drawing the polygon. So all these are the different objects, uh, I mean different methods in order to use uh, for, for uh, inserting the objects on the applet, displaying the objects on the applet. Now let us see one by one. So first one, let us go with the draw string. So in order to access all these things, see, draw string. So draw string is a user to display the text on the screen. So here it will take three parameters. One is string, which we want to be displayed on the applet next one is coordinates where so we are specifying the applet right we are specifying some width and height in the applet code so that in this applet where we have to place this text that means x and y coordinates so he, here always it will be zero zero the top left corner it will be zero zero from that the x coordinate and y coordinate we have to mention so that this string will be displayed in the given coordinates. So, int x int y. So, this is the method, right? This is the method for displaying the text on the applet. I will write here display text. Second, draw line, draw line. So here, uh, le let us recall the naming conventions which we have discussed in the earlier sessions. So these are all the methods. So we have learned that if it is a method, the first character of the first word should be small and the first character of remaining words they should be capital so that's why d is small and s is capital here also d is small and l is capital here in order to display the line on the applet we have to give a four parameters that is four coordinates int x1 int y1 int x2 int y2 display the line between x1, x, x1, y1, x2 and y2. Right? Next. Draw rect. Draw rect. Rect means rectangle. Here also, first we have to mention the x and y coordinates where this rectangle should be displayed. So first, the coordinates in the x, in y. Right? Next. The width and height should be specified. How, so how much width the rectangle should be having and how much height the rectangle should be having. So int width int height. Okay. So here width and height will be in pixels, in terms of pixels. Right? So it will display rectangle. Right? We will display the rectangle. If width is equal to height, if width is equal to height in this rectangle, okay, then it will display what it will display? It will display the square. It will display the square because the, for the square, the width and height will be same. Right? Next.
draw oval draw oval here also d is small and o is capital here also the first two parameters specify the x and y coordinates where the oval should be displayed and the next two parameters specify the width and height width and height simply we can say instead of uh, giving the width and height it is x radius and y radius so we can we can say them as a x radius and y radius that means radius uh, along x axis radius along y axis right it will display the oval it will display the oval okay and here also if width is equal to height it will display circle to display circle right next draw arc we know that arc right so this is an arc okay so here also the first uh, two parameters are x and y so where it should be starting and the next two parameters and width and height so how much width it should be how much height it should be how much width how much height and it will take uh, two more parameters that is uh, start angle and arc angle so for for this arc it, it should have the start angle and arc angle start angle and arc angle so for the deviation right so start angle int arc angle so it will display the arc it will display the arc right next draw polygon polygon draw polygon so here the polygon means uh, the closer surface so anything closer surface is called a polygon but it should not contain any curves it should be with the lines right so any closer surface we call it as a polygon it, it can be having any sides n number of sides but there should not be any curve in that n sides so this square is a uh, polygon triangle is a polygon because in square triangle rectangle all these things we, we, uh, there will be no arts okay so uh, these these are called the polygons so here it will take a three parameters that is x array y array and number of sides number of sides so how many number of sides here we are giving that many points should be given to x and y that means we have to create x array similarly y array right x array y array number of sides so it will give the polygon it display polygon right so these are the a few methods available in graphics class so in order to access all these methods first we have to create the object for graphics class then with the help of that object we have to call all these methods right because these are not the static methods so that's why in order to access these methods we have to create an object for the graphics class and through the object only we have to access these methods and apart from these methods there are a uh, few more methods called fill rectangle fill rectangle so that means uh, we can set the color right we can set color we can give color dot yellow right after executing this one so let, uh, if g is a uh, object for graphics let g dot set color color yellow so if you write this fill rectangle it will display the rectangle with yellow color it will be filled with the yellow color 
right? Similarly, fill oval, fill oval. So oval will be created with the given parameters. The parameters will not be changed, right? Param with the given parameters, and this will be in L one. This will be filled with L one. Similarly, fill arc. Fill arc. So an arc will be displayed here, and see this will be filled with L one. So whatever the color we are giving, that color will be displayed. And similarly, polygon also. Fill polygon automatically. If you give five sides, so right. So if you, if you give six sides, automatically this will be given, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. It is also a polygon. So a triangle is also a polygon. A square is a polygon. Some right? Any other any closed surface is a polygon, but it should not contain any curves, curvatures. So A polygon will be displayed, and uh, it will be filled with the given color. Okay, it will be filled with given color. So these are the uh, another methods. So th there is no change in the parameters. So parameters are same, right? So only the name of the method will be changed. That means fill right, fill oval, fill arc, fill polygon. Draw right, draw oval, draw arc, draw polygon. And similarly, draw string and draw line. Right? So hope you understood this uh, graphic class methods. And important thing is, once again, I'm repeating that uh, these methods are not a static. So if you want to access these methods, you have to create an object for the graphics class, and through the object only we have to call these methods. Right? So let us uh, see the implementation part of all these methods in system. So let us stop here. We'll go with the implementation part. Hello, friends. so just now we have seen a uh, different methods available in a graphic package so in that we have seen uh, the draw string method which is used to draw the text on the applet next draw rect which is uh, used to draw the rectangle or a square and uh, draw oval which is used to draw the oval or a circle and draw line which is used to draw the line draw arc and draw polygon and similarly fill rect fill oval fill arc and fill polygon right now let us see the implementation part of these things so first of all we have to import so java dot awt because all these will be available here so import java dot applet dot start write down the applet code applet code is equal to uh, graphics methods width is equal to some 500 height is equal to some 500 let us close the applet now write down the applet class class graphics methods it is also a derived class of applet class applet now write the init method public void init so let us set the foreground and background colors set background So color dot black set foreground color dot white. Let us write the paint method public void paint in which the graphic class will be available. Graphics G. Now we have to write all these things. G dot draw string. so string draw string method will take three parameters one is the string so we can give so welcome next uh, x axis and y axis where the uh, this data should be displayed so 40 from the x axis and a 50 from the y axis so let us uh, close it and let us execute one by one 
so graphics methods i think uh, dot java right graphics methods sorry the file name is different dot java right now let us execute this one java c graphics methods dot java okay error reach end of the file yeah we are not uh, closing the comment properly yes so we have to use the applet viewer for executing this graphics graphics methods not java you can observe here so welcome is printed here so x axis 40 and y axis 40 so we have given x axis 40 and y axis 50 so x axis is 40 pixels y axis is 50 pixels so here it will be 0 0 right so so this is for just displaying the string now let us see the next one that is rectangle g dot draw rect draw rect so here four parameters are taken one is the x axis and y axis where it should be uh, displayed so let us take it so 40 from x axis 70 from y axis and here we have to mention the width and height of the rectangle so let it be some 100 width and 40 height 100 width and 40 height now let us execute this one so that you can observe the rectangle to be displayed on applet so see so this is the applet i mean this is the rectangle right next g dot fill rectangle fill rect so before that we can set the color here or else uh, you have set the foreground as white if you implement this fill rect automatically it will be white color in white color so here also fill rect also four parameters x and y width and height so let us take a 40 x axis 90 y axis 100 width 40 height let us execute this one so, okay so that you will you can observe the fill rectangle right hope you understood this one right it, it, it has been overlapped because here we have mentioned the y axis so y axis so 70 90 here height is 40 so 110 it would be let it let us take 120 so that uh, the overlapping will not be done you can observe that clearly right okay first one is the normal rectangle another one is the fill rectangle now let us go with the another one that is oval g dot draw oval right draw oval so let us take here also it will take four parameters x y width and height so 40 from the x axis so 120 160 120 position we have started and the height is 40 so 160 so let us start with the 170 height and width so let us take height as some 30 width as some 60 let us take let us execute this one you can observe the vowel right vowel now we'll go with the fill vowel another one fill vowel g dot draw vowel sorry sorry, sorry. fill vowel now let us uh, display this uh, the fill vowel just beside the draw vowel so x axis is 40 
and uh, here we have mentioned width as 30 so total it is 70 now let us display that in 90 90 x axis 90 x axis and 170 y axis let us take the same thing 30 width 60 height so if you observe this right hope you understood this one now let us take uh, another thing g dot draw line so here we have to pass the two parameters the first x and y coordinates and the last x y x and y coordinates let us take a 40 and a y coordinate is uh, 170 height right 170 plus 60 230 let us take a 240 40 to 40 to 40 2 let us move on so some 80 to 40 it will draw from 40 to 80 242 this is the line okay so you can still extend it okay on 40 I'm oh, sorry first we have to right this is the line okay and then we'll go with the arc g dot draw arc so here also it will take so x y coordinates so now x is at a 40 y is at a 240 so let us take a 260 next height and width some 60 and height is 100 and then starting arc and arc angle and I mean starting angle and uh, and angle right 60 60 here we have to give the angles because it is an arc hope you understood this is a simple arc simple arc so this is the arc right so so just a modification oh, sorry right so this is about a simple arc right now similarly we can go with the next one that is a polygon so for this we have to uh, pass the x and y coordinates let us take the arrays in x is equal to some coordinates like let us take the coordinates some 10 20 30 40 10 right for five coordinates in y is equal to let us consider 100 200 300, 400, and the 500. Now, go with the draw polygon, pass on the xy coordinates and 5 as a. So, uh, sorry, uh, let us take here some 200, 250. 18 to 90 200 because it will be overlap otherwise it will be overlap so that's why I am changing all these things so see. now let us execute this one so we know that a polygon is a closed side right it's not an integer it's an array okay right. now. 
yes so here you can observe the polygon polygon is a closed surface without any arcs that is called a polygon a polygon can be a rectangle triangle square anything but not the circle oval because circle and oval will be having the arcs so polygon should not have any arcs the polygon can be of any size right so here so these are the different methods available in graphics class so in order to print the square here we have to give the width and height as 100 100 automatically we can get the square okay see uh, i will close this fill rectangle so that you will you will understand right okay this is square and if you want to give the circle there also in the width and height you have to mention the same thing see this is a circle here we, you can observe the circle right so again here also you can um, you can have the circle right see before going to this event handling first we have to know about this event what meant what is meant by an event so an event is the state change the state change or we can also say it as a behavior change is called as an event example if you take a button pressing on this button is an event right clicking on the button is an event if you take the text field initially it is an empty and if you type any letters in this text field right the state will be changed empty text will change to text field with some text so this is also an event so generally we can say an event as a state or a behavior change state or a behavior change now the concept is how these events should be handled right see how we have to handle this events for this we will follow a model called delegation event model delegation event model so in this delegation event model there will be sources and there will be listeners right so sources are so from which the events will be generated the sources from which the events will be generated and listeners are used to handle the events right so from the sources events will be generated and whatever the events generated by the sources that will be handled by the listeners now so there are different sources which will generate these events like button checkbox sorry list menu item choice scroll bar text component window right so these are the some sources which generates the events so button if you click that button event will be generated if you press that button if button will be i mean event will be generated right so checkbox 
checkbox means so this is it will allow the multiple selections so initially if it is deselected if you select the any checkbox the state or change will be changed right next list list of items menu item drop down menu choice so so radio buttons okay a single selection scroll bar we know that the scroll bar if the text is uh, greater than the component automatically the scroll bar will be added text component similarly text field and text area and window so whatever the container we are using for this uh, components that we can call it as a window right so from these sources events will be generated and first whenever the event is generated those events will be sent to listeners right see whenever the events generated from these sources those events will be sent to these listeners so every there, there are number of listeners right there are number of listeners so these events will be handled by this listeners so these listeners are interfaces right these listeners will be associated with interfaces so we know that the definition of an interface interface is nothing but uh, which contains the abstract methods only the abstract methods that means the method uh, declaration will be there but not the definition right so so there are number of listeners event listeners we can call them as event listeners and these events will be handled by these listeners with the help of these interfaces now for handling these events first of all these listeners should register with these sources register to sources right so uh, a multiple number of listeners can register to the sources okay so whenever an event is generated that particular listener will be activated and this event will be passed on to that particular listener so that that listener will execute or implement or handle that particular event with the help of that corresponding interfaces right hope you understood so for handling these events which are generated from the resources first of all it will have to these listeners have to register to sources so for registration the syntax is add type listener add type listener so this is used to register the listener interface to the sources right so there are different listener interfaces so if it is key listener key listener right so this will be responsible for key events key events right so what are these key events key typed key pressed key released so these are the events generated by the sources and these for implementing these events key listener is a responsible so that first this key listener should register with the sources so for registration this is the syntax we have to write add key listener right so whatever the events occurred these will be available in event class right so event listener class 
we can call them call it as a see I, I, I will explain you one by one first let us see the event listeners multiple event listeners so this is called delegation event model so whenever an event occurs from the sources the corresponding event listener will be handle the event occurred right so that is uh, that will be done by the means of listener interface okay now let us see the events the different events occurred right action event adjustment event component event container event focus event item event key event mouse event mouse wheel event text event and window event see all these are the different event classes so these are all the classes these classes are used to generate the events okay so whatever the events generated by the sources that are available as a methods in this class now let us see action event so this is responsible for the events generated by button checkbox list okay sorry button it's a menu item okay and the list adjustment event is responsible for a component component event also responsible for a component events container event is also responsible for components focus is also responsible for components for gaining gaining the focus and losing the focus so item event it is for checkbox choice key event Text component, mouse event, this is for mouse movements, mouse wheel, mouse wheel movement, again the text component, This is completely for window. So all these are the different classes which are responsible for the events generated from these sources. Right? So if a button is pressed, then automatically it will come under with action event class. So in this action event class, there will be different methods, and by using those methods, the interface will be implemented. Right? So every class is having a separate listeners. So to handle the events of action event, we are having the interface called action.
action listener interface for this adjustment listener for this component listener for this container listener focus listener item listener key listener mouse listener mouse motion listener next mouse wheel listener text listener window listener right so for all these classes the corresponding listener interfaces will be there so these are all the classes these are all the events these are all the interfaces right so don't get confused so these are the events generated from the event sources and if once the events are generated those events are handled with the help of corresponding class and the interface the class and interface with the help of both the classes and interfaces these events will be get handled okay so for handling those events first the interfaces should register with the sources right hope you understood and now we will see the methods available in these interfaces so we have we know that the concept of interface that is interface will have only the abstract methods that means only the uh, method declaration but not the definition and uh, whatever the class we are implementing that interface in that class we have to write the definition for all the abstract methods right now let us see the methods available in interfaces first action a listener so in this interface the, there is a only one method available that is called action performed see again just recall the naming conventions just recall the naming conventions so it is an interface and it is the method so while giving a name to the method the first character of the first word should be small and the first character of the corresponding words should be capital so a small and a p capital next so this is the only method available in action listener adjustment listener so what about the adjustment listener here also only one thing adjustment value change so this is the only method available for adjustment listener component listener so this is having four methods so component resized component resized 
component mood component mood component show component hidden so these are the four methods available in component listener right so component is nothing but our buttons text fields scroll bars all these are the components right so the component if you want to resize the button size button then these events must be this method should be implemented and component mood we can place the component anywhere in the applet or anywhere in the frame right so shown so we can set it as a visible or we can hide it so these are the methods available in component listener next container listener container listener so container means just like our applet our applet right so small window is available so that applet we can call it as a container in that applet we have to create a button or a text field or checkbox or radio button everything so all these are the components we can call them as components and we can call this as container so only two methods available in this container listener that is component added component removed component added and a component removed right only two uh, methods focus listener focus listener focus listener means we can observe that a focus can be gained or lost okay so if you are working with uh, multiple windows or a multiple uh, uh, folders uh, you can observe this change that means how what is meant by the focus gained and focus lost see that is only two methods are available here focus gained focus lost two methods right so if the focus is gained we have to write that code in this method and if the focus is lost we have to write the code in the in this method second method item listener only one method is there item state change item state change item means just we can call it as a uh, let us say uh, radio buttons right uh, initially if it is a deselected if you select this one automatically we have to write the code in item state change so the only one method is available for item state change key listener key listener key means our keyboard keys so there are three methods one is key type so whenever you type the key key pressed similarly key released key released right so these are these are the three methods available in this key listener interface so all these are the interfaces right so we have to write the code in these methods if there is a event occur from button we have to use this action perform that means we have to write the logic in action perform so what what should be happen if you click the click on that button right if any uh, value change state change you have to go with the item state change if you press a key key listener will be activated and uh, we have to write that code in this methods key type key present tree list okay so these are all about the interfaces uh, we will go with the another interface
माउस लिस्नर माउस लिस्नर सो दिस इज कंप्लीटली विथ द माउस मूवमेंट्स ओके सो माउस प्रेस्ड माउस क्लिक माउस एंटर्ड माउस एग्जिटेड राइट माउस रिलीज सो ऑल दीज कम्स अंडर द माउस लिस्नर ओके माउस मूवमेंट्स ऑल दीज आर द माउस मूवमेंट्स so there is one more listener for the mouse movements that is mouse motion listener mouse motion listener right so it will handle the two methods that is mouse move mouse drag moving and dragging right so these are the mouse motion listeners next mouse wheel listener when the mouse wheel is moved then automatically this listener should be active so only one method mouse wheel mode mouse wheel mode whenever the mouse wheel is moved automatically this event will be activated right next text listener only one method that is text change so whenever we want to change the text automatically this text listener will be implemented now window listener window listener See, window activated. Window deactivated. Right. So two methods. Next, window open. Window closed. window closing window iconified window deiconified right so these are all the different methods available in window listener okay so these are all about the listener interfaces okay so first we have learned regarding the event sources from which the events are so from which the events are generated and once the events are generated those events will be sent to the listeners so the listeners have to register with the sources so that once an event is generated then that notification will be sent to all the listeners and the corresponding listener will activate and it will handle the event which is generated and how these events are handled by means of the event classes and the interfaces so each and every event class there is a corresponding listener interfaces right so those listener interfaces are having a different methods and if you are implementing this listener interface automatically we have to implement the abstract methods which are available in that listener interface so these are all about the event handling right so event sources event classes uh, 
event listeners and listener interfaces and the abstract methods available in interfaces listener interfaces right and so we can just follow a template while implementing uh, this event handling first we have to uh, uh, one thing so all the events are available in java dot util dot event handling right so in this package all these events will be there then so we can follow the template while implementing this event handling right so first we have to import the import the packages and then we have to write the applet code so because we are creating the applet and uh, we, we are using the applet viewer tool for uh, executing these applet programs so we are supposed to write the applet code and then we know that uh, whatever the class we are writing that is a derived class of applet so extends the applet we have to write the extends the applet and whatever the possibility events it may occur in the applet we have to add those interfaces so after extending the applet we have to implement the interfaces also and after implementing the interfaces first we have to register these events with sources so for that we are we have seen the statement that add type listener add type listener so by using that one we have to write it and whatever the event is generated that corresponding event listener should be activated and whatever the methods we are uh, i mean whatever the methods available in that particular interface we have to write all those methods so that means we have to write the definition for all those methods so coming to the mouse events first we will see the mouse events different mouse events right so first one is mouse clicked is a event mouse entered is another event mouse exited is a one more event mouse pressed similarly mouse released so there are two more events that is mouse moved mouse drag so so from the mouse these are the possible events can be generated so whenever the mouse is clicked clicked one event will be generated whenever the mouse is entered into the applet space then one event will be generated whenever the mouse is exited from the applet space then another event will be generated whenever the mouse is pressed another event will be generated next whenever the mouse is released so once you press the mouse button you will release the press button right so mouse released event is related to that next mouse moved so we can move the mouse from one place to another so then the this event will be generated and mouse dragged so dragging means clicking and dragging right Mo moving is entirely different from dragging so mouse moving is just a moving a mouse around around the window and mouse dragged means pressing a button and moving the mouse from where one place to another that is called a drag so these are the possible events generated by the mouse right so in order to handle these events we have discussed in the earlier session that the corresponding listener interface should be registered so corresponding listener interface is mouse listener right and this is for all these things right so all these things the same interface will be used and for mouse moved and mouse drag we have to implement one more interface called mouse motion listener so these two are the interfaces right so we know that the definition of interface means it consists of only the abstract method but not the definition of the method 
So, in this most listener, there will be five methods. All these are the abstract methods. And coming to this most motion listener, it will have two events, right? Two events, mouse moved and mouse dragged. These are the abstract methods available in mouse motion listener. So in order to implement all these events, we have to implement both the interfaces, mouse listener and mouse motion listener, right? So by implementing these two, we have to write the definition for all these seven methods, right? So in order to implement these mouse events, we have to use mouse event class right so with the help of these interfaces we have we are also want to implement this mouse event class so in this mouse event class there are two methods available that is get x get y right get x and get y so these two methods will give the coordinates coordinates of the window right so whenever we move the mouse around the applet that particular x coordinate and y coordinate will be retrieved by using these two methods and these two methods are available in mouse event class right now let us see the template so how we have to implement these mouse events and not only the mouse events whatever the events we are handling we have to we can simply follow the template right so Remember, all these are the seven events, possible events generated by the mouse. First five events are responsible with the mouse listener. Last two e events are responsible with the mouse motion listener. So in order to implement these two, we have to register the events with both the mouse listener and mouse motion listener. Now, let us see the template how the event can be handled. So whatever the events, just we can follow the template. So first one is, we have to import the packages. Import the packages. Right? So here we can import awt, awt.eventhandling, event.star, and similarly java.applet. Right? Next, after importing that, we have to write the applet code. Applet code should be written which is in the comments right so which we have seen in the earlier sessions and third we have to write the init method init method set the foreground so this is an optional thing let's set the background set the background and then inside the init method we have to um, register listener interface listener interface right register the listener interface and oh uh, sorry next uh, the second one class should be extends applet implements interfaces this is very important so our class should extend the applet so we know that every class is an, a subclass of an applet right so that's why we are extending the applet and also we have to implement the interfaces because because of handling the events right so if you are using the mouse events we have to implement two interfaces that is mouse listener and mouse motion listener Register the listener interface and write uh, events method definition. So, whatever the events available in these interfaces, that definition should be written here. So, if you follow these five points, we can uh, write any program so which handle the events so let us take one mouse events now we have to import these three now mouse 
the class name extends the applet and implements there are a most events seven events we have seen so for uh, handling those seven events we have to implement two interfaces mouse listener and mouse motion listener so here we can write implements mouse listener comma mouse motion listener as it is an interface we can uh, implement a multiple interfaces by using comma comma operator right next applet code so in order to give the applet uh, i mean uh, length and width uh, I, we can we have to use this applet code so we, which is enclosed in comments right then in the init we have to set the foreground and the background color and the font color whatever it may be font and color next register the listener interface so first of all we have to register the listener interface unless one event is occurred that event should not be will not be forwarded to this interfaces right so whatever the inter event is occurred that event will be transferred to the registered interface so here we are using the mouse events we have to add the mouse listener and a mouse listener interface right next events method so whatever the events available in these interfaces those definitions should be written here right so hope uh, you understood everything now let us implement this in the system so that your doubts will be clarified so just now we have seen the uh, the how the mouse events are handled and uh, different mouse events and the methods of a mouse event class now let us implement that thing so just we have seen the template so we will follow the template so import so we have to import the packages so let us import the packages awt package similarly event package and then applet right right now next we have to write the applet code applet code is equal to we will give the class name as mouse width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 let us close the applet close the comments and then let us create a class public class mouse extends applet we, we have said that right extends applet and which implements so as these are the mouse events we have to implement two interfaces that is uh, mouse listener interface and mouse motion in listener right so mouse listener comma mouse motion listener right mouse listener and a mouse motion listener so after uh, writing this one then we have to write the init method so initially we will uh, take uh, two coordinates x coordinate and y coordinate let it be x is equal to 0 comma and y is equal to some 10 let us create one message for displaying that uh, on the applet string message is equal to um, let it be mouse events sorry right okay so uh, let it be x is equal to um, some 30 and y is equal to 30 so that uh, it will be displayed uh, in, in that particular position now let us create uh, the init so public void init so in that init we have to set the background color set the foreground color and majorly we have to register these events to the events right add mouse sorry okay, mouse listener of this and similarly add mouse motion listener of this 
right so this is the method which is used to add these listeners to the events now let us create a uh, background color set background set a background let it be color dot black so set the foreground color this is an optional thing initially the background color will be white and the foreground color will be black so foreground color dot white Sorry. white right so this is the init method now we we have to implement we have to write the definition for all the mouse events so we have seen a, a totally seven events now let us write the seven events first public void mouse entered so in that we have to use the mouse event class mouse event then here we can uh, create this one set background we can change the set background after mouse is entered so set background so we can give a color dot we can write magenta so whatever a color we can write it okay next uh, show status show status we can write here mouse enter so show status is a method which is used to show the text in the status bar okay now write the repaint method call the repaint method next similarly go with the uh, remaining public void mouse exited take the uh, class mouse event me right now same uh, call the same things right background uh, sorry again that go with the red mouse exited right this is the second method now we will write uh, the remaining next method public void uh, mouse pressed mouse event class mv right so again uh, we can follow the same things so we can change the color of this one hello see mouse pressed see next public void mouse released go with the event class mouse event and follow the same procedure here mouse pressed here we can go for it mouse released and change the color um, uh, we can use the color green here repaint method next go with the another method public void mouse mood mouse event class yeah same procedure follow the same procedure so we go with the another color white or else we can uh, take it as a blue because the font size we have already set it to white or okay blue sorry mouse mood here we can uh, 
take the parameters so x is equal to me dot get x so get us command we have seen so it will uh, return the x coordinate similarly y is equal to md dot get y so this is because we are uh, given example we are giving an example for mouse moving so that whenever the mouse is moved uh, through the applet that come that content will be moving right so we will uh, you will uh, understand while executing this one right so mouse uh, dragged mouse dragged mouse event class Sorry. yes here also we can uh, use these things so Oh, sorry yes. so go with another color mouse drag and here uh, we can write uh, in this status mouse drag we can also give the uh, I mean uh, positions mb dot get x plus comma plus and we dot get y most dragged at see this one we can write it So we can know that uh, the coordinates where this this mouse is dragged. Okay. Now uh, one more thing is uh, remaining that is mouse clicked. Public void mouse click. And go with the mouse events. Mouse event. So here also we can go with the same thing. So color is equal to. So green click and repeat right now we can, we have to write the paint method so public void paint graphics g so g dot draw string message comma x sorry x comma y right this one so we can also give uh, messages yes message is equal to we can write here mouse entered so that it would be uh, easy to understand right next mode exited mouse pressed See here also we can give most released. So whenever the event occurred, it will be displayed. Okay, released. And here also we can give mouse mode. Sorry, there is no double quotations. Okay. mouse drag yes mouse click so first we will uh, save it and we will just execute this one so we will save it in a 
Java programs. Mouse dot Java. So we'll execute this one. So Java C mouse dot Java. So once it gets successfully compiled, then we have to implement this by using I mean execute this by using applet viewer tool so here the spelling mistake is here yes so here there is a spelling mistake and here we have forget to the paramen parenthesis so in the set background uh, yeah spelling mistake right now let us see this one yes so we have to use the applet viewer tool for uh, execute this mouse dot java see here you can observe so mouse movement mouse clicked mouse pressed mouse released mouse pressed mouse released mouse exited mouse entered see mouse exited right so mouse dragged so you can observe here so this is the status bar mouse exited this is the status bar and this is the message we are giving so whenever the it moves from the applet it automatically it will displace the message as mouse exited immediately after uh, entering into the applet it is uh, obviously it is mouse entered but uh, we are just moving a mouse around the applet so it is showing that mouse moved and click mouse clicked and uh, mouse pressed so pressed and released immediately happens right so mouse clicked and uh, movement and dragged means clicking on the mouse and dragging from one place to another so here you can observe in the status bar the positions where the mouse is moving right so this is a example i mean this is a program for handling the mouse events so all the seven events are handled here right so accordingly we can write the logic for these mouse uh, events definitions so here we are writing here so you can write uh, whatever the logic you want but while implementing the interface we have to write the definition for all the events all the possible events see so mouse entered exited clicked pressed released all these five events are handled by the mouse listener and mouse moved and mouse dragged both the events will be handled by using the mouse motion listener so here we are implementing two listener interfaces right so the template uh, just i am repeating the template which we have discussed in the previous uh, just in the session so first we have to import the packages that is the awt package because the graphic class will be there and for handling the events we have to import the event package event class and then we are using the applet so we have to include the applet also then write down the applet code because here we are using uh, the applet we are tool so we have to include uh, this applet code in the comments so here we have to mention the width and height and then we have to write the init method because applet program always starts from the init method so in this init method we have to set the background color and the foreground color by default the background will be the white and foreground will be the black and then we have to add the listener interfaces which are responsible for handling the events so if, if the in the single program if you are handling mouse events and key events then we have to add both the events so for adding the events the, we, we have to use a method called add key listener here key i mean add type listener here in the uh, place of type we have to use the events so if you are using the mouse listener we have to use add mouse listener if you are uh, using the key listener if you are uh, implementing the key listeners we have to add the key listener right so after this we have to write the paint method so in the paint method we have written the graphics i mean just we have draw the string that means we are displaying the string on the applet and then we have written the definition for all the possible mouse events which are available in this two interfaces mouse listener interface and mouse motion listener interface See, in order to implement these key events, two things should be added. One is K 
key event class another one is key listener interface key event class and key listener interface so here what are the possible events so possible events are key pressed event key released event key typed event so three events are there three events are possible for this key key uh, events so those three are key pressed key released and key typed and in order to so these are the abstract methods available in this key listener interface as we have discussed just uh, in the previous session so so in order to implement this one we have to take the help of key, key event class so in this key event class there is a method called get key char this is the method which is used to get the key of the character which is type right so whenever the event is generated that event will be so c whenever the event is generated that event will be transferred to this key listener interface where we are writing the definition for all the possible key events so key press or key release and key type because all these are the abstract methods available in interface so these definitions will be written and with the help of key event class we can handle the key events right so here also we can follow the same template which we have discussed in the previous session so first we have to import the packages and then we have to extend the applet and implement the interface so here the interface is key listener interface so here we have to implement the key listener interface and then we have to write the applet code and then we have to write the init method so init method uh, we can set the foreground set the background and we have to register the interface with the event source right so here the event listener is key event listener key listener right so that should be registered with the key events and then in the uh, the definition of all the possible key events which are available in key listener interface and then we have to write the paint method so our applet program always starts its execution from init method so once the init method is executed then automatically the paint method will be called and that paint method will be generated so whenever the key event is occurred automatically that that event will be transferred to the key listener interface and in the key listener interface this possible events definitions will be done and according to the logic and according to the uh, code we have written in the program that code will be executed right so hope you understood these key events we have to follow the same format and a, for, uh, a template so we'll stop here and uh, we will see the implementation part in the system so that your doubts will be clarified hello friends so in the just now we have seen the key events so now let us see the program to handle the key events so just we will follow the same template right so there are three possible events key events that is key pressed key released and key typed now let us see this one so first we have to import this one import java dot awt package so in that we can get both the events and the graphics package next we have to use applet java dot applet next we have to write the applet code just we will write the applet code here so applet code is equal to key width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 right now let us close the applet now let us create a class public class key which extends the applet and implements key listener so here we are using the key key events so key listener so just write the message uh, let us display the message here so key events 
right now so let us take uh, two parameters int ex is equal to 40 y is equal to 40 now write down the init method public void init so here we can uh, go with the set background set foreground set background is equal to black sorry sorry color dot black similarly set foreground is the of color dot uh, little bit yellow and then we have to add this one add key listener of this so we have completed it now we have to write the definition for all these three events so public void key pressed so we have to make use of key event class ke write down message is equal to key pressed set background so color dot pink and show status key pressed next public void key released key event key message is equal to key released now set the background in different color set background color dot red show status key released right public void key type so there is one more event that is key type key event key so here key type we can write uh, message is equal to key type right and then we can also give message plus is equal to so there is a command called uh, ke dot uh, method called get key care right Net, uh, next here also we can set background color color dot black show status key type okay now let us write the paint method public void paint graphics draw string g dot draw string message comma x comma y yeah here we have to write the repaint method okay repaint so this should be included in everything so that the paint method will be called one again and again right right now let us uh, execute this one key dot java let us execute this one so java c dot key dot java so once uh, message is equal to enter 
right so we didn't initialize here i think so yes so string message yes now you can get while parsing yes we didn't close the class public class key listener error cannot find the key listener so just we will also implement the event class import java dot a w t dot event dot start yes so explicitly we have to write the import method for uh, importing this event package also now let us execute this one applet where key dot java see key events so whenever the mouse is i mean key is pressed key typed is j key released right so if you observe here after pressing here key released key typed key pressed key release okay so whenever you are pressing the key automatically key typed is executed first key pressed is executing and then immediately key really key typed is also executing okay now see i will show you if okay so this is the program for key events see once again i will show you so whenever you press a key automatically key pressed is implemented and immediately key typed is also executed i am pressing j i am pressing h i am pressing i i am pressing r i am pressing f right so and immediately after releasing this key it will be released key released right hope you understood this one right so if you are having any doubts regarding this key events feel free to post your doubts in the comment section so that i will definitely try to clarify all your doubts and just we have to follow the templates so remember this this should be implemented explicitly right right event dot star and then applet code and extends the applet class extends the applet and implements a key listener and then we have to write the init in the init we have to register the event listener key listener and then uh, we have to write the definition for all the possible events which are available in this key listener interface so there are several awt controls available in java so let us list out them first one is label button checkbox checkbox group choice list text field text area scroll bar so these are the awt controls available in java so with these awt controls we can also handle the events occur with these awt controls for example if you consider a button if you press the button an event will be occurred and the occurred event will be handled by the corresponding listener interface so which we have discussed in the previous session so in the previous session we have discussed about the event handling so event sources and event listener interfaces right so whatever the event occurred 
by using these controls corresponding event listener interface will be responsible for handling all these events right so in this session let us look about the two awt controls so how to create a label how to create a button how to make visible on an applet right so how to handle the events of these two things right let us see one by one so whatever the awt control we are trying to create just we will follow the template so that the programming will be very simple first one import the packages so here the packages mainly the first one is awt package which is responsible for graphics class and applet package right so our applet programs which we have discussed in the previous session that uh, every applet program is a derived class of applet class so that's why we have to import the applet package as well as event awt dot event because for handling the events right so first step we have to import these packages second and we are using the applet we are creating the applet so we have to enclose the applet code in the our uh, editor right so we are not using any web browser so we are using the applet tag inside the code so write the applet code and then create a class so class which extends applet and implements interface the lesser interface that depends upon the event occurred and then we know that applet life cycle the applet program starts with the init method so we have to write the init method in this init method we can set the background set the foreground and here we have to create objects of these controls and add these objects onto the container so here the container is applet right next after completing this init method automatically the paint method will be called so we have to write the paint method okay so and then if you are implementing the interface we all we have to write the definition for the method which is available in this interface so we have to write the code for the methods of interface so we know that interface is a it contains the abstract methods that means only declaration there will be no definitions so if you implement this interface we have to write the definition for all the methods available in this interface so that we have to write it here right so this is a just a template to apply the awt controls working with awt controls right so first one let us see the first one is label first one is label we know that all these are the classes right so for creating the object we have to use the constructor right so label object name l1 is equal to new label this is a constructor right so for creating the object for a label there are different types of constructors so this is a constructor with zero parameters zero arguments right so we can also create a label with parameterized constructor so we can also use here label you can pass the string as a parameter which will set as a label right 
so these are the two different ways to create an object for a label one is without the arguments another one is with arguments and this class consists of two methods that is get text and set text right so get text is used to retrieve the label from the code so and the set text is used to set the label a new label that means a renaming so if you use this constructor here we are not giving any name so by using the set text method we can give a name for a label or if you use this this one here if you give here uh, just like some abc and meanwhile if you apply this set text code set, set text method with call def so abc will be replaced with def right so these are the two methods available in label class so here also and it doesn't generate an event it is just it is used to display the content on the applet so this awt control is an exceptional case which doesn't generate any event it's only for a display purpose right next we'll move with the second one that is button button so here button is also similar so button is also a class so here also if you want to create an object we have to uh, use the constructor with the help of constructor so i will give you that one button b1 is equal to new button so this statement will create a button with a no name because here we are not giving any name so it will create a button without any label or without any name and button b1 is equal to new button submit so this will create a button with a label submit so here also two types of parameters one is without any parameter i mean without any argument and second one is a parameterized constructor so here whatever the text we are writing as a parameter for this constructor that will be set as a label for the button so here also there are different methods available in this button class that is get label get label set label get label is used to retrieve the label of a button and set label is used to sorry here you have to pass a parameter string as a parameter so set label is used to set the label if already a name is given for the button this will be replaced with the given parameter and if you create a button in the first by using the first first statement you can give a label by using the set label method right and here also same we have to follow the same template so by using those templates we can create a button and uh, for button there is a is an interface called action listener action listener right by using this interface action listener these events button events will be handled right so we'll stop here and uh, let us see the implementation of this label and button in the system so that your doubts will be clarified hello friends so just now we have seen uh, various awt controls so among that first let us see the label how the label works so we know that uh, a label is just displaying the text on the applet 
and we have also seen the template need to be followed while implementing this AWT control just we will follow the template so first of all we have to import the packages import java dot awt dot star similarly import java dot awd dot event if we are using any event uh, handling mechanisms or anything we can use this event dot star right uh, and also graphics import java dot okay for graphics we have already imported double awt dot star now we have to write the applet code so applet code is equal to so let us uh, create the label demo so label demo fix the width width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 and close the applet and put these statements in comments yes so first we are importing the packages then we are writing the applets now we have to write the class public class label demo it should extend the applet because all the applet programs are the subclasses for applet class extended applet all right if you are using any event handling we can uh, implement that listener interface right so now let us create a init public void init so applet program always starts from the init so init method here we can uh, set the background and set foreground background is equal to uh, sorry set background of color dot black Next, set foreground is equal to i mean foreground color dot yellow then we have to create a object for a label so label l1 is equal to new label of so we have to give the parameterized constructor we, have, we can pass the string which should be displayed on the label right so i will just display the label as branch so branch is a, initialized to l1 similarly create a one more object for a label l2 is equal to new label give uh, one more thing that is college right now after after uh, creating the objects for these things now we have to add right so add l1 similarly add l2 so we are adding these objects to the applet now write the paint method paint graphics g object so let us display g dot draw string we, we can give label demo right let us close this one save this as a label demo label demo dot java now let us execute this one so java c label demo dot java So let us check for the errors. Yes, a lot of errors are there. So cannot find the symbol. Okay. Yeah, we have to in import Java dot applet class. Right. Now let us execute this one. I mean compile this one yes so there is a, a one more thing draw string a string yeah we have to pass the parameters where it should be displayed 50 50 right 
yes so it was successfully compiled now we have to uh, use the applet viewer tool for execute this uh, program applet viewer label demo dot java right so if you observe here so we have created two labels one is for branch another one is college and we are just displaying the string at the parameters 50 of x coordinate and 50 of the y coordinate so a label means it's displaying the text on the applet this is called as label it doesn't have any event handling right it is only for displaying the text on the applet so this is all the all about the label demo right now let us see about the one more component awt component that is button push button see first we will import the statement import the packages right this is for graphics class import java dot applet this is for applet import java dot awt dot event dot star this is for event handling now we have to write the applet code applet code is equal to let, let us take it as a button demo width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 and close the applet tag close the comments now create a class public button demo sorry public class button demo uh, extends applet and it implements so we are writing the event handling also whenever the user clicks on the button what should, what it should be happen that that uh, event will be handled by the event listener that is so for button there is an action listener that is a, i mean the listener interface called action listener action listener right now so first write the uh, init uh, init method public void init so in this init just we will uh, set the background and foreground just we can leave by default it will be the background color will be white and foreground color will be black now let us create a label uh, buttons sorry, sorry button button b1 is equal to new button right here we can pass a string that is uh, the text which is which we want to display on the button let us take red let us create a one more button b2 is equal to new button blue let us create a one more button b3 is equal to new green right so now we have created three buttons with the name red blue and green now let us add all these things add b1 add b2 add b3 right now we have to add the listener inter interface right we have to add the listener interface now for that we have seen b1 dot add action listener so this we have seen in the previous session right of this b1 dot add action listener add key listener for registering the events with the sources so similarly b2 dot add action listener of this b3 dot add action listener of this see uh, uh, first let us see just whether the button is displaying on the applet viewer or not public void uh, sorry paint 
graphics g g dot draw string button demo i have to pass a parameters 100 100 right so let us close the class let us save the class and let us check whether the button is displaying on the applet or not button demo dot java right now let us execute this one java c button demo dot java Yes. So here you can see uh, the error button demo is not an abstract and does not override abstract method action performed. So here in this program we are implementing one listener interface that is called action listener in which there is one method called action performed. So here we are not writing any definition for that action performed because this is an interface right. So if you are implementing that interface we have to write the definition for the methods available in that interface. So let us write the empty interface public void action performed. So this is the only method available in action listener interface. So here with the help of class and uh, interface we have to handle the event. So yes, this is just an empty definition, empty body. Now let us execute this one. Yes. So, in order to execute this one, applet viewer button demo dot java. See, if you observe, so here one text is displayed on the applet and the three buttons are displayed one with the red, blue, and green. So, here whenever the user clicks on the red button, no action will be taken. If a user clicks on a blue button or a green button, no action is to be taken, right? Because where we didn't write any action to be taken in the action perform. So whatever the action the user wants to be implemented that should be written in this action performed method, right? So if the user clicks on a red button that will be assigned to this object AE. Now see string str AE dot get action command. So this is the method which is used to retrieve the label of a button and it will assign it to the string, right? So AE dot get action command. If user clicks on red button, in the red button, we have given a label as red that will be assigned to string. If user clicks on the blue button, this blue will be assigned to string. If user clicks on the green button, this green uh, will be assigned to string. Now we will check str dot equals equals is a method which to use to compare right for string class red it compares with this given label if it is successful we will just change the background color hope you understood this one background color so color dot red again if it fails we have to write the one more condition str dot equals c blue sorry then we have to set the background color as blue and only three buttons are there we can write that simply else condition if both are false automatically the third one will be the true background color dot green right see right so here after clicking on the button whatever the action we want to implement that should be written in action performed right so whenever the user clicks on that button the event source will be activated and that will be implemented by using this action listener so in that action listener there is a one method called action performed 
and whatever the uh, logic we want to implement after clicking on that button that should be written in this method right if you click on that red button that red background will be set to red color so let us execute this one so java c button demo dot java yes next we have to use the applet viewer tool button demo dot java so there is a text and three buttons if you click on the red button the background color is changed to red if you click on the blue button the background color changed to blue if you click on the green button background color is changed to green so this is the event handling right so previously we we didn't write any code in this action performed just we, we have written only the empty body so no action is to be taken even though a user clicks on this button now we have written this to change the background color so whenever the user clicks on these buttons event will be handed right yes so for this we have to just follow the same template first we have to import the packages then applet code write the applet code next a class write down the class which extends the applet and implements the action listener write down the init method in the init method first create the object for the different awt components and then add those awt components to the applet and then add action listener add key listener right that means register the event listener to the events and then write down the methods which are available in listener interface which we are implementing so we can follow the same template so that will be very easy for coding so here the main difference between this checkbox and checkbox group is so both are having a multiple elements and if you want to select a multiple elements then we will go with the checkbox and if you want to go with the single selection we will go with the checkbox group see so here also this is also a class in order to create uh, an object for this class we have to use the constructor so let us see the constructors checkbox c1 is equal to new checkbox right so a checkbox an empty checkbox is created without any label so for label we have to give the another method called set label there is a one more thing another type of constructor checkbox string so we can pass the string so that a checkbox is created with the given string and one more constructor new checkbox string str and boolean on so here there is two two parameters one is a string another one is a boolean thing so we know that a boolean means either true or false so by default if you create a three objects see hobbies let us take hobbies as an example so a person can have a multiple hobbies so we need to select multiple elements so for example sports reading books right there are two things if there are two things so first one by default these two things are unselected so here if the second parameter is initialized with true right initialized with true that particular object will be in a selected position by default it will be selected if it is a true right so for this we have to create a two check boxes i will show you check box c1 is equal to new check box sports similarly check box c2 is equal to new 
checkbox reading books right so after writing these two statements you can observe the empty checkboxes that means no selection will be there okay so if you pass one more parameter here sports comma true while creating an object for c1 then by default that particular object is selected right so this is for the second parameter that is boolean it will be either true or false okay so there are uh, methods there are methods available for this checkbox that is get label similarly set label so by using the set label we can give a name for the checkboxes and the remaining procedure is same right now there is a one more control called checkbox group see this is a class so see c is a capital and a g is a capital so make sure that one so for this the same thing we have to apply so before creating the checkboxes so this is a, another one right checkbox group so checkbox group means creating radio buttons radio buttons which will have only the single selection only the single selection that means branches selecting the branches selecting the branches means so there are different branches csc ece triple e and so on there are different branches and we need to select only one branch right so if you select csc both the ec and triple e buttons will be deselected and if you select ece CS, csc and triple e buttons will be deselected that means it will allow only a single selection such a type for creating such a type of control we have to use this checkbox group so this is also similar with the checkboxes so before creating this one see before creating the checkboxes we have to create the checkbox group so first create the checkbox group some cbg is equal to new checkbox group so cbg is a object for checkbox group now we have to create a checkboxes which belongs to this particular cbg now checkbox c1 is equal to new checkbox the first one is string checkbox group object of a checkbox group and the boolean that means selected or deselected so by default it will be false so everything will be deselected and if you replace that false with the true automatically that particular corresponding object will be get selected okay see so first create the group checkbox group then you create this one so see checkbox c1 is equal to new checkbox string that means csc which belongs to checkbox group and by default if, if i want to get selected here i have to write here true next similarly checkbox c2 is equal to new checkbox ece cbg checkbox group and false so make sure only one object should be written as true next checkbox c3 is equal to new checkbox triple e cbg false right so if you write these three statements 
this will be created right now so one thing i just want to say that so this is the creation of the objects or a components now after creating these components the next immediate step is we have to add this component to the container so for adding these components to the container there is a method called add add method is there for adding the components to the container here our container is the applet right so here we have created three components c1 c2 c3 so we have to add c1 add c2 add c3 so whatever the components we have created everything should be added to the container right so in the previous session also for create after creating the check boxes we have to add them if you create a button objects we have to add those button objects to the applet by using the same method add method if you create a label we have to add that label to the container by using this add method right so here also there are different method for check box group that is get label set label set label is used to set the label for the radio buttons get label is used to get the label of the radio button right similarly set state and get state set state here state represents this true or false boolean parameter right state so if it is selected it will return true if it is uh, deselected it will return false so get state set state so we can also set the state by using this method similarly get label set label there are four methods available for this checkbox group and checkbox right and in order to implement these awd controls just follow the template which we have seen in the previous session so first create the packages import the packages then write the applet code then write the class which extends the applet and implements the corresponding interface and then start with the init method so in the init method set the background set the foreground that is an optional thing right then create the components objects and then add these component objects and then if you want to handle the events you have to register the events with the sources by using the i mean key listener add key listener next uh, implementing the methods available of uh, the interfaces right so interface consists of only abstract methods so we have to write the definition for all the methods available in that interface then write on the paint method if you, if you need it's also an optional thing right so just follow this template in order to implement these awt controls so let us stop here so i will show you the implementation of these checkbox and check checkbox group by using the system so that your doubts will be clarified thank you hello friends so just now we have seen uh, how to create the checkbox and checkbox group so here the checkbox means a multiple selection that means which allows the multiple selection and a checkbox group means it allows the only single selection that we call it as a radio buttons now let us see the implementation part for those things so just we will follow the same template so first let us import the packages import java dot awt for graphics package and import java dot applet package right now let us write the applet code here which is enclosed in comments so applet code is equal to first let us check with the checkbox so checkbox demo dot java sorry checkbox demo it's sufficient so width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 now close the applet uh, tag oh, sorry applet tag close the comments now create a class public class checkbox demo which extends the applet applet class 
right so just we are following the template now let us uh, write the init method public void init so in this init we can change the background color and a foreground color that's common and uh, we have to create the object for awt component here the awt component which we want to create is checkbox so checkbox c1 is equal to new checkbox of here we can give the label name okay so let us give cricket let us create one more checkbox c2 is equal to new checkbox of tennis let us create one more checkbox c3 is equal to new checkbox football so here we have we have created a three checkboxes that means we can select a multiple things right so now the next step is we have to add these objects to the container that means applet so for that we have to use the add method add c1 add c2 add c3 simple now let us take it public void paint graphics g let us write a simple text g dot draw string g dot dot draw string write down here checkbox demo give the parameters some hundred comma hundred so it will be displayed here right save the code checkbox demo dot java right. now let us execute this one java c checkbox demo dot java so it's successfully compiled now we have to use the applet we are tool because we are writing the applet code in the program itself applet viewer checkbox demo dot java right one second one second right see java c checkbox demo dot java now let us execute this one checkbox checkbox demo dot java so here you can observe the output so applet here we have written a checkbox demo in the draw string method and here three checkboxes are created so it will accept the multiple selections that is the importance of checkbox component right hope you understood we can we can create a more number of things see once again if you select if you execute this one see you, you will observe the three checkboxes which are deselected by default deselected so here while writing the constructor itself you can pass the second parameter as a boolean that is true or false so here see if you observe here i have passed two arguments in the first checkbox that is first one is the label second one is the selected or deselected that is a boolean type either true or false if you by default it will be false so if you specify it as true if you execute this one see if you observe it is selected by default it is selected right so previously it was it was not selected so here also you can give the second parameter so by default the first parameter is a label the second parameter is the selected or deselected it's a boolean if by default it will be false if you specify it as a true it will be selected by default 
right so that should be written in the constructor while writing the constructors okay so hope you understood this one so if you want to uh, handle the event automatically you can implement the corresponding listener interface and we have to write the method of the listener interface here the same thing happens now now we'll go with the one more program that is checkbox group first let us create uh, the packages import the packages awd dot star so just follow the same template so java dot applet dot star yes, that's enough now let us write the applet code applet code is equal to checkbox group give the width and height of applet now close the applet tag create a class public class checkbox group so it extends the applet as we know that now write on the init method public void in it so in this init method first we have to create a checkbox group checkbox group some cbg is equal to new checkbox group so we have created an object now we can create a one by one the checkboxes which belongs to this group so that automatically they will be converted as a radio buttons so new checkbox it in in this the constructor will take a three parameters first one is a label right second one uh, is the group of checkbox group name i mean the object of checkbox group to which it belongs third one is the selected or deselected there is a boolean type right so just uh, write on uh, the same thing so c1 c2 c3 c4 and c5 uh, let us change this one ece triple e civil mechanical so as it is a radio buttons only one thing will be true and all the remaining values will be false right let it be true now after creating the checkboxes add all these things add c1 add everything c2 c3 c4 c5 right c2 c3 c4 c5 right now let us write the paint method public void paint graphics g g dot draw string write down here branches so we we can select only one branch we know that so if you want only one selection then we will go with the checkbox group so create a name checkbox checkbox group dot java yes so let us execute this one java c checkbox group dot java yes here i have forgotten to give the parameters let us give 100 comma 100 x coordinate 100 y coordinate 100 so compile it so after successful compilation we have to use the applet viewer tool applet viewer checkbox group dot 
Java. So here you can see the radio buttons. So only one selection can be there. If you select the civil, all the remaining will be in a deselected mode. If you select mechanical, all the remaining uh, branches will be in deselected. If you select CAC, all the remaining will be deselected. Right? So this is a checkbox group. There is a difference between checkbox and checkbox group. So whereas a checkbox means it will give a multiple selection. It will allow the multiple selections. If you use this checkbox group, it will create a radio button which allows the only single selection. There is the only difference. So for this, the complete difference uh, uh, is in creating the constructor, right? So here in the constructor, we have to pass three arguments. First one is a label. Second one is the object of a checkbox group. And then the third parameter is a Boolean type, whether it is a selected or a deselected. If it is by default, it will be false. And uh, if it is, if it is, uh, written as a true it will be selected by default and we have to create all the checkboxes and then add it to the parameters and if you want to implement the event handling here you have to implement the corresponding listener interface and then here we have to write the method which is available in that particular listener interface the definition of the method choice list so both are the awt controls so coming to this choice it is a so it, it accepts the multiple elements it also accepts the multiple elements here it is a drop down menu it is a drop down menu it is a visible list so there will be no menu everything will be visible so visible menu single click is enough for event handling here double click is required for event handling Here, whenever the event occurs, then item listener interface will handle the events. Here, action listener interface. So, here to get or to retrieve the selected list there is a method called get selected item here also the same thing get selected item this is a method which will return so this will return the item name here it will return item name so in this interface so we know that interface consists of abstract methods so here also this interface consists of one method right item state change item state change so this should be written i mean the definition for this method should be written while implementing this interface here also in this action listener action performed so action performed is a method where we have to write the definition while implementing this action listener right so this is all about this choice and list so here coming to this choice, see, a drop down menu will be appeared. Here, the complete visibility will be there with the scroll bars. 
with the scroll bars complete visibility will be there right so this is the choice this is the list okay so we need to follow the same template which we have seen in the first uh, introduction of awt so first we have to import the statements right you import the packages in that uh, we have to import the apply package uh, awt package and awt.events package and then second step we have to write the applet code which is enclosed in comments right because we are using the applet we are tool rather than using the browser okay then we have to write the class public i mean the class name that should be implements i mean extends the applet and implements the action listeners so every applet program will extends the applet class right then init method we have to write the init method in the init method we have to add the uh, object to the container and also we have to register the listener interfaces to the events right so then we have to write the methods which are involved in the interface if you are implementing this choice we have to write the item state chain if you are implementing the list we have to write the action perform right so this this is the template which we have to follow and hope you understood this choice and list the difference between the choice and list in order to event occur for the choice single click is required in order to event occurs in the list double click will be required so that i will show you the in the implementation part right so hope you understood this one so let us stop here now we will go with the implementation part on the system hello friends just now we have seen the concept of uh, two more awt components that is uh, list and choice so choice is the drop down menu and the list is a group of elements uh, displaying in the same menu right so now let us see the implementation part now let us create that one so very first step is we have to import the packages so java dot awt for graphics package then go with uh, import java dot awt dot event for event listeners next import java dot applet for implementing the applet now let us write the applet code here applet code is equal to choice list width is equal to some 600 height is equal to some 500 right so just close the applet right now we have to write the class class choice list so it should implement i mean extends the applet because every act applet program extends the applet class right so applet and implements so this is for event handling right so whenever we press the choice uh, the element of the choice the item of the sort choice so the choice uh, uh, the implementation part of these events will be handled by the corresponding event listeners now here we have to write the event listeners interfaces right so for, for choice it is a item listener and for list it is a action listener so which we have already covered in the previous class right action listener so we are uh, implementing two interfaces item listener which handles the choice events and the action listener which handles the list events now let us create here an object for choice object for list right and one message which is of string data type now let us create the methods public void init so always start from the init function so in the init method we have to write the foreground background and all the initialization factors so here we will give we have we will instantiate this object for choice so c is equal to new choice similarly 
L is equal to new list. Now, see both are the menu, right? Choice is a menu of elements, list is also a menu of elements. But here, choice is a drop down list, so only one element will be displayed. And list is a multiple elements which are displayed in a single section. So, I, I will show you the difference. So, we have to add c dot add write on the content so let us write here c programming similarly c dot add python programming similarly add java programming right so here we have created a three choices similarly we will add the list also l dot add c programming l dot add python programming l, sorry l dot add java programming so the same content we are writing so uh, you will know the difference now we have to add c and l so add c add l if we want to implement these action listeners we have to write here so c dot add item listener of this object current object similarly l dot add action listener of this so here we are implementing both the uh, both the listener interfaces we have to write the methods of those interfaces public void for action listener there is a method called action performed so this is an abstract method which is available in action listener right so action event class here we have to write down some repaint call the repaint method simply now we will write uh, one more method called item state changed right so this is uh, available event ie right here also we will write the repaint right so both are the action i mean uh, interfaces available i mean abstract methods available in the interfaces so item in the in the item listener there is a abstract method called item state change in the action listener there is an uh, abstract method called action perform so we have to write the code in the program which we are implementing the interfaces now we will write the paint function right now let us uh, create a message message is equal to so let us take uh, two messages one is for uh, uh, choice so c message and l message so choice message list message so here this program we are implementing the event handling too right so g dot draw string oh, sorry sorry right c message c message is equal to C, C dot get item selected so this is the method available in in the item event class right so in the item event class we had a method that get item selected so it will return the item the name of the item which is being selected similarly L message is equal to L dot here also the same thing get item selected right now let us write d g dot uh, draw string c message comma from 200 or some 300 comma some 200 Similarly, g dot draw string l message 
300 comma 400 right yes right so we have uh, created this one now let us uh, save this one so we have given a name as choice list dot java so we are implementing both the uh, controls awt controls right so let us compile it java c choice list dot java oh there is an error while creating this one yes we are not ending the comment right not ended the comment oh right uh, so there are a lot of errors came so just uh, we will check right while importing the package we have to use this complete classes of oh sorry of applet so that's the one thing we have given wrong yeah still there are two errors get item selected sorry the here the method name is not get item selected get selected item it's my mistake i'm extremely sorry for that get selected item right now let us see whether it is successfully compiled or not yes now let us execute this one by using the applet viewer tool so applet viewer choice list dot java yes so you here you can observe this is the choice and this is the list so in the choice it is a drop down menu only only one item will be visible list is a multiple elements but uh, everything is visible in the same context right so if you are selecting python programming here see you can observe it changed to python programming right now similarly java programming so this is called event handling so whenever you are selecting the item by using the statement that get selected item it will be displayed on the here but coming to the list if you double click on the item then it will be displayed here so single click will not work here right double click means implementation whenever you double click the item then only the event will be generated hope you understood so this is the main difference between the choice and list so this is the choice this is the choice and this is the list right so hope you understood this uh, difference between the choice and list see here uh, we have done just we have created an objects for choice and list we have created two messages in the init we have created the object instantiate the object for both choice and list we have added some items to the choice and some items to the list and finally we are adding the choice to the container and a list to the container and for handling the event we are adding the item listener interface and action listener interface so item listener interface is responsible for uh, handling the choice action listener interface is responsible for handling the list so in the item listener interface there is a um, abstract method called item state changed so we have written the definition for item state changed here and for action listener we, are, we have written the definition for action performed and then in the paint we, uh, there is a method called get selected item so this will be returning the name of the selected item so that will be assigned to c message and this will be assigned to l message and by using the draw string we are just displaying the selected item on the screen 